Hey, check. Hello, good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Hi, everybody. Oh, it sounds great. Can you guys all hear me okay? Beautiful. I love an active audience. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Ashton Zeth. On behalf of the Mar Society, its founder, Dr. Robert Zubrin, and executive director, James Burke, I would like to welcome everyone to the 26th annual International Mar Society Convention. We're glad to be, yes, that, yes, thank you. That does deserve a round of applause. We're glad to be holding our global conference uh, for the second year in a row on the picturesque campus of Arizona State University. Go Sun Devils. My sister would be so proud. She's an ASU graduate. Uh, as always, our four-day convention running from Thursday, October 5th through Sunday, October 8th, will bring together leading scientists, engineers, aerospace representatives, and government policymakers to discuss and analyze the latest news about exploring Mars, the future of human exploration, and settlement of the Red Planet. Now, these invited speakers will participate in a series of plenary talks, uh, panel discussions, and public debates over the course of the conference. In addition, we'll also be convening several dozen um, talk tracks from our Mars Society community who are comprised of individuals from around the world that are passionate about Mars and working towards getting humans there. So much of this conference uh, is going to be around the theme of Mars for All, with glowing Glowing, growing global interest uh, and public support for Humans to Mars and advocates for this endeavor led by the Mars Society. Uh, we have developed a series of initiatives allowing members of the general public to learn and even experience the idea of human settlement of the red planet. Some of these, uh, including the Mars Society's Mars VR initiative, will be available for viewing and interacting uh, on campus during the convention. So as has been the case over the past few years, we will be offering uh, those attending our conference the opportunity to join us in person, like you all are now, and it's wonderful to see all your faces. Uh, but we also have the option for a virtual option uh, feed from countries around the globe. So remember that those of you that are connecting with us remotely will also have the chance to submit questions to our speakers during the course of the convention. Today, we are in the Arizona Ballroom, which is the second floor of the Memorial Union. Our afternoon track sessions, did I go out there? Uh, will be in rooms along the hallway here, and you can find the exact schedule, uh, room numbers in the abstract book, or by picking up a schedule at the registration table. Tomorrow, we will be in the Gamage Theater, uh, which is just a short walk from here. We'll be in the Gamage Theater for the entire day uh, through the evening reception on the promenade. On Saturday, we will return here to the Arizona Ballroom for another full day of programming uh, capped by our Saturday evening banquet, also here in the Arizona Ballroom. And finally, we will uh, end the conference here on Sunday morning. There are many places to eat and drink around campus. 
I saw Starbucks downstairs. I'm sure I'll run into a few of you in the line later. Uh, if you need your help finding your way around, please stop at the Memorial Union Information Desk at the end of the hall or ask any of the students walking around. They're super friendly. Before we begin, uh, I want to give everyone a quick reminder that you can keep track of the daily schedule and programming by visiting the Mars Society's website, www.marssociety.org, for up-to-date details. Also, while we feel ready uh, from a technical standpoint to manage our convention, if there are any technical glitches along the way, we promise to resolve them as quickly as possible. Lastly, a special thank you to Greg Autry, the director of the Thunderbird Initiative for Space Leadership Policy and Business here at ASU. And another major thank you to all of our amazing volunteers. This convention would not happen without you. Now, let's kick off this year's International Mars Society Convention with the always informative introduction by Mars Society President and Founder, Dr. Robert Zubrin. Right. So, um, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to uh, focus my talk uh, this morning, not, you know, on what other people are doing, you know, okay, SpaceX is moving towards getting their Starship to work, and that looks great. Uh, otherwise, everything is screwed up. Um, but the um, but I'm going to focus on um, uh, what we are going to do, okay, uh, what we are going to do. And our next major initiative, as many of you may have heard, is the establishment of this Mars Technology Institute. Um, now, um, because, okay, look. SpaceX and uh, other entrepreneurial initiatives are moving to create the transportation systems to get humans to Mars. And, uh, and, and I believe at this point that this is uh, a more or less unstoppable uh, dynamic has been unleashed. Uh, that is, um, as a result of introducing reusable launch vehicles and entrepreneurial methods, SpaceX with the Falcon line has cut the cost of space launch by a factor of five since 2010, after it had been constant for 40 years before that. And a whole bunch of other people are getting into the game. There's at least five companies in China that are working on creating knockoffs of the Falcon 9. Uh, the, 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 uh, then uh, their rocket lab uh, is creating uh, an equivalent capability, not exactly a knockoff, but uh, similar in, in concept, in this blue. Uh, and so even if uh, SpaceX was to fall off the edge of the ice because Elon takes one more risk than he should, um, the, the, this thing is, is going to go on. And, and the thing is, once we have reusable launch vehicles, there's going to be used launch vehicles. Think about that for a minute, okay? Used launch vehicles have not been a thing, okay? New cars are very expensive. How can so many people afford them? Okay, there are many people on this planet whose annual income is half the cost of the new car uh, that they're driving because they buy it used for one-tenth of the cost of the new car. And uh, well, there's gonna be used launch vehicles around. So we're moving into a world where people are going to be able to buy their own launch vehicles. Um, the, 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 uh, so, so soon it's going to be possible for humans to go to Mars in numbers. Um, and I don't know exactly how that's going to work out. Uh, hopefully, you know, if they get the Starship working and he, Nikki Haley is elected president and, you know, she says, gee, he's got the ship. We get together. Can we have people on Mars by our second term? Okay, who knows, right? But, but regardless of whether that happens this time around or not, there's going to be reusable launch vehicles, used launch vehicles. They're going to be all people are going to be possible to go to Mars. And 
but then the question is, can we actually settle with Mars? And while fundamentally the technologies to do a human expedition to Mars has existed since really Apollo, if you want to know, uh, the, the, to settle Mars requires some fundamentally new technologies, as, as I will discuss. Uh, we have to create resources on Mars, okay? And my fundamental thesis, and by the way, I have a book, you know, The Case for Nukes, in which I amplify this fundamental idea that there's no such thing as natural resources. There's only natural raw materials. It is human technology that turns materials into resources. Okay, uranium was not a resource until we invented nuclear power. For that matter, land was not a resource until we invented agriculture, okay? Um, and th there will be resources on Mars once there are resourceful people there. Okay, now, uh, a thesis that I had, a lot of people uh, over the years have asked me, what will be the export of a Mars colony? Okay, because yes, you can have in situ resource creation uh, and make your own steel and rocket fuel and things like this on Mars. Okay, but are you going to really make things like this on Mars? You're going to have to be able to pay for some imports from Earth. Okay, how do you pay for it? My answer has been that the, the Mars city-state will be an inventor's colony. That is, you're going to have a group of technologically adept people in a frontier environment where they're going to be forced to innovate. And this, by the way, is one reason why Mars city-states are going to be free, because they need to be free if they're going to invent. They also need to be free if they're going to attract immigrants. Um, and the, 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 so th this idea of the extraterrestrial anti-utopia is, is complete bunk, because any such stillborn, no one would emigrate to an extraterrestrial dystopian tyranny. Um, the, the, but these are all questions that I go into in depth in my next book, which is coming out in February, uh, The New World on Mars, What Can We Create on the Red Planet? Okay, uh, now available for pre-sale on Amazon. Um, and we have some display copies of the advanced galleys you can look at on the table. But in any case, uh, the point is, inventors colony on Mars, solving the technological problems facing the Mars city, but thereby creating breakthrough inventions that can be licensed on Earth and create income. In other words, the export from Mars, one of the primary exports is going to be IP, intellectual. It's a great thing to export across into planetary or even stellar just because you just need a radio. Um, and uh, so the question then arises, well, why not create such an inventor's colony on Earth now? Okay, uh, now there's some answers to that. I mean, certainly the people in a Martian inventor's colony would be much more committed than the Earth inventor's colony uh, because they can go to work for Google or something. Um, you know, or HBO or something like that. Uh, the, the, and, and frankly, the fact that they decided to go to Mars in the first place means that they're committed to a vision, uh, much more passionate about it. You know, I ran a, he applies to work, always tells me I'm about this. Um, but if you go to Mars, yeah, you really have to have it. Um, the, um, run into Okay, we're good. And people can hear me. All right. So, um, on the other hand, costs on Earth are lower, and you could balance those trades. But in any case, we can do the terrestrial inventors colony now, whereas we're not in position to do it on Mars. Okay, so why not start such a Mars Technology Institute on Earth now? Well, why not? So that's exactly what we're going to do. Okay, that is exactly what we intend to do. Now. Um, the um, so the Mars Technology Institute is going to pioneer 
the technologies needed to finance Mars settlement. Now, I'm a little older than I look. Uh, I'm a, actually kind of a time traveler. I'm here from the 1950s. Um, and uh, I'll tell you, the problem with time travel is it gets old after a while. But, the, um, but nevertheless, it can be done. I've done it. And, the, uh, and so I can remember a different time period. Uh, and so I, I hope that what I says doesn't shock the people here. But there was a time when parents uh, told, uh, when, well, the expectation was that young men should have careers and young women should uh, seek men who have good careers for husbands, okay? That that was the general expectation. And the advice that parents gave their daughters was, as my parents advised my sister, don't marry for money, but marry where the money is, okay? So the question is, if we're gonna do invention, okay, we wanna do good invention, we're not inventing for money, but we want to invent where the money is, okay? Now, because this institute needs to become self-financing, the idea here is to create both an engine of invention and an engine of finance that can both finance further invention, and if it is truly successful, finance the human settlement of Mars. Now, there's a number of critical areas to enable Mars settlement, okay? And these include, uh, Biotechnology, especially for food, as I'll go into in a minute. Uh, energy, okay, in terms of advanced forms of nuclear energy, uh, both breeder reactors and fusion, and artificial intelligence robotics uh, to meet the severe labor shortage that Mars is going to face, um, far more severe than any society on Earth has ever faced. And, the, the, and then finally, uh, systems for processing uh, low-grade mineral ore to obtain pure substances because, uh, the, the, first of all, the, some of the natural processes that have concentrated, concentrated ore on Earth haven't existed on Mars, and even where they have, they, they're unlikely or to be uh, all close to your Mars city-state where you are, because Mars for a long time won't have global transport that allows access to ores from far away on Earth be a long time we have before we have railroads on Mars. It's even going to be a bit longer before we have container ships. Okay. Um, that has to wait for terraforming. Once we terraform Mars, then oceans, we can have fast container ships. But uh, until that time, we're going to need to be able to access resources that are within a short distance of the Mars city-state. So uh, labor shortage, land shortage, energy shortage. Okay. Uh, and so for its initial effort, uh, we're going to actually focus in the biotech area, okay, um, for a, a couple of reasons. One is the reason uh, that I gave implied earlier, which is we're going to do our invention where the money is. Um, the second is that it is, in fact, the showstopper for um, a Mars city. Food is the showstopper for a Mars city. Let me explain why, okay? That is, uh, uh, not for a Mars expedition. To do a human mission to Mars, food's not an issue at all. We can bring our food, okay? It, it's not exactly in the noise, but it's about the fourth most important thing in the mass manifest of the mission. So you can just bring the food for a human mission to Mars. Uh, if you have a Mars base, 20, 30, 50 people, you can grow food in uh, greenhouses and things of this sort that, you know, I mean, on Sunday, you're going to hear from Barbara Velvizi, who's making self-contained pods of, uh, to grow things in. And there's other people that have done things along those lines. And there's people done hydroponics. And that kind of stuff can work for that kind of need, okay? But for a city, even a relatively small city, okay, uh, say um, uh, uh, 40,000 people, bit smaller than Renaissance Florence. Okay, forget the million person. Let's say a, a very modest city. Okay, I want you to think about this. You take the most efficient agriculture done at scale on earth, which is Iowa cornfields. Okay, which is tremendous. Okay, the last year, the state of Iowa grew more corn than the entire United States did in 1950. And we were already an agricultural superpower at that time. Okay. It's 12 tons 
of corn per hectare. Okay, impressive. Um, but that works out to 30 kilograms of corn a day from that hectare. Okay. And so if you had people willing to settle for a diet of a kilogram of corn a day, that hectare could support 30 people. Now, if you want a slightly more interesting diet that includes some fruits and vegetables, maybe even some the, the animal protein, maybe 20 people per hectare. So 20,000 people, 1,000 hectares. 40,000 people, 2,000 hectares of land, okay? And so 2,000 hectares, what's that? Um, the, 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 to try to build that in pressurized greenhouses or if you, and that's assuming that the, using natural sunlight, you can get the same productivity as you can on earth where the sunlight is twice as much, uh, not happening. Try to do it with LEDs and tunnels underground. The power requirement at a power of 200 watts per square meter, not a kilowatt, is two megawatts per hectare. So 2,000 hectares is 4, thousand megawatts, four gigawatts. You're talking about the power that runs Chicago to support a, a town of 40,000 people. That's not happening. Okay, the, the, including not only conventional field agriculture, but hydroponics and aquaponics and all these sorts of things is the inefficiency of photosynthesis. The vegetarians make a point that if you feed the corn to the cow, you lose 90% of the energy, uh, that's debatable because the food you get is higher quality, but even so, yeah, sure, you lose some energy. But the, the real inefficiency in the process is the fact that the cornfield, if you consider the amount of solar energy hitting it compared to the amount of food energy coming out, is 0.2% efficient. Okay. That's a lot lower than we ordinarily get from the commercial chemical engineering processes, which might be 30, 50, 70 percent efficient depending on, on, on the process. That, that, so, but there's could be conventional other routes. For example, and this may be one of the things we go after as our first project, the Mars Technology Institute. The Mars Direct Process, the Starship mission, both use the process of making methane on Mars by reacting hydrogen with CO2. That's highly efficient, okay? Uh, there are, um, microorganisms, bacteria that can transform methane into protein, okay? In a very intensive way where something, a, a, a cubic meter or two can do the equivalent of hectares of land, okay? And at high efficiency. Now, then maybe you take the protein cracker and you feed that to the tilapia, okay? Uh, they can do, they turn it into good food at maybe 30% efficiency. So now you have a process that instead of being 0.2% efficient is, is maybe 10% or 20% efficient. Okay, now I want you to think about this. Think about this. In meeting this need, which essential is essential for producing food on Mars, if we can do this, we will make high quality food cheap on Earth. Okay. Now, do you know, 1960, the average American spent 50% uh, of their budget on groceries. Now it's less than 10%. In the 1920s, they spent 70% of their budget on groceries. And, and Roosevelt could run for president on a platform of a chicken in every pot. Vote for me and you will be able to eat chicken. Okay, now today that is unthinkable. I'm gonna need a little more time. You started me late. Um, uh, that the the uh, but around the for you for us in this room uh, the groceries are a small part of our budget. The question of whether we'll be able to buy food tonight is not an issue, but for large numbers of people around the world, the question of whether you're going to have food tonight is an issue. Okay, we're going to make that a non-issue. Okay, so instead of spending all their money on food, they'll have more money for clothing and shoes and iPhones uh, and stuff like that. And by so doing, we will, number one, accomplish a great thing for humanity. We will make a great deal of money, okay? And we will complete, we will prove the business case of a Mars colony as an inventor's colony. And we will completely debunk 
the canard that those space people don't care about the needs of the common people. Okay, uh, we, you know, a, a, a criticism, by the way, that's always uh, adopted not by people who are actually trying to meet the needs of, of the world's poor, but by people who are writing articles for the New Yorker or something. Okay, now the, 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 the so we're gonna do those things. Now there's other areas to follow. Um, so we're gonna hear a lot about biotech, by the way, the banquet speaker, Shannon Nangle, uh, that we'll have. Uh, she is uh, a, a very a brilliant young biotech entrepreneur. She has a company called Circe, the sorceress in uh, Boston, is working on some of this stuff. And she's a member of our board of advisors. She's going to be giving the banquet talk, the, the case for biotech on Mars. Okay. But beyond biotech, there's other areas. Okay. Um, there's energy. Okay. Now we're going to need to use nuclear energy on Mars. But you know, the nuclear energy we have on Earth is only about 1% efficient in getting the energy out of the uranium, okay? That is, it only uses uh, the uranium-235, which is 0.7% of the uranium. Um, and it gets a little extra kick because some of the uranium-238 is bred into plutonium in the course of running the reactor. Okay, so it works out about 1%. Well, that's fine uh, on Earth because we have access to uranium. If you want to know the cost of uranium fuel is only 5% of the cost of the energy coming out of a, a nuclear reactor, okay? But that's because on Earth, you've got global transport to places where there's very high quality uranium ore. There's a global division of labor that can reprocess it. And also, frankly, the cost of the, the other costs of the nuclear power plant are greatly inflated by regulators in terms of expanding the construction cost, okay? But and that is why breeder reactors haven't gone anywhere on earth. Because if you go to a utility and say, why don't you build a, a breeder reactor? We could cut your cost uh, for fuel by 90%. They say, but it's only 5% of our cost anyway. Our real cost is getting the thing built and going with a breeder reactor. Try it's hard enough getting a pressurized water reactor, which a thousand have been built worldwide since 1954, uh, getting that approved, okay, to come with something new to the NRC, you out of your mind. Uh, no, okay, but on Mars, um, you, you, that uranium, you might transport it from Earth at tremendous cost, or if you have to mine and refine it at Mars, it's a very high cost associated with that. You're going to want breeder reactors, okay, and even better than uh, uranium breeder reactors, thorium breeder reactors, because thorium is four times as common as uranium, okay? So these sorts of technologies that I mean, people have been interested in on Earth, but they haven't been driven to, okay? Um, are going to be of great interest for Mars. And beyond advanced fission, there's fusion. Deuterium is five times as common on Mars as it is on Earth, okay? And um, so beyond, you know, things like lifters, uh, liquid fluoride, thorium reactors and stuff, the, 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 which, by the way, were demonstrated in the 1960s at Oak Ridge, uh, they, 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 but never went anywhere beyond that. Um, the, the, there's a fusion, and and then fusion uh, will enable not only uh, large amounts of power on Mars, but also uh, for fusion-powered rockets. And uh, you know, just as you know, the British invented the steam engine, we invented the steamboat. Here, okay. Actually, the first steamboat was called the Perseverance, just like the rover, and it was demonstrated to the Constitutional Convention in 1787. And the first practical steamboat was the Claremont. Uh, Robert Fulton was financed by Livingston. Robert Livingston, who uh, negotiated the Louisiana Purchase, and he wanted inland transportation because he was massively speculating in land. Uh, but steamboats required and resulted in the development of high pressure steam engines which were more efficient and more compact and which then enabled railroads, which are this revolutionary invention of the 19th century, co totally transforms the world. Uh, so the need to the frontier drove a technological revolution. Um, the, the, um, and then there's AI and robotics. Um, and we have people on our board, like Bill Clancy right here, thought about AI. Uh, but this is an important area. Now, this is also an area where there's a lot of money to be found, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to define a research area in it 
that uh, specifically meets our needs that is not being addressed by current research in this area and which could also uh, uh, result in, in very large financial yields. Um, the, the, now, the, also the thing both about biotech and AI is uh, compared to nuclear research is they require much less starting capital. Um, the, um, and then there's a, another area um, which is ore refining, okay? You've got a Mars city state, you have local transportation on wheeled vehicles, you may be 50 kilometers out, you're unlikely to have high quality ore for everything you need uh, within that distance. You are guaranteed to have low quality ore for everything you need within that distance, okay? Um, so how do you refine that? And I think this might be an area where biotech plays as well, because for instance, you have diatoms can produce pure silica. Um, so the microbes can, can do refining on, on a, a very interesting way. Um, so the MTI is going to be a nonprofit. It is already established. It is a 501c3. We are looking for donations, okay? It will then establish a for-profit entity uh, to commercialize its inventions. Uh, and uh, th those, it will be looking to create spin-off companies looking for investors to Now, the question of centralization versus decentralization. Okay, now the ideal vision I have for MTI is to have you know, a campus the size of a university with several hundred researchers and they're all there, something kind of like Bell Labs um, or earlier Menlo Park, um, the uh, I I I invention companies, uh, but it will take a lot of capital to get to that point. So initially uh, I'm thinking about a relatively small central facility, um, and linking together the efforts with some um, outlying facilities. Um, for example, um, th there are people who have biotech companies uh, who could do that part of the research farmed out and they'd get paid for the work, but we would own most of the IP, okay? Uh, and uh, then some we could do ourselves and own all the IP. Uh, and, and, and so forth, uh, but, it, it, but then take the IP and commercialize it and create an empire of spin-off companies um, that is both to fund further research, but ultimately become a financial power. Um, and then we also intend to do something else, which is very unusual, unheard of, uh, but we're gonna do it, uh, which is in addition to our own professional researchers and contracted professional researchers, we will have volunteer researchers, okay? That is, we will put out for bids, requests for proposals for research projects that feed our program that people, we're gonna ask people to do it if they have their own team and their own facility and we will pay for their materials but not their salary, okay? Because so, for example, uh, when I was in high school, the biology teacher in my high school actually was a, a professional uh, a medical researcher. He taught at the high school, but he also went to the hospital. He was doing medical research there. He was fully capable of leading uh, a, 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 a medical, but in this case, a drug medical, not, not surgical, but uh, research program. And there are people out there like him who are uh, high school science teachers who have a lab. They've got the glassware, they've got the thermocouples, they've got the incubators, they've got all the kind of stuff you need. And, and some of them have, have very good educations. If, if they wanna do research for us, okay, and engage their students in this and think of the value of this as a STEM initiative of having uh, high school students or, or others like them, engaged in real research, knowing that they are part of the effort of making humanity multi-planetary. This is extremely powerful. And it's a way that we can get research done at extremely low cost. The, see, the Mars Society, what, 
if you look at what we've done with our stations, the crews, the, the, the mission support, the people who do the refits and the university rover challenge, you know, we, we actually have two of them, the one in Utah that we just had a great one in Poland. Uh, uh, I did a calculation last night and we have actually gotten about $50 million worth of work done for us um, by volunteers. That is, if we had had to pay those people to do what they did, that is, it is about the total bill, okay, that, that, that we've done. Okay, the, um, so we're gonna mobilize this. And my comparison is, if you think of a war effort, okay, like the Ukrainian war effort, they've got their professional army, but they also got partisans beyond the Russian lines who are carrying out all sorts of very interesting operations. And they don't even have to pay those people, they just get them arms and they do their thing. Um, okay, so we'll have a, a volunteer army as well. So leadership, I'm gonna lead this myself. I recently sold my company Pioneer and so I am available full time to lead the MTI, okay? And we have a very impressive board of advisors has joined us. Uh, some of them are, are here uh, today or will be here tomorrow or Saturday. Um, and um, the, okay, so engine of invention and engine of finance to enable the human exploration and settlement of Mars. Okay, the great abolitionist leader, Frederick Douglass, once said, who would be free themselves must strike the blow. So rather than try to rely on NASA to uh, uh, um, establish humanity on Mars, rather than try uh, rely on Elon Musk to establish humanity on Mars, we need to rely on ourselves. We need to take on the challenge ourselves, okay? This is what we're going to do. And in the process, we're going to do yeah. miracles for humankind. Thank you. Okay, so I started at 9.15, so I got five more minutes. Let's take a few questions. Questions, questions, who's got a question? There's people with questions over here. Um, I can't do it. It's uh, too uh, complicated. Uh, that is for the volunteer researchers, uh, they can have their names on the patent, okay? Which let me tell you, since I have had my name on some patents, it's a, a real kick. Uh, but uh, they're participating as volunteers. They're getting an education out of it, uh, you know, uh, the the um, but we'll we'll fund their materials, we'll fund their expenses, but the, the MTI will own the IP. For some of the contract researchers, there will be a split in the ownership of IP, but that is um, uh, a, a different kind of thing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I feel like I'm in the presence of genius here, and I did my first talk in 1990 at the uh, Case for Mars conference. And I want to see a little more of the human element brought in, because who are the people who are going to go out there? What experience do they have? What experience do they have with their minds to keep themselves functioning? And I see that as something that's missing in the overall Mars program. All right. Thanks. Other questions or comments? Hi, I'm Dr. Mohammed from Australia. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you about the MTI's international outreach because there are two people from Australia, both are medical doctors, and we are purely here for the with the intent of supporting the MTI. Well, the, the the as I said, the MTI will have a significant component that will be outsourced, distributed. Okay, so if 
there, if it turns out that the, the best person to do part of the job is a company in Australia or Belgium or whatever, uh, then sure. Um, the, um, th this can be uh, uh, an international uh, research institution that can One quick update on the molten salt reactor experiment that was in the 60s. There's actually a $30 million grant given to Texas Christian University last year, and uh, they are building a molten salt reactor there. They also brought on board people from Texas University, Texas a and and Georgia Tech. So it's a consortium of a lot of young kids working on molten salt res uh, research, which is excellent for our, our country and for the future of energy. All right. Good to know. Last question in the back. Uh, concerning MTI, um, is there any me uh, methodology to incorporate um, corporations into it? I see a lot of this necessary work already existing behind, you know, kind of in a lot of the deep tech lab arenas, and they don't really see it as relevant to space settlement, but it is. And I, I think this MTI provides an important platform to bring that existing body of knowledge in together. Is there any um, any thoughts around bringing in uh, corporate engagement? Well, yeah. Um, in fact, as I said, that parts of the processes that uh, we will do is stuff that we're going to be looking for uh, companies to do for us. And in some cases, they already have done for us. And we will probably have... Uh, well, certainly we'll have MTI sessions at our conference, uh, but once this thing gets big enough, we'll probably have MTI conferences where people come and whether they are um, R&D labs or the, one of the volunteer projects, uh, they'll report their results and, and we will share the information. Um, but yes. Okay, so uh, I, I think I'm out of time now, so thanks. But uh, I'll be around the whole weekend. People can approach me individually and uh, on to Mars. I think I'm running away. You want to grab, grab the handheld, yeah. One, two, one, two. Hello again, everyone. Quick introduction, uh, Dr. Jan Spacecheck is a senior research scientist based in Alachua, Florida, who works at the Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution. He's a molecular biologist, analytical chemist, and organic chemist with a focus on the study of life in Mars and the clouds of Venus. He is the inventor and lead designer of the agnostic life finder, ALF, and manages the Alpha Mars Group. Jan proposed a hypothesis about the organic carbon cycle in the atmosphere of Venus, which will be tested in the first private interplanetary mission in 2025. He is also developing uh, life detection devices, including ones to detect the coronavirus. Welcome, Jan. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's uh, nice to be here uh, again. Um, so as, as, has, as was said, I'm going to be talking about search for Martian biosphere, uh, and I'm representing group Alpha Mars. Uh, let me, oh, I don't see the light. Oh, there it is. Okay. I needed to orient myself. No, I cannot see it. Okay. Never mind. 
Um, okay, so we are an international group of scientists. Uh, it's a project called Alpha Mars. Um, we, uh, well, I'm now Florida based. Stephen Benners is also American, uh, Lyle Weil, uh, and um, he's a professor working in Canada. Then we have uh, some professors from France, uh, pardon, uh, from Spain. Uh, Charles Cockle is uh, English and other professors uh, are throughout the entire world. Basically, this group of scientists um, agrees that we should look for life on Mars before we send humans there. And they, we believe that uh, we can do it uh, conclusively and within next uh, decade or so. Uh, the project is administered by a nonprofit organization, uh, which, got, which is called Agnostic Life Finding Association. And I had my students to start this nonprofit. So this has been a very bad day for dinosaurs, um, but it was a great day for bacteria with, ambitious, with ambitions to go to space because uh, tons of uh, rocks were ejected to space, carrying those bacteria to bodies. Um, and that's how they uh, got uh, onto Mars and other celestial bodies. Uh, it is now known uh, that uh, life as we know it can survive the ejection, the transfer and landing on the planetary bodies. The question is um, if, uh, if they can survive when they get there. We are certain that uh, we have uh, panspermia going in the other direction from Mars back to Earth because um, as you can see me holding the uh, black beauty, we have rocks from Mars on Earth. Um, so thanks to those impacts, we, we have a way how to distribute life from Earth. And um, if we manage to stop uh, those impactors from hitting Earth, it will be bad news for those ambitious bacteria because now they have no way to get to Mars, but lucky for, for the bacteria again, uh, since we are sending rockets, we can supplement the supply of bacteria. So there are two options. Uh, Earth life can survive on surface of Mars, in which case uh, we are, uh, it's already there, uh, brought through natural means, or it cannot survive, uh, in which case we are not going to um, destroy it uh, if we brought it with us. Um, so that's, uh, uh, life, life is likely on Mars, um, and subsurface mid latitude ice is the place where to find it. Um, this is a hypothesis we proposed a while ago, uh, during high obliquity periods when Martian, um, uh, rotational axis is more tilted. Uh, you have these large deposits of ice being, uh, built in mid latitude. And if uh, any uh, life existed on Mars during those warm periods, then we can find it there in the in the in the mid latitude ice. Um, non surprisingly, um, astrobiologists are now converging on the idea that we can find life uh, in this mid latitude ice. And some of those people are here, like Amy Williams. Uh, we will have. Carl Stoker may be joining us later for the discussion. And we also have a uh, in-situ research utilization missions, uh, as Robert uh, discussed. Before we build a city on Mars, we need to start, we need to learn how to mine Martian resources. Water is going to be the first one. Uh, and I think we have uh, people in the audience already, Chris Zatsny, um, who will, talk about the mining the uh, Martian ice. So there are um, three missions in a quick successions uh, proposed to uh, search for life in the, in the subsurface ice. One was uh, proposed, uh, it's a red dragon. Uh, Carl Stoker uh, and other people in, in the team proposed to use a, a SpaceX uh, Red Dragon. Uh, I think the Red Dragon has been canceled, but I think Chris Zatsny will talk about how the mission has been updated. Um, to search for life, they will use a, 
um, immuno, uh, immuno array, which means that you have uh, um, antibodies that are waiting for any proteins or DNA. And when they catch it, they light up the fluorescence light and you can easily say, um, see if, if they are there. This is very sensitive and conclusive detection of life, but only of life as we know it. If, uh, if the antibodies are not trained uh, for that, they would not find it if it's very alien form of life. And they, they, have, they propose that to have a second option, uh, less, uh, less uh, sensitive, but a more agnostic approach. And then that's to use a mass spectrometry, which um, is known to work on Mars already on the, on the rovers. They also propose other experiments. Now I will talk a little bit about Amy's um, mission. Um, she, uh, as a NASA astrobiologist, proposed a mission to look for life on Mars uh, before we send human there. That was the only mission in this decade last survey. NASA once per decade asked scientists to propose missions that should be flown within the next decade. And this mission by Amy and her team um, was the only one to propose to look for life on Mars before we send humans there. And yet again, we have uh, Chris Zatsny there um, working on the mining drilling. So whenever they said it couldn't be drilled, this guy drilled it. Um, Fictitious NASA was uh, sending Bruce Willis. The real NASA is sending Chris Asni. <laughs> uh, uh, Mars Life Explorer is, uh, it was a good news that NASA finally decided to actually look for life on Mars. But unfortunately, um, the mission they proposed um, was uh, uh, not very strong uh, in the capabilities. So they proposed to drill mid-latitude ice, uh, detect organics, um, detect non-equilibrium gases, and analyze depletion of isotopic ratios. But uh, all of these uh, tools would only detect uh, traces of life, which is quite abundant, uh, which is more abundant than what we have on Earth. Um, and even if the results were all positives from those results, uh, it would be still open for the discussions because all of these can be produced through a biotic origin. Um, this year, uh, we, uh, our colleagues present, uh, published a pub, uh, paper where they showed that uh, none of the instruments that are planned to be sent to Mars with, uh, with this mission or are currently on Mars would be able to find life on Mars. So this means that um, this proposed mission would not find life on, in Atacama Desert as well. And that's uh, not that controversial. Amy herself said so when asked um, uh, how would we be sure about this life, Amy said, we might to send another mission or we might send the humans to find life. So unfortunately, this mission is a uh, not a design to conclusively detect extant life. So how do we propose to find life conclusively? Uh, the life that can be sparse, that can be alien. And before there, uh, we based our mission on uh, two simple ideas. Let's combine the plant in situ re research utilization with, uh, with the astrobiology. And let's look for biosignatures that are ambiguous. That means that once we find them, there's no discussions. We, we know that we found life. Uh, this is a simple schematic. I will go more deeper into it, but basically this rocket, uh, the rocket, oh, you can see it, nice. Uh, <laughs> so the rocket with, with this pipe uh, will actually mine the um, Martian ice. Uh, it's called Rodriguez well. We are proposing to just add this little thing that extracts the polyelectrolytes. So when searching for life on Mars, before we send human there, we don't have much time. A normal uh, mission by NASA takes about 20 years from, uh, from the original idea to execu execution. And uh, NASA plans to send humans to Mars before 2040. We'll see how it works out with current budget cuts but NASA is not the only one. 
Uh, China plans to send uh, people to Mars as well. So we might have some competition there. And of course we have private companies. Uh, SpaceX is of course the most prominent one planning to mine Mars uh, ice, carbon dioxide, make propellant from it, and then have a rocket to go back. So ALF is that add-on to in-situ research utilization mission and must be op those missions will be operated before humans go there. In other words, uh, if we link uh, the search for life on Mars with the missions that must fly before we send humans there, we will not miss our flight. And actually, if, regardless how things get delayed, we will find life before uh, we send humans there. Um, so how do we find actually life agnostically? Uh, we had two missions. One of them was more conclusive. The other one was uh, less conclusive about it. Uh, how do we propose to search for life? Um, the key is to look for biosignatures that must that are necessary for life instead of looking for biosignatures that just might be produced by life. For example, um, if you look for chlorophyll and Martians for some reason don't look don't work with chlorophyll, we'll miss them. Um, and it goes both ways. Uh, life cannot exist without genetic polymers and genetic polymers cannot exist without life. Um, genetic polymers like DNA are quite short lived, uh, which means that if we find them, it either means that we find life which is now alive or which died quite recently. And it's quite likely that it's hiding somewhere else. And the important part which we are using that uh, to concentrate and analyze those polyelectrolytes uh, is uh, the charge in the backbone, which must be present. And I believe that Stephen will talk a little bit more in the next talk uh, about this idea. After all, it's his idea I'm now presenting. Uh, but the key is that uh, genetic polymers are polyelectrolytes, and we are using that to uh, search for the life. And we are using a simple technique, which is called electrophoresis, which means that polyelectrolytes or electrolytes are migrating in electric fields. And we are proposing to use membrane electrodialysis, where you move uh, electrolytes through compartments. Um, yeah, this uh, this technology is already used in industry, and um, it's a we don't need to reinvent the membranes. They are already there. They are very very full, re, uh, falling resistant, and uh, they are durable. So here is an instrument uh, that we already have in our lab. Quite simple. Um, you have uh, little compartments. Uh, it's a three D printed instrument. Uh, you put uh, your sample containing DNA in the middle compartment, then start electrolysis of uh, your solution, which drives electrophoresis and DNA then moves across the membrane. The membrane, uh, the first membrane uh, is, uh, has a pores that are large enough to pass the DNA, but retains everything else, uh, such as protein or larger mineral particles. The second membrane has a pore small enough that it actually retains the DNA. So then in the channel two, you have uh, your nice, uh, clean, isolated DNA. Of course, if you have polyelectrolyte, which is long linear molecule that has positive charges, it will migrate to the other side. And we plan to do so um, maybe a couple months from now. So the instrument that we would fly to Mars would not be this static instrument where you inject your sample and move it across. It would be flow through instrument which means that the middle of three compartments uh, are uh, flow through. So you are in the middle channel, you are pumping your water, you mine on Mars, and then you extract your polyelectrolytes into this compartment next to it. I made a beautiful animation. So here is a Martian water, which contains also some particles because you are not filtering it before. And if you have some DNA, it will be moving over here. You can see that since uh, in this channel, uh, the flow is slower, we are concentrating the DNA and we can of course uh, increase the ratio, how much it's concentrated by changing the ratio of the speed 
of a flow between here and here. So we can, in theory, infinitely concentrate this. Of course, if we have aliens with a positively charged DNA, it would go over here. The streams of uh, polyelectrolytes, which are now pure uh, linear molecules, go, goes to analyzers. And while you are uh, being impressed my beautiful animation, I will introduce the students who work on this uh, this summer. Kate Sheldon came to visit us from Princeton this summer. And we had uh, Chris Temby uh, last year coming from UCSB. Uh, other students are welcome to join um, anytime. Uh, so what we are proposing to find life with unprecedented sensitivity. Um, because we have the advantage of having missions that are mining the tons of Martian ice, uh, we can extract the life genetic polymers from very large samples, which gives us unfair advantage over missions that are mining just like one milliliter or one core. If a life on Mars is very sparse, it might be that uh, the core that uh, somebody proposes just misses uh, colonies which are just next to it. If you mine, um, swimming pools worth of uh, ice you you are very you would be very unlikely to well it would be impossible to miss the martian biosphere in that case so we can in analytical chemistry when you improve a method by one order of magnitude making it 10 times more sensitive it's a very prestigious paper uh, if you promise to improve a method by a million times by making a simple trick that's uh, that's uh, well. That's quite impressive. <laughs> and even even if the extraction yield is very small, like ten percent or one percent, it's still because we are starting with such a large amount of material. Uh, we have a uh, quite a big of buffer. Okay, so now for the analyzers, we have the DNA. Uh, uh, we have the DNA concentrated now, or alien genetic polymers concentrated. How we analyze them. Uh, the first analyzer I'm proposing, it's a minion. Um, don't confuse it with a minion. Um, it's a small device. It's using biological nanopore, uh, which is a molecule uh, normally used in cell to unwind DNA, but it's just threads the DNA through pore. And then you measure electric uh, current over this pore. Uh, this is already established method and it's already used uh, to analyze life on earth. Uh, here are our experts um, who joined our team, Catherine Maggiore and Professor Lai Wild. Um, this method is a gold standard for looking for earth type life in Arctic and only one picogram uh, which corresponds to 200 cells is enough to unambiguously uh, to be sure that you've detected uh, bacterial DNA. Of course, you need much more to characterize it, but this instrument actually sequence the DNA. So you not only find the life, you can also characterize the life you found. Um, and it's, it's important because as a, uh, other speakers will be talking. The problem when you are searching for sparse, sparse life is that you might have found contamination you brought with you from Earth. But if we are sequencing the genomes, we already know if it's life we brought from Earth or not. So that's one advantage of this nanopore. Oh, by the way, uh, they just published uh, the paper where they show uh, this scoring device in combination with MinION to uh, detect and characterize uh, population in the Arctic ice. So it's a field tested method. Of course, Martians um, might not use DNA as we know it. They might use different polyelectrolytes as a genetic molecule, in which case we need some more agnostic approach how to search for life. So solid state nanopore, it's uh, quite similar to the nanopore I just showed you, but it said instead of the protein, which is specific for DNA, you have just a, a hole which has uh, defined properties. And then as uh, the poly polymer is threaded through this hole, um, you see a drop in um, electric current. And from, uh, from the 
depth, you can say how thick the molecule is. And from the uh, well, length, you can time uh, in, the, in the channel, you can estimate uh, how long is the molecule. So you can, it can tell you quite a lot about the shape of the molecule you are studying. And if you find on Mars polyelectrolytes that are uh, long polyelectrolytes uh, with, uh, with structure that it's, well, long polymer, you can be quite sure that it's not uh, produced abiotically. You, have, you need to have life to produce that. Um, well, and because we have proposed to, uh, because we propose to do this on a, on a rockets that are, that are being refueled, the sample return is quite included in this. We can also include a mass spec analysis of the concentrated DNA. We can uh, try to use assembly, assembly theory uh, to analyze them, but these are like bonus analyzers we don't need to incorporate. Okay, now I made a, this table to compare the missions that we really talked about today. That's the Red Dragon, uh, that's the Amy's uh, Mars Life Explorer, and that's our ALF. Uh, so Red Dragon, it's a, it was a Discovery class mission, uh, which likely was uh, canceled because the capsule is not, no longer planned to land on Mars, but maybe Maybe some other private company can take over. Um, I think I should hurry up. So the goal of the Red Dragon was to search for extant life and they would actually be able to find uh, Terran Earth type life uh, with, uh, uh, if the concentration of the cells is about 1 million cells per milliliter. Um, Amy's mission uh, is uh, more agnostic, but less sensitive. Uh, it needs uh, about 1 billion cells per milliliter. And because we are using such a huge samples and using nanopores, which are much more sensitive, we can uh, detect life when you have less than one cell per liter. To characterize it fully, to characterize a Martian biosphere, we would need, of course, higher concentration than that. So Red Dragon was conclusive for life as we know, know it. MLE uh, was not conclusive and would likely require additional missions or change the instruments on board. And we propose is that yes, we can be conclusive and not only uh, conclusively find life, we would also um, analyze it. So a simple return, Red Dragon, um, could have a version which returned the sample. Um, the Amy's mission did not propose sample return. And of course, if, uh, if, uh, if these rockets get refueled on, on the Mars surface, then yes, we can have return. Um, so these two missions are repeatable with commercial space. NASA is likely not going to fly the same mission again. Um, and if it does, it will not be much more cheaper through a scale. And since ALF is planned to be sent with every starship, it can be actually um, sent to every multiple times. So uh, they provided uh, estimates, uh, estimate costs. Uh, we propose to be about 10 times cheaper than the cheaper of the missions. And that's because we are cheating. We are not proposing to send the whole mission. We are proposing just to send this uh, little add on to the missions. So, yeah, and we we believe that we can fly it within within decades. And now you might believe that uh, it's crazy to propose to fly private astrobiology missions to a different planet, but we are already doing it uh, with a uh, with Rocket Lab and MIT group. We are looking for organics on Mars uh, that I proposed in. 2021, um, and yeah, we have a solid plan. Um, we have um, we have good engineers. We have people who believe it, uh, believe that we can find life conclusively within a couple of years. But of course, uh, as uh, as Robert, we also miss funding. So, if you need know people who know people, 
uh, please talk to me. I'll be around. Um, and I would like to thank uh, my Alpha Mars team who who is helping me. And for more reading, I would suggest go to Primordial Scoop. And yeah, thank you very much. And I'm taking questions. Um, so if everything goes in our favor logistically, how likely do you think it is to still miss an existing life on Mars? Well, in other words, uh, how conclusively would you take a negative result? Yeah, uh, proving negative is impossible, as you know. So uh, exactly. We can only uh, give you uh, like lower threshold on concentration of life on Mars. So we can say, okay, Mars has less than one cell per liter uh, with our mission. If we repeat it with thousand other starships, we can say, okay, life has uh, Mars have less than one cell per one ton of Martian ice. And of course, you cannot say that there is not a single cell in Mars. So, what we are proposing in this, in my part, is a one cell per liter lower limit. So I, I thought the nanopore approach was fascinating. With regards to a, a structure that could detect biology, would cosmic rays potentially cause a problem with the detection system? And is there redundancy built in to counter that? Right. So the nanopore itself, it's going to be hidden within the starship, and it's going to be shielded within that structure. And also, um, the read itself, it's so fast that it's quite unlikely that you would destroy it um, during the read. So I don't think that would be a problem. Um, the timeline for a Mars sample return, does have you thought of aligning with that as a possibility? Uh, yeah, there's uh, not much time. Uh, we actually, the missions or the grant proposals we are writing with nasa they don't account for missions that could find life within the next five years um we if i believe that if we had funding and if i can spend some time in lab uh, that could be developed within five years so 2028 it's uh in my opinion doable so to operate the nanopore device, do you need to like destroy cellular structures to extract the DNA first? Yes. Is there so, any way to preserve the cellular structures, or were you, would you consider something like flow cytometry as a as another right. instrument? Yeah, you 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 could different. Uh, you can do different approaches. Uh, we are proposing actually, I didn't highlight it here, uh, to destroy uh, destroy everything with ultrasound. And ultrasound uh, like releases the DNA, so we can actually extract it from the cells. For that's that would be different approach. I mean, what what I would really like we we've written a article with uh, Stephen and Robert. We need more people to compete to find life on Mars. You know, you can use your cytometry and send it along Alf to you know it can be downstream from Alf before we destroy it to search for DNA. You can search for cells. Dr. Spessick, some years ago, I sat in on a meeting with uh, Dr. Seth Shostak of the SETI Institute, made a comment that when we encounter ET, if you will, that it might not be biological at all. It might be a machine or AI. Uh, the serious question, I'm not being facetious, have you ever considered that possibility or contingency? Well, that search is for the future astronaut. It's uh, not what our mission proposes.
There we go. Next up, we have Dr. Stephen Benner, uh, who is an American chemist. He has been a professor at Harvard, ETH Zurich, and most recently, the University of Florida. In 2005, he founded Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution. Benner and his colleagues were the first to synthesize a gene beginning the field of synthetic biology. He was instrumental in establishing the field of paleogenics. He is interested in the origin of life and the chemical conditions and processes needed to produce RNA. Uh, Benner has worked with NASA to develop detectors for alien genetic materials. Dr. Steve Benner. I think it's so worth. So let me just see what students do we have? Who is in elementary school? Are you in elementary school? Raise your hand. What grade are you in? Oh, excellent. We have a sixth grader. Do we have anybody in junior high school or high school? College. Who is here as a student of life? <laughs> Great. So this is an inspirational talk. I'm going to actually discuss a couple of things. This is Marion Sanders, by the way, who was a uh, um, uh, guidance engineer for the Apollo moon mission. And uh, I guess the question will be, how do I move this forward? Do I press the key there or do I do something else? Jim, Mr. Burke, Wait, to move this slide forward, do I push this, 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 or this? And none of them seem to work. There may be a focus issue, so let's just make sure we're on the right screen here, trying out. Aha. So the questions we're going to ask, are you smarter than a fifth grader? And if you're a sixth grader, you are, right? This is clear. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I'm, I'm going to persuade you that you're much smarter than a NASA committee. Um, and if you can beat them back, uh, Mars is yours. And by the way, Marion Sanders is not only Apollo immune, he actually managed to beat the Martian, uh, beat the NASA committees. He was uh, sufficiently, well, he died two years ago. He is my father-in-law. Well, he's my wife's father, but he was alive to see or uh, hear Tranquility Base, the Eagle has landed using guidance systems that he actually developed. So NASA, the community is not, sending missions to seek extant life on Mars. And this is a statement from John Rommel and Catherine Conley. They are not uh, making policy, they're just reflecting policy. They, the Mars exploration programs, NASA and ESA, explicitly focus on investigating sites of ancient habitability. Uh, John and Catherine go on to write, and this is 2017, by the way, the Mars community is not convinced that missions to attempt redetection of extant Martian life is a high priority. Now that re, and I put it in red, they did not put it in red, but they did put a question mark after it. That's a tease, okay? Because they're gonna figure out in a moment that there is in fact a claim that they have already discovered life extant on Mars. So the question is, NASA community is not sending missions to seek extant life. So I'll ask from the entire audience, ask the fifth grader question, don't overthink it. Don't get sophisticated. What do you ask if someone tells you that the NASA community is not sending missions to seek exit life on Mars? Very good. Okay. Why not? I mean, that's a very good question. It's not because the constituents that NASA serves, which is the American public, are not interested in Martian life. Here in 1996 is the Alan Hills meteorite photograph published by Dave McKay at the uh, at Houston, and uh, there was uh, seemingly microbes in that picture. What happened? Well, that brought President Bill Clinton to the Rose Garden to have an announcement. Now, for those of you who know, cold fusion did not bring any presidents to the Rose Gardens. You know, James Webb telescope discovery did not bring them. The cells on Mars, now that brings presidents to the Rose Garden, okay? Yes, it was controversial, scientists argues, but that's okay, because that's what science is. It's a perpetual argument, or as I like to say, it's the process of iterative ignorance, right? Or as Richard Feynman said, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts, right? You start there. So what did Bill Clinton ask Dan Golden, who was head of NASA? Fifth grader question. Is there life on Mars? <laughs> is this life or not? Very good, I'm gonna have to, you, you're smarter than the fifth grade, that's good. So gold purportedly, I got this story from Jerry Soffin, the golden purportedly asked, answered, don't know. At which point, Clinton asked the fifth, sixth grader question, which would be, why are we paying you? 
Okay, you are the guys who are responding. We, we held NASA for just in case there's a first contact, right? So that you can deal with it when the aliens land and like in the day the Earth stood still and threatened the entire planet unless we love each other or something else, right? We have somebody. Now, Dan is a, was a brilliant, he's still alive, by the way, still active. He's a brilliant administrator because he said back in return, we'll give us enough money to set up the NASA Astrobiology Institute and we'll go and find this out for you. And NASA Astrobiology Institute worked for 20 years did marvelous stuff and you're going to see some of it on this talk but the bottom line is that what does nasa now do instead of seeking life well nasa committee just selected seven interdisciplinary centers for astrobiological research which are called icar so the university of colorado icar is asking about atmospheres escaping from planets circling other stars the asu icar asked about rocks and gases from planets circling other stars the University of Washington, headed by Vicki Meadows, asked about gases in the atmospheres of planets circling other stars. John Hopkins has an eye car just selected, asking about planets circling M dwarf, which in case you didn't know, you're a yellow dwarf. You're not an M dwarf. That's another kind of star. Right. And NASA Goddard ICE, uh, ICAR is asking about climates on rocky planets circling other stars. Now, would you care to ask the fifth grader question? Well, uh, so the next fifth grade question is if they can argue about this where the sample is in their hands, what are the chances they're going to be able to answer the question, is there life out there by looking at reflected light, that's not life, reflected light from a planet 20 light years distance, okay, and that's the problem. Okay, now NASA does send by committee missions to Mars. Okay, so here's one of them. We are flying drones on Mars, and if you read the mission statement, the reason why we're flying drones on Mars is to learn whether we can fly on Mars. Okay, and that's got some redeeming feature because it's possible we could fly into a cave on Mars, and the cave is one of the refuges where maybe life is being held. Um, they're looking, they're piling up rocks on Mars, okay? Why are they piling up rocks on Mars? Well, they are basically planning to get ready, to get ready, to get ready to look for life on Mars by bringing them back. So you, um, for the fifth graders, it seems as if the committees, dot, 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 it seems as if the committees, well, well, <laughs> well I wasn't going to say that. It's almost as if the committees don't want to look for life on Mars because maybe they're afraid to search for life, that the search for life will fail. And if you talk to Mary Wojtek, who was running the program up until this last summer, um, that's what she would say. We're afraid that what we did in Viking would lead to, again, if we did it now, an ambiguous result, and the public would no longer support us because the public does not understand that science can produce ambiguous results. But there's another possibility is that they're afraid that they don't actually know how to look for life on Mars. Okay, and sometimes NASA actually says that. Okay, you can read the 2020, uh, 2013 decadal survey it says that only by bringing samples to Earth can we truly answer the question at a time when future generations, future generations, yeah, will study them using techniques yet to be invented. They're saying we don't know how to do it. So, what we're going to do is put a placeholder, we're going to collect the rocks so that sometime in the future, we hope we'll figure out how to find life on Mars. And uh, they're acting as if they're afraid the public will not understand the process of iterative ignorance and will not accept a partial answer. And there's a lot of discussion. Jan mentioned the primordialscoop.org. We have blog people from all over the place um, talking about these things. So there is a problem, okay? To be an explorer, you have to be motivated. And a motivated explorer believes that their exploration will find something. So there's Columbus. His motivation was wrong. He was going to find India. He found the New World because he was grossly ignorant about the actual size of the Earth. And the Portuguese knew that, which is why they didn't fund him, right? But he went with the Spanish, who were not so smart, did not know the actual size of the Earth. And, of course, he found something interesting. Not that he ever understood that. He, he died thinking he had found India. But Henry Hudson went looking for the Northwest Passage. Now, actually, there is a Northwest Passage. And he just said his technology of the day was not able to use it. But when you go search for life on Mars, you actually do this iterative ignorance and what you find on Mars. And back in 19, that would be 1976 rather than 1776. Oh, that was a good year too. Mm. They found that if you put, you know, I just flew for overnight from uh, 
Florida because American Airlines canceled my ticket. I'm not very awake. So that 1776 should not be there. But they found that if you put about 4.9 times 10 to the minus 7 moles of carbon-14 labeled food, and there's the food with the carbon in magenta, that the Martian surface respired. It exhaled carbon dioxide. And they inhaled, exhaled about 15% of the easily exhaled carbons out of that, those molecules. And by the way, you also respire. If I were to feed you these in, in, in this particular bottle, if they're all in here, but if I were to make them radioactively labeled, you would also exhale radioactive carbon dioxide. And so this was actually an experiment set up for the purpose of uh, searching for a sign of Martian metabolism, biometabolism, living metabolism. And it was a prima facie case for life. So it's an amusing question is you say, you know, is that 15% of four times 10 to the minus seven moles of material, a large amount or a small amount? Well, we can compare the experiments in Antarctica with the experiments of Mars, or maybe that's the other way around. I haven't told you, but that's in fact the, where those are coming from. And this is actually the source of that tease that John Rommel and Catherine Connolly put you in the first thing. They put a redetection because those are the results from Mars and Antarctica, and they look very, very similar. And of course, Gil Levin and Patricia Stratt, who defined this or built this experiment, at least managed it, were the people who went for it. And um, so that's great. So what did the community decide in a committee? Well, this is actually from 19, sorry, from 2021. It was published in 2022. In 2021, NASA worried that someone might incorrectly claim to have found a biosignature. And there actually was a case in Venus where they had found phosphine, phosphorus with three hydrogen atoms. And they said, maybe, maybe, maybe this is coming from life. And NASA was therefore unwilling to accept the normal back and forth in science to resolve that issue. Like they were willing to accept it back with that microbial cell structures in the Allen Hills meteorite in 1976 or 1996 rather. So what they decided to do, and this is really kind of amusing, they decided to get a committee of experts together to come up with community consensus standards for what biosignatures were allowed or allowable and which ones were not. Now, for those of you who don't think that's science, I would agree with you, right? But they did. They put up this report. You can go read it. It's on the web in 2022, a year ago. Community report, biosignature standards works. It was headed by Vicki Meadows, who's one of the ICAR headers. She's a University of Washington professor, an excellent astronomer. She's a former friend. She does not return my emails anymore. And she's, okay. But they concluded that the respiration result was negative for life. And they said the gas exchange experiment, which is a second experiment on Mars, which I'll get to in a minute, and a search for organics using the Viking gas chromatography mass spectrometry system, that's GCMS, support a non-biological interpretation of the respiration result. That is in print out of a committee of experts. By the way, 350 people applied for that. 82 were selected this is the cream of the cream of a NASA committee, all right? And that's what they say about that result. So again, I will go back and show you all the nice animation. Um, but the question that you should ask is, what were the gas exchange and GCMS results that supported a non-biological interpretation of those results? Well, there they are. There's the Viking gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. It heated the soil to 500 degrees centigrade before looking for hot. So we can just keep NASA from heating the damn soil to 650 degrees centigrade. We have a chance. We have known for now years that the Martian soil contains perchlorates that destroy organics at 500 degrees centigrade. Chris McKay, this is this, uh, the senior author on the Navarro Gonzalez paper, which I cite there, did a long study of it. There's been some back and forth, but everybody agrees that the GC mass spec does not support a non-life exp explanation, forget exploration of respiration, full stop. And we actually wrote a paper now 20, a quarter of a century ago called The Missing Organic Molecules on Mars, which said for the kinds of organics you'd expect to have there, the GCMS would not see them even if it was sitting on a pile of them. Okay. 
Great, but nevertheless, that does not prevent the community from still saying in print that the Viking GC mass spec support a non-biological interpretation of the result. Okay, you, I mean, you were probably being taught in school that only facts and logic drive science. It's not true on NASA committees, but I love this line from men in blacks, a person is smart. In fact, the people on the NASA committee is generally very smart, but people are dumb panicky dangerous animals and, and you know it and a number of people have commented on this report on primary primordial scoop now this misinterpretation of the viking gcms spec that it detected no organics and therefore the martian soil was sterile self-sterilizing in fact and therefore could not possibly hold life has poisoned the culture from 1976 on so there were actually three experiments. Uh, it led to the misinterpretation of one of the second experiments was that when you put water on the Martian surface, you got O2 out, oxygen, dioxygen, which you have in the atmosphere around here. Okay, it bubbles out. So the question is, can fifth graders criticize the logic of the head of the Viking biology team when they saw that result? So here he is, Harold Chuck Klein, head of the Viking biology team, by the way, very, very intelligent man. I, there's no question about that. So he said, we must be wary of biological interpretations of the label release experiments. That's where you exhaled radioactive carbon dioxide from radioactive food. In the face of the information, you indicating that all the samples yielded oxygen, what's in the air, in the gas exchange experiment upon introduction of water. They put water on, got oxygen off. The evidence for strongly oxidizing chemicals in these samples is quite convincing. Now, I'm putting in square brackets to make sure you understand I'm not changing that quote except where I put it in square brackets for clarity. That's what he actually said. Must be wearing what must be convincing. Uh, can the eighth grader, sixth graders talk about the logic of that? Well, let me give you, right, there's Aristotle, okay. Uh, Chuck's syllogism is that Martian soil, when heated with water, releases O2. Okay. Anything that releases O2 contains a strongly oxidizing chemical. Therefore, Martian soil contains a strongly oxidizing chemical. Let me give you a different syllogism. Martian soil, when treated with water, releases O2. And anything that releases O2 contains O2. Therefore, Martian soil contains O2. All right. And O2 is not a strongly oxidizing chemical. That is, if I put the food on this table, exposed to oxygen, there you go. It's not releasing CO2. Okay. So oxygen is thermodynamically, as we like to say, a strong oxidant. It's not kinetically a strong oxidant, doesn't react fast. Perchlorate's the same. Perchlorate does not release O2 from food when it's at room temperature, but you heat it to 500 degrees centigrade and you have actually fireworks. That's what a lot of fireworks are. So is everybody with me? Okay. Now, if the Martian organism is photosynthetic, it fixes carbon from CO2 using solar energy. That's during the daytime, of course. CO2 goes to C plus O2. That's what goes on in the plants outside, where the C is a food that is storing the energy of the sun. Now, what question would the sixth grader ask? Now, this is a difficult one, yes? Very good. Are you sure you are smart? I, I, I thought I was going to have to have another slide where I actually highlighted daytime in red. You know, what does Martian photosynthesis do at night? Well, okay. What do Earth organisms do at night? Well, they respire. <laughs> okay. Well, on Earth, Terran photosynthesis, they take CO and O2 and go backwards to get CO2. And Terran plants consume the food that they make in the day by burning it with O2 at night. So where do the Terran plants get O2? <laughs> From the atmosphere, of course. So Earth life accessing light can also perforce excess oxygen. On Earth, on this planet, if you have access to light, you have oxygen access day and night. Okay, so the earth plant knows that they can recover the O2 that they make during the day, discarded during the day when they need it back at night. Not, not the same molecule, but O2 is fungible, right? So they can get it back. But this does not apply to photosynthetic life living on Mars. Okay, in fact, if you have to think like a Martian photosynthesis, you say, hey, I store solar energy by CO2 going to C and O2 during the day on Mars. My atmosphere has no O2. If I discard the O2 that I generate in the day into the Martian atmosphere, it will have no oxygen to respire at night with. So I must store O2 from the nighttime. 
So what did the gas exchange experiment do? Well, the gas exchange experiment is doing what we expect from a Martian biosphere, doing photosynthesis. It's getting the surface to release the O2 that the living organisms there are storing for the nighttime. So what did the community just guide? There's Vicky again, the excellent astronomer, former friend. Um, uh, the GAR GC experiment, also the gas exchange experiment also, as well as the GC mass spec supported non-biological technology. So every part of this statement is wrong, including the ands and the these. Okay, there's just nothing true. And, and, and so I want to recommend to all the people who are under the age of, well, I guess the older people know this, but science is a belief in the ignorance of experts, right? And there you've got it. So think of a science like a scientist now. We got numbers. I've been putting numbers up all over the place. The soil holds about seven times 10 to the minus seventh moles of CO2 per gram. Okay, that must be matched by seven times seven month, seven moles of carbon per gram. Well, why? Well, because the O2 is coming from CO2. It's like my asking you is how much of, uh, uh, fossil fuel reserves are there on the planet Earth? Well, you say, you go look it up in Google. There's so many metric tons of, of, of coal. But in point of fact, the way you can calculate that, including the hidden stuff, is by looking at how much oxygen there is in the air. Because if you believe that all the oxygen in the air is coming from photosynthesis, and certainly a majority of it is, for every O2 there is in the air, there's a C buried someplace, okay? And it turns out if you actually do the calculation, we've only found maybe a tenth of a percent of the total reserves of hydrocarbons. So that's 10 to the minus seven moles of carbon per gram of organic carbon, of biological carbon per gram. Now, the question that you would ask if you were a fifth grader is, was that a lot or a little? And the answer is, well, what about the Terran microbes? Well, the answer is an Earth uh, E. coli bacterium contains um, about 10 to the minus 14 grams of carbon, a single cell. Um, that means that if we say that an E. coli cell is like a Martian photosynthetic cell or an E. coli cyanobacterial cell or Earth cyanobacterial cell is like a Martian cell. We have about 10 to the seven cells per gram, maybe 10 to the six. There's a wiggle room here. So that a lot of little, well, the answer is that's about the low end of densities of cells on Earth. That's about the density of these cells in the Antarctic samples that produces these results. So what you're seeing is that uh, the Antarctic gas exchange experiment is in agreement, actually, with the label ex released experiment um, quantitatively, right? You're looking at the amount of carbon that is, the amount of metabolism is consistent with about 10 to the seven cells, 10 to the six cells per cc of, of soil. And that's also the amount of oxygen that's being stored by those purported or alleged cells to manage photo respira respiration at night when they don't have the possibility of doing photosynthesis. So the question now for Yad, which I forgot to ask him, so I just made up an answer. That's about 10 to the um, 12 building blocks of genetic polyelectrolyte. Remember, Yan is looking not for the molecules that are the products of life, but the molecules that are required for Darwinian evolution, which is required for life. So there's about, those molecules have to be these so-called polyelectrolytes, which he has this machine that is going to isolate from large amounts of mined Martian water. Can alpha find these? And I just answered the question because I didn't get a chance to ask you. Can alpha find these? Well, the question will be how many liters of water do you have to look to find them? But the only reason I thought about this is because Robert Zubrin made me. <laughs> so Robert wants to do Mars Technology Institute, right? And so the question is, can you eat this stuff? Now, it's an interesting food stuff. And I had never really thought about this before I put my mind to it, right? This little package contains both the food and the oxidant, right? Now, you got to keep in mind that when I have to drink this, I can eat the stuff that people, photosynthesis has made uh, well, more or less directly as food, but I have to go out and find my own oxidant. I have to build the lungs and I have to do all this hard work to get the oxidant for it. So it's the difference between jet fuel and rocket fuel, right? The jet fuel, you have the reduced component, which is eventually going to coming from solar energy if it's using fossil fuels. And you have to go out, if you're the jet, you have to find the oxidant out there in the atmosphere. But of course, rocket fuel carries both the oxidant and the, uh, and the, uh, and, and the uh, reductant with it in one package. And so this was, of course, brought me back to my seventh grade where I was told by, uh, we asked, how are we going to farm the oceans and live underwater, under sea? And the idea was we're not gonna actually try to grow corn in the Marianas Trench, right? We're going to 
learn how to eat seaweed. So this is the same question on Mars. We don't want to necessarily try to grow corn in greenhouses, but if we have uh, bile in Mars, which is a food stuff, which carries both, now you uh, the oxygen and the reductant, you, now you're gonna still need to have oxygen in the air because you have the lungs and you rely on it, but you, every time you swallow one of these bugs, you actually won't deplete any of the oxygen in the air because the Martian bug will be providing both the oxygen and the reductant. So that's why I thought about this, Robert. Yeah. So back to the being the explorer, okay? We must be convinced of four things to commit resources to seek extent Martians. First, that you have to be convinced that life originated on Mars, although Jan now is arguing that you can also get panspermia, you get life there originating somewhere else. You also have to believe that life survived on Mars as Mars lost its atmosphere, cooled and dried. There's no question that Mars underwent a tremendous amount of planetary change, but so did Earth with the appearance of all this oxygen poison in the air, which if you're not able to handle the radicals and stuff that come from it, um, it is in fact poison. Then NASA has to be able to access those places where it lives in refugia in particular, I've already mentioned caves. And then NASA can unambiguously identify Martians as it encounters. Now, you, know, you actually know more about biosignatures having heard Jan's talk than the NASA community represented by these two documents. I, I actually can't find in either of these documents, the polyelectrolyte theory of the gene, you find a couple of instances of what is called assembly theory. There's a few other modern ideas, but mostly what you see is the same old ideas that people have been arguing about for 50 years as their light detection uh, tools, often in combination. Um, we must be convinced that life survived in areas and we can get access to them. Um, I'm Carolyn, uh, Carol Stoker gave a talk in the Mars Society tw two years ago where she pointed out where all this ice was and Jan produced some of this. The last question then, of course, is what about the origin of life? Now, I talked about this last year, so just some highlights. This is Elisa Biondi and Craig Jerome, who showed that if you take triphosphates, you make RNA on basaltic glass, which of course basalt is the number one rock that's all across the surface of Mars. And those little bands that you see up at the top in the smudges are in fact, I guess I don't see that because I don't have the pointer going, but that's RNA that's being made. It's a polyelectrolyte. It meets the requirements for a genetic evolvable molecule. In fact, you know this because the genome of COVID is RNA, unfortunately. But RNA is also thought on Earth to have been the first polyelectrolyte to support Darwinian evolution. And again, if you go looking for RNA, you're not looking for a product of life, but you're looking at a molecule that's essential for life, that is essential for Darwinian evolution. And I got a little sample of the basalt that we've been looking at. That's actually from not from Mars, that's from Iceland. I have not yet had the heart to melt that sample of the black beauty and try this out on that. But that's fine. Now, the overall process leading to RNA, I'm not gonna go through it. I have distributed around you, you can find the chemistry with a sheet on it in case you would like to have them. There's some up on the tables up here maybe. But I won't walk through this with you because we did last year. The overall process leads to RNA from carbon dioxide. That's the red part of this chemistry. Nitrogen after it has been reduced by a impactor roughly the size of the asteroid Vesta, that's the blue part. Polyphosphates, which are also coming from the basalt, which are the violet, and that carbohydrate maturation and nucleoside formation is moderated by mineral borate, which is the green material. So those are the four things which we must be convinced of that life originated there. You have the handout or you can choose panspermia if you prefer. Life survived as Mars lost its atmosphere, cooled and dry. By the way, there's an excellent um, uh, paper that Carol helped write from a Carlsbad conference in uh, 2019 discussing exactly where life survived on Mars, where the refugee are, where the water is. Um, NASA can access these refugee. In fact, if you um, disregard the community consensus culture committee, uh, it appears that Viking already did access that environment and that NASA can unambiguously identify Martians, which is Jan's talk, which again, you don't go looking for the products of life. You go looking for the molecules that are essential for life, where your concept of essential in life, it means Darwinian evolution. That is the ability to have children, replications with imperfections, where the imperfections are themselves replicable. And that's the microscopic steps that are required for natural selection to do what Darwinian evolution is believed to be uniquely able to do, and that is to 
um, bring properties that we value in life by a spontaneous reorganization of matter. So now it's time for you to decide if you are motivated enough to seek life on Mars, given your assessment of the probabilities, because there's no 100% on any of these. Um, for the student, an inspirational talk, you are smarter than a fifth grader, much smarter than NASA committees. And if you can beat them back, Mars is yours. And that's, of course, quite a promise. But I'm, you know, I'm more optimistic than this slide says. I actually think that sooner or later we can get the NASA community culture to understand the facts, but it's been quite hard. But if Martians are to be found in this decade, if you're pessimistic, private missions are needed. Great. And you can help by participating in Alpha Mars. Thanks for your attention. Questions, comments, criticisms, attacks, personal attacks. I love them. Yes. Well, yeah, I don't know. I don't control the microphone and I have arthritis. Otherwise, I would. Yes, go ahead. Right here. Oh. Oh, oh. So she has a question. Yeah. Oh, ask a question. Um, so have you considered the Martian ionosphere or mesopause as a possible <laughs> refuge for no, the I, biomolecules of life? Like, I'm not that smart. No, sorry. Oh, you are smart as a fifth grader. No, well, that, yeah, that's true. No, that's, oh, sure, sure. What, what, what's your attraction to the mesosphere by just, just in 25 uh, words or less? Well, because for, for one thing, uh, um, the Chinese flew a balloon flight. You've heard of those, Chinese yeah. balloon flights. And they've they found cyanobacteria nostoc yep. can survive quite well in that region, and they even upregulate their heat shock genes and restore function after there has been injury. Only uh, twenty eight percent of them survive. Do we have a volume density of the cells? Just my curiosity that you can pull out of your not uh, not out memory. of my pretty little head. No, okay. but it's in the it's in the literature. Yeah, yeah, I just don't. And know. the other thing is that um, you know the mesospause seems to be a place that. Um, protects formations yes. because you have you have cations coming in yeah. from the solar yeah. and yeah. right yeah you know i'm a chemist and so I, you know with, for a chemist everything looks like redox potential yes right all forms of life live at a different redox potential that was yeah that's interesting i mean there's another question of whether venus you know at the at the high up where it's relatively cool but it's still acidic you have energy of course a lot of it and the question is whether you could have something floating in the clouds there and there's a whole group of people in astrobiology, some of them are my friends and still are, um, which uh, who study these things. And so I, I wouldn't rule it out, it's just that I have not thought about it. Well, I'll, I'll give a plug for my talk on Tuesday and I'll give you some more, <laughs> I'm sorry, Saturday, and give you some more details if you're so kind or have time Excellent. to attend. Okay. We have a fifth grader about to, uh, sorry, a sixth grader. Um, I feel that it's kind of a reoccurring theme that people like NASA, and they're, they're just thinking about the effects that finding life on Mars would affect the public instead of what it would affect future missions. Yeah, yeah, there's no question that NASA does consider, and if you talk to Mary Wojtek or any of the people in headquarters, they are very aware of what NASA how the public might react to NASA. Now, you got to keep in mind that in Viking in 1976, when those results came back, ambiguous because of misinterpretation. Within weeks, jet propulsion laboratories, doors were closed, people were filed. And for a government agency to have a program shut is a very traumatic experience, right? That normally does not happen to government programs. So, so they are very much concerned about an ambiguous result leading to a conclusion by the public that they do not want to be committed to funding the program. That's a very much on their mind. But yeah, you're right. They're not, I mean, what, what do you think is the future mission impact of this? Um, I just think that they should be thinking that once they find life, they should be thinking more about how that could affect missions and what that would mean for them to do next, what the next step is for exploring Mars, because that could have a very big impact on what they actually have to do to terraform and extend what they're doing on Mars if there's other life there. Yeah, no, that's right. Well, what do you think? If so, as we told you with 100% certainty right now that there was 10 to the seventh microbial cells per cubic centimeter of, uh, of Mars, what would you, how would you change missions? I would think that we not only need to 
find more life, but we need to preserve that life so that we can study it more. Than because you have a preservation concern. Preservation so that we have it left for new generations to explore and see if there is more life than just that, if it becomes more advanced and if it is capable of evolution. Yeah. Great. Thank you. If you sit in the front, you're not going to get to ask a question. So, <laughs> oh. back to why NASA may not be looking for life, at least not effectively. What effect do you think has the planetary protection doctrine have on that? I understand it leads to not even landing in spots that may be most likely to contain life. And how do you see that evolving in the future to where we actually can effectively look for life on Mars once we're able to get humans to Mars? Look, um, Jan had the best answer to this. I, my first planetary protection committee meeting was a week in 2000, a quarter of a century ago. I actually remember catch, it was in DC. I got the worst case of the flu I've ever had, but that was not Martian, but you're absolutely right. What planetary protection does is makes the cost of these things exorbitant relative to what they could be or might be if you were to just recognize what Jan has said and what Robert, we wrote a paper with Robert and where was it? Some yeah, New Atlantis, exactly. Basically, you're already having in intercourse between these two planets naturally. Um, we're going to bring back, say, 10 kilos of uh, new rocks to add to how many kilos come back every year? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. So the bottom line is that NASA now, so right now, what's happened in Congress for a sample return is that the Congress has said you're having these cost overruns always. Okay, that's, that's common. But now you haven't even said you're gonna, how you're gonna spend money and how much it's gonna cost us up a quarantine station on the moon. The engineering analysis, if you do it, there will always be somewhere in the decimal points, the possibility the mission will fail and the rocket will bring the samples back to earth. But the committees do not understand that bringing the samples back to earth is what happens all the time. And so I've got, Five with Bob Bruner, who is a uh, one of our citizen donors um, to the our program, we helped us buy five and a half grams of Black Beauty. I, you know, we we inhale it, we hold it, we we're not dead, and so this is a, uh, is creating a huge cost for no for for the perception of risk avoidance. Now, frankly, what you said, I mean, I don't know your name a moment ago, is a more serious question for me, right? There's a so-called Ford contamination. I'm worried a little bit about going there and dumping Matt Damon's feces all over the surface of Mars. And, and I don't think it's gonna take over Mars, but I don't think those organisms are adapted for Mars, but they would be obscure our ability to detect indigenous life, especially if we use life detection methods like our, what are being proposed by these committees, which are going to be looking for things designed in a way to look for things that life on earth produces. So that I have a bigger concern about the forward contamination, but you're right, it, it's damnably expensive and it's really a objection. And as you mentioned, we're not going to the special regions, the high probability regions, partly because we're afraid of forward contamination. But this nice man, he's, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go, go. I'm going to let somebody who controls the microphone decide. That oh, way I don't get mad, people mad at me. Oh, thank you very much for your talk. Super provocative. And it's really nice having it paired with Jan's talk back, back to back. I almost always think about um, private space exploration, leveraging the ability of private companies. That's how my mind thinks all the time. And, you know, of all the shade casting on the committees, you know, it, it, it just feels good. Like, oh, yeah, I hate committees. And you can see how it gets there, the, uh, this ossification. You know, NASA doesn't have any true competition. It's got this centralized budget. It's got the mandate from the public. It is America's space program. But as I'm looking at that cartoon, I had a, a sobering new thought, which is, I think that's going to happen. I think private companies are going to beat NASA. I think a private company would run Jan's experiment and find life on Mars. And so then my question is, has, has anybody here thought about what would happen to NASA after that? Like, could they, could they recover from that? I think ultimate disgrace kind of. I would give this over to Jan. Jan keeps talking to me about a space, a Mars race, right? 
Uh, competition's great. I, I love it, yeah. and I think that's but the China thing. is the is the is yeah. the other person going. But India, you know, just landed something on the moon that they're very happy. Well, it didn't last as long as they would like, but that's yeah. a different subject. It's, look, I, I it, my my point is that yeah, look, I have a lot of sympathy for NASA. Actually, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just that I'm a NASA family and grew up with NASA and all the yeah. rest of it. Um, but yes, the it's very difficult to break free of the way in which you look at things. And that becomes especially true when you get a bunch of us in the room at the same time. And I'm not any less guilty of this than other people. You get me into a NASA committee, my brain turns to mush. I understand that. And uh, the problem is that it's quite conceivable that this will happen. And it, but keep in mind, one thing that is not widely known is that NASA actually doesn't really exactly fly missions, right? What NASA does is it subcontracts to companies to fly missions. So my father-in-law did not work for NASA. He actually worked for Delco, of all things. It was their guidance system. So, so, so NASA is outsourcing stuff to SpaceX, right? They're, they're, they're flying things with SpaceX. So it may very well be that there will be a continuum at some point between public and private efforts, where it's public funding and private execution. But again, you still need to have the committees that decide what to do and I know there are a lot of people in this room who think that going to the moon now is a cosmic waste of resources compared to what you could do with respect to Mars. Last question. Are you at all concerned that given the, the impact of SpaceX beating NASA to Mars that they might um, attempt to undercut the, you know, such efforts? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm saying, I mean, if hypothetically, you're talking space, politics here, right? I certainly am. <laughs> um, I'm saying, you know, if it if it could actually seriously damage NASA, that my question is, will NASA take steps to make sure that it does not? Well, I, I mean, Robert made a, a sly remark this morning about how if Elon Musk takes another risk that he doesn't need to take, I think that's what you said, or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, look, I, I you know, not, I, I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's a good question. You're asking a scientist a political question. That's a really dangerous thing to do because we scientists hate to say the four most important words in science is, I have no idea, right? So, with that, I have no idea. Actually, in 1996, when the Allen Hills meteorite surface um, suggesting that there could be life on Mars, President Clinton's immediate response was, okay, how do we get there? Um, that, that is, I, I, you know, these committees may worry about people in the public worried about uh, the back contamination or the forward contamination people in the public are interested in finding life that's what they're interested in and anything that makes mars more interesting such as the suggestion that it might have life on it in particular uh is a motivation uh and in fact at the democratic convention in um 1996 uh, Dick Morris, who was Bill Clinton's political wizard, was planning to have Clinton announce a program of humans to Mars in response to this discovery. OK, but unfortunately. Two weeks before that was to happen, Morris was uh, uh, knocked out of politics by a scandal and the convention speech was rewritten and the humans to mars program that bill clinton would have launched was aborted what was that, was that? that's how close we what came. was the scandal it was a sex scandal involving morris and a prostitute okay, okay. And, okay. and by the way i have i've confirmed this story with morris personally the mars, the mars story. that's right the, the the mars part of it <laughs> The, the other part was confirmed by the media. Okay. <laughs> this nice man has been Can waiting you? for the longest time. I appreciate your patience. Oh. <laughs> I can't believe it. This was my lucky day. <laughs> I'm in the front and I got the microphone. Uh, my question is about perchlorate. Hmm. Uh, there's perchlorate that's been found 
on Mars, I understand. Uh, since I am involved in the building of rocket engines, uh, we're very familiar with perchlorate. It's been used as a rocket propellant in the past, and it's been, uh, in many cases, developed industrially on Earth here, and it's very toxic or can be very toxic. So my question is twofold. Number one, how did the perchlorate end up on Mars? And number two, is there any use for it as a rocket propellant to use Mars as a space launch base? Okay. Perchlorate, okay, so the reaction H2O uh, plus UV light goes to H2 and O. That's roughly, I had to balance the equation by making it two H2Os going to two H2s and one O2. H2 is light gravitationally escapes into outer space. And so the natural evolution of planets containing water in the presence of solar energy is towards more what you would call oxidation. That means that the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen drops relative to what you started off with water. And that's a general statement. It will be true in Venus. It will be true on extrasolar planets. So now your point is you're, you are generally oxidizing. Now, the question is now you find reducing things. Now, the obvious thing to do is Fe iron two. But iron two in the surface of planets is not actually all that abundant. And the reason for that is all the iron zero is dense and it goes to the core. And then what happens, you have Fe2, which is the sort of the native state of a enstatite, whatever meteorite is accreting to form Earth, minus the elemental iron. Fe2 disproportionates to give FeO of zero, that is, which sinks, and Fe3. So the processes of iron, which is a dominant species in the rock, is also going to be tending towards oxidation due to gravity, basically. Well, it's gravity also gets the H2 out. So what ends up happening is you have chloride, Cl minus, when it encounters O2, no, not quickly, and certainly, I mean, we make perchlorate electric by electrolysis of sodium chloride solutions, but over time, what chlorate Chloride does is acts as a redox buffer. So it will absorb oxygen and become bleach. Well, not very effectively. Bleach also disproportionates to get chloride and chlorate and chlorate eventually. So what perchlorate is, is the end, very stable product of the natural diagenesis of, of an oxidizing planet in the presence of chloride salts. By the way, bromide, there was a long discussion way, way back in the Curiosity Spirit, where there was bromide in these old lake evaporites and that was something which would also be a redox potential because bromide is much more easily oxidized so that's how you get perchlorate it's it's a part of the general planetary evolution towards oxidation now the question is whether you can use it for fuel i'm going to defer to the engineers on that right because your problem is when you make a fireworks right you you put perchloride in and you put a little strontium in because you want a red burst and then you have to get a reduce it reductive now that can be magnesium metal that's used in fireworks i'm assuming that's not what you were using for pro propellant right what was the reductant would be i mean i don't know whether methane perchlorate is a particularly good idea at all actually but but what that would be the question I, so the answer is i have certainly not thought about perchlorate as a fuel but you perhaps have and can tell me okay yeah. All right. Because the question is going to be what the reduction is. Okay. Thank you so much. Just one second, as I set up here, where our next speaker is virtual. He's Teddy Zanetos. I actually want to introduce him in one second. Can you give me his cell number? Take a five minute break. Everyone, stretch your legs. Okay. 
And we're going to take a quick five minute break. Please uh, use the restroom, grab some refreshments, and we'll come right back. Hello? Hey, Teddy, can you hear us? I can, can you hear me? Yes. All right, um, I'm ready to roll. It's, I can't start my video because it says you've stopped it, but uh, I'm fine to share a screen. Let me fix that. Should be able to start it now. Allow panelists to start video. Yep. yep. Allow panelists to share. Yep. Okay. All right. You all set. We're going to introduce you now. All right. All right. And with our next speaker is Teddy. Did <laughs> 
Well, Zanettos. Wow. I can't even get past the second word. Apologies about that, Teddy. Uh, Teddy graduated from MIT with a BS in computer science and engineering in 2012 and a master's in engineering in 2013. He worked at a New York City-based startup as the head of technology for the Drone Racing League, where he managed a team of developers and engineers to build drone race infrastructure, embedded avionics, and online FPV simulator played by tens of thousands of users worldwide. Uh, Zanetos has been with JPL since 2017, working on Tango on racing quadcopters. The Athena rover and is the technical lead for cruise and service operations for the Mars helicopter ingenuity. Take it away. All right. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, apologies for the technical delays there. I um, hope you guys are excited to hear about uh, some fun flying uh, uh, happening on Mars today. And of course, uh, what we're dreaming up for the future. Um, so I was the uh, manager and team lead for Ingenuity. I, uh, Meredith uh, there handed that off uh, to, to newer members of the team. And uh, and currently, uh, I'm the manager for the Sample Recovery Helicopters, the newest generation of uh, rotorcraft from Mars that we're designing here at NASA JPL. So let's get started. First, I want to recognize the team, right? Uh, nothing that we've done on Mars with, uh, with Ingenuity, with our baby, would have been possible without this amazing team. On the bottom right, you can see the original tech demo team and uh, now the extended ops demo team, uh, a smaller group uh, as tends to happen in operations, um, but one that's been doing a marvelous job in the last two and a half years of extended operations. I want to remind everyone that we designed Ingenuity for a short 30 sol mission on the surface, uh, and she's been flying for more than two and a half years now. So uh, it's a testament to the technicians that built Ingenuity, but also to the team that is, is operating her expertly. So, uh, for those of you not familiar, uh, what is Ingenuity, right? It's a tech demo, uh, just like the Sojourner rover was, little tissue box size rover we sent up for the first time. Uh, and Ingenuity's goal is, was to simply prove that we could fly on Mars, check that box, be the right flyer for Mars. Um, why is that important? Why is that hard? Well, uh, the atmosphere is about 1% as dense as Earth's atmosphere. It's like flying a helicopter at 100,000 feet. Um, we're, we wanted to do this to enable that new domain of exploration for Mars, right? We have orbiters, we have rovers, we have landers, uh, but adding that aerial component, uh, we all felt was gonna be a foundational step for the future. Um, the gravity, it's less than Earth's, but it's still a poor trade with the atmosphere. Uh, and it's a coaxial helicopter. So you, you can see there's an upper rotor and a lower rotor, they counter rotate to cancel out your yaw torques. Um, 1.8 kilos, right around four pounds, and the blades spin at 2,500 revolutions per minute, close to about 0.7 Mach on Mars. I remember that number, we'll come back to it later when we talk about the next generation. Uh, we made it to Mars under the belly of the Perseverance rover. You can see us highlighted here. Uh, that was our home for crews uh, and deployment. And eventually we made it to the surface uh, after a successful delivery and deployment from the Perseverance team. Um, again, the, the core uh, function of the Ingenuity team was to get flight number one, right? You can see here on the right-hand side of this image, there's an altimeter plot. That's really what the technical metric for us to know that, yes, we took off from the surface and came back down. Um, but we also had some wonderful video footage uh, from our MassCam Z team on Perseverance. Uh, this was our first flight. It was a simple, humble, three-meter flight, takeoff, hover. Uh, we added a yaw rotation in there to really, you know, uh, uh, amp up the stakes. Uh, so you just saw that yaw rotation um, hold and then come back down and land. Very simple compared to what we've accomplished in the last uh, couple of years here, but it was monumental for the team, for JPL, and, and for humanity to say, yep, it's possible. Since then, what have we been up to, right? Uh, this is an orbital view of uh, Jezero, uh, three forks area uh, around here where my mouse is moving or where the red circle is. Um, and the original mission, the 30 sol mission, were these blue boxes you can see here, flights one through three, and then you can see flights four through five. Uh, thankfully, once uh, we, we demonstrated the success of Ingenuity, the Mars 2020 team um, agreed that, yes, we should keep this experiment going, and maybe there may be some value, additional value outside of the tech demo that we can get out of it. And that's where we started spreading our wings, right? So the white path represents the rover perseverance path, and the green path represents Ingenuity's flight path. 
Uh, so as an animation, it'll go pretty quick uh, just because there's so many flights to, to annotate here, but it'll give you a sense of how we evolved. So you can see flights six through 12, we flew down to the south of the Sita Thumb, um, did a bunch of wonderful exploration, did our, our first long range flight of 625 meters, um, and then came back up with the original landing site. Then we took a shortcut, uh, flight 25 to the northwest across Sita. Uh, the rover had to drive around due to terrain, but we did one of our first you know, high impact long range flights. And in the last year, we've been working our way up the River Delta. Uh, so we've been flying along with the rover, uh, making sure we maintain good communications um, and, and learning as much as we can about the real limits of this little aircraft's capabilities, both in terms of navigation, uh, aerial thrust, you name it. Um, where are we today? Uh, so this green dot is outdated as of this morning. I'm happy to report we just uh, succeeded with Flight 61. Uh, downlink happened earlier today. Um, that green dot was our flight 60 landing location, and the plan is to move to the west. That's the rover's moving to the west, and so shall we. Um, there will be a lot of exciting things along the way, a lot of interesting areas for the science team, but also for the helicopter team, right? Um, the seasons are getting harder. Uh, once again, we're moving into our second Martian winter, uh, but we've enabled a lot of uh, critical capability on the helicopter to help us out uh, this time around. Uh, if there's questions later on, uh, I know we started a little late, so I'll try and move move fast here, but I'm happy to talk about uh, some of those capabilities if people are interested afterwards. So oh, here's our, our summary report card. Again, this is outdated, this box as of this morning. I, I had enough time just to change it to 61, but our flight time uh, and distance flown is, is now out of date. Um, in summary, right, we've gone uh, about eight miles on the surface of Mars. Right, uh, almost 100, uh, uh, over 100 minutes flight time. Um, we've peaked now at uh, eight meters per second, just around 17.9 uh, miles per hour, which is massive for us. And most recently on flight 59, we broke our altimeter record and we hit 20 meters AGL. Um, a lot of great things to celebrate, and of course, a lot of great things that are going to feed forward. And that's really the point of the next uh, part of this presentation is what comes next. Uh, again, here's just some animations of the scouting capabilities that aircraft enable. Uh, you create three-dimensional meshes. We did this on flight 13 with FIFU. Uh, this is a comparison of the resolution you can get from orbital imagery. This is uh, projecting our color 13 megapixel uh, camera images onto that same terrain. Uh, and it really, you know, is a generational leap for the scientists moving forward to be able to see these details. And also for the rover planners, right, in terms of scouting out uh, hazards. Uh, for pre-planned routes. And I couldn't uh, forget, of course, the uh, exciting Flight 26, where we uh, performed aerial imagery of the EDL debris, uh, got the back shell and the parachute from 2020 as well. And here's a short clip. Uh, I will try and skip ahead here uh, to save some time. You can see Ingenuity here. This came from Flight 59 just a couple of weeks ago. Again, we got a high resolution mass cam Z video uh, this time of flight 59. Um, the important part here was the altitude. We were trying to do uh, a science experiment where we wanted to characterize the crosswinds across the vertical profile uh, in this area of Mars, right? So at five meters, 10 meters, 15 meters, all the way up to 20 meters, we did these holds uh, so that we could hopefully back out the actuator effort and try and come up with a model of the distribution or the gradient of the wind speeds as a function of height above ground. So what does this mean uh, moving forward? Um, we know now that we have a robust design, right? We've survived, we're coming up on a thousand here, uh, souls, but we've survived hundreds and hundreds of souls on the surface of Mars. Um, we've more than 24 x our, our mission lifetime, right? We survived 180 winter freezing souls on the surface. Uh, we can go long ranges with this scale rotorcraft, and if you scale up, you can go further. Um, we've understood now, we've designed the operations to quickly downlink data, replan new flights, and we've demonstrated a peak of uh, a three salt per flight cadence, which is, uh, is mind-blowing compared to what we started with. Um, and we know that we're resilient. We've done more than five flights offer upgrades. We've enabled uh, hazard detection on landing. Um, we've enabled uh, uh, digital elevation maps integrated into the guidance navigation and control system. So this this kernel, this this 
um, core of the design is very flexible and upgradable uh, even after launch. All right, so now we're gonna talk about uh, the next iteration here, right? What comes next? So for Mars sample return, we're working on what are called the sample recovery helicopters. Um, this, it's called the elephant chart here. Uh, if, you, if you blur your vision, <laughs> it somewhat looks like an, an elephant, but it describes the timeline of the Mars sample return campaign. So the first part's perseverance, which is collecting the cubes. Uh, there's ERO, which is gonna be the orbiter that recovers the orbiting sample and brings them back to earth. And then there's the next launch, which is the sample return lander. Um, on board that lander, we baseline to have two helicopters as backups, the sample recovery helicopters, to help retrieve what you see on the right hand side of the screen here, the MSR sample tubes, and bring them back to the lander. Uh, then we have the Mars launch system, which will launch. Uh, it's about a beach ball size uh, sphere containing the tubes, uh, get the tubes into orbit, and then bring those tubes back to Earth. The primary uh, delivery path scenario one is Perth Range drives up and directly delivers. And what uh, what our SRH team is working on is the backup. Right? So if in the event that there's an, uh, a failure with Perseverance the next uh, handful of years, right, we want to have a secondary path to, to get these tubes back home. And that's where the helicopters come in. We want to go from Ingenuity design, something that can pick up a tube and drive around on the surface. So uh, with with the criticality here, right? We wanna make sure we do no harm to the Mars sample return architecture, right? Uh, we wanna add an arm and mobility uh, and try and recover a single tube uh, per helicopter every four sold. And of course, maximize the heritage from the ingenuity design. Um, that's design, that's the doing, right? The secret sauce of the team here. Uh, and of course, stay within budget and schedule. So what is a sample recovery helicopter? You take ingenuity, you add a wheel on each leg, and you add an arm to, to pick up a tube. Uh, we're gonna be building two of these sample recovery helicopters. And of course, on the lander, we need a base station. So this is an image of the base station on Perseverance. It'll be a very similar architecture of an internally redundant base station, right? And, and the big delta here, risk posture wise, is we're going from a type two mission below class D to up to class B. We need to be reliable. We need to be able to handle uh, fault. Uh, here are just some of the technical differences. You can see Ingenuity versus SRH. Actually, we've updated the rotor diameter. This chart's a little bit out of date. We're closer to 1.4 meters now on the rotor diameter for SRH. So we grew the diameter of the rotor, but we kept the aerodynamic uh, cross, uh, cross section, the profile of the actual uh, rotor blade the same. Uh, we're growing the helicopter, uh, pushing up to 2.3 and higher uh, so that we can carry a 150 gram sample tube. Everything else is, is we're trying to keep as heritage as we can. The idea is we will have a lander uh, about 400 meters away, uh, but up to a maximum of 700 meters uh, in the worst case, away from the sample cache site. And we would, on, a, on SOL 1, we would fly out to the sample cache depot. On SOL 2, we would pick up a tube. SOL 3, we would fly back. And SOL 4, we would deliver the tube. And an arm mounted to the side of the lander would pick up the tube and insert it into the orbiting sample. And here's just, again, just a close up of what that helicopter would look like. Uh, here's some exciting results uh, just from a couple of weeks ago on September 15th. Uh, for those of you who saw the uh, most recent Top Gun movie, Top Gun Maverick, there was an aircraft in the beginning there uh, which pushed up to Mach 10. Uh, this is our humble version of that Dark Star aircraft. Instead of Mach 10, we pushed up to Mach 0.95. I'll play this video here uh, and hopefully the audio comes across. Um, What you can see here on the cross section view or the side view is the angle of attack of the blades changing as we spin. Now these blades are spinning at, at 2,500 up to 3,000 and higher revolutions per minute. Uh, and the purpose of this test was to confirm that in the as-built rotor system for SRH, you know, two of them stacked on top of each other, we would get the anticipated uh, and desired RPMs uh, and thrust uh, and torque. And, and I'm happy to say the team did a wonderful job there. We hit our 0.95 mock design uh, uh, limit there. Um, and that has now given us ample margin here for the design moving forward. Just a shout out to the wonderful test team that accomplished that. Uh, you can see uh, one of our members from AeroVironment, Pauline, she's holding one of the SRH blades here. Uh, you'll notice some slight differences with this SRH blade. It's a square, blunt, 
tip as opposed to ingenuities, which was round. Uh, those are aerodynamic reasons for that. We're, we're, we're really demanding more thrust out of the rotor system. And that last one third of the blade is what's producing most of your lift. So there's some small tweaks there, but the important heritage aspect aerodynamically is that the cross section from ingenuity remains the same. And here's how we're going to be picking up tubes. So this is a, an animation uh, from our surface robotics team. They just made it through their tabletops review. The tabletop reviews were ahead uh, here of our preliminary design review coming up. Um, and it's a roll, roll, roll designed arm. So there are three roll actuators which allow us to get down to the surface, uh, be compliant with uh, unevenness and handle rocks being grasped uh, during tube recovery operations. Um, a lot of very detailed engineering that needed to go into, into consideration here to keep that arm light weight and keep it reliable. And finally, just to round things off, you know, what, what comes beyond after that? Um, at JPL and at Ames Research Center, uh, NASA Ames, We've been looking at more forward-looking designs for uh, larger, more capable rotorcraft. And that's what we see here, the Mars Science Hexacopter. Um, the idea of MSH, uh, as we call it, is to really design a Cadillac of aircraft from Mars. If we wanted to design a science-focused mission, what would that look like? How would we leverage what we've learned from Ingenuity uh, and scale it up? And what could we actually carry, right? And you see it on the bottom of the slide there, the goal is around five kilograms of science payload. Uh, here are some of the engineering uh, uh, see details, right? So we're, we're leveraging a lot from Ingenuity. So we're using the same 1850 lithium batteries. Uh, we're shooting for around 31 kilos. So it's a massive jump up from Ingenuity. But each of the rotors are going to be pretty similar, actually, to what Ingenuity had in terms of diameter. So they're still around 1.2 meters, just like Ingenuity was. Um, solar cell-based uh, architecture, so we, there, we don't need a base station, we don't need a lander to go back to to plug into charge or fully self-sufficient. We have direct orbit communications, um, so no relay needed. Uh, and you can see for EDL, we'd be folded up, right? So how does that, how would that actually get us to the surface? Uh, we've designed a mid-air deployment con ops where we would have a, a simplified version of the sky crane and use a lot of the sky crane uh, technology. But instead of the sky crane bringing us all the way down to the surface, uh, the sky crane would lower our descent velocity and get us into a velocity regime where the MSH rotor system could unfold itself uh, and start spinning up and take off from midair. At that point, uh, MSH would do what she was designed for, which was to land under her own power. There's no reason uh, to bring us down all the way to the surface and then start commissioning. And finally, just an animation video. Uh, this has gone around the internet for a little bit, but just to uh, show you all the idea of MSH. It's to enable access to those areas of Mars that rovers can't get to, landers can't get to, and orbiters can't image, right? Uh, go to the cliffside walls, be able to fly to biologically sensitive areas, be able to sample regions that you can never get to, or fly down uh, lava tubes, for example. Uh, it's really meant to be a generational shift. Um, I think I'll end it there uh, and, and open questions up while I let the video run. Uh, thank you all for your time, and I hope uh, you're all excited about what the uh, future of uh, Martian aerial exploration has in store for us. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. You just received a large round of applause here. Uh, we have time for a couple questions, if you have time. Please, go for it. I have uh, two questions. You, why are you using wheels? And, uh, since you have a, a propeller for uh, mobility, just use that to move the uh, the the helicopter within range so the arm can do its job. And have you considered a, a single mission that does everything in one mission so you don't have to rendezvous missions? Uh, sure. So let me go back to this image here. So uh, first question, why do we have wheels? It has to just do with landing precision, right? Even in the most perfect, uh, no crosswind environment, there's always going to be a little bit of landing error. And the workspace of volume of the arm is limited to a handful of centimeters. So it's really just for fine grain positioning control, right? Uh, you need That's why you need them at the sample cache, right? So to really line up to the fraction of a centimeter to pick up the tube. Um, and then at the landing depot, for safety reasons, right, we we try to avoid flying over the lander itself, right? So that means that we want to, we have a keep out zone. 
So we'll land about to uh, up around five meters away and then just drive up those last five meters to respect the safety boundaries of the lander. Um, you could, we, we have looked at aerial drop options where we fly near the lander and drop it down a funnel or drop it within the arm workspace, but dropping items comes with a lot of noise and uncertainty about how they'd land. So it's, the, it's just the most deterministic way and the most gentle way to be delivering the tubes and picking them up um, while minimizing timeline risk. And then remind me of the second question. I want to compliment you on the amazing performance of Ingenuity. My question is going further in the future follow-ons uh, beyond MSH. Uh, do you see any future on Mars for an adaptation of the uh, Dragonfly uh, propulsion system, the RTGs they're using on Titan, or is that too heavy for the Mars atmosphere to ever be useful, or possibly balloons, perhaps with a propulsion element, or do you just see a, a scaling up of Ingenuity-like helicopters as the future? So I, I think the most likely path is either MSH scaling up with a solar panel or Ingenuity scaling up with a solar panel. Um, you, you can scale up to your heart's content and, and the aerodynamics and physics support that at Mars. What, what I see being a significant technical challenge would be an RTG-based solution, right? The mass, uh, the scar mass of an RTG is so high. Um, and fortunately, the solar insulation is high enough at Mars that you don't need it, right? Um, I, I didn't mention, uh, it was on the slide, but MSH can achieve a 10 kilometer range per flight, right? So we're, we, we, when you scale up to something as big as MSH, you don't need an RTG. You can uh, go tens of kilometers in, you know, three minutes. Um, the RTG would really uh, have its highest value in terms of trade-offs there in the winter times, right? Where you may be energy limited or, or distance limited, but but being able to lift an RTG, it would be a serious, serious technical challenge, if not impossible at Mars. And you don't need it. All right, last question. This is really fascinating. I, I enjoyed watching the uh, the animation there. Um, one of the things that you uh, were showing and, and presumably is part of the concept behind this is that you would go into confined spaces, just like you're showing here. Um, I don't know what you're doing in the systems for proximity warnings and, and bumping into walls and things like that, but uh, one of the, this is uh, an issue with present drones on Earth where we use them underground in mines and things like that, and they use concepts like essentially a, a buckyball that surrounds it to protect the blades. Um, what, yep. What's the thoughts around that kind of issue? Yeah, I don't think we'd ever fly um, an MSH into an area where we're that close confined and that close to a confined volume where having blade guards like that would be required, that would be too risky. Um, it, it would really be useful for large lava tubes where a priori, even from orbit, right, we could try and understand what is the diameter of this lava tube. Okay, from there, you can baby step your way in. There's a bunch of different techniques where uh, you can start to do uh, slam, you can start to localize and generate a map as you toe dip your way into a lava tube, right, and, and build up knowledge and buy down the risk of where are the protrusions, where are the rock cliffs, where are big boulders that we need to avoid. Um, that is the safer path. There is another path, right, uh, similar to what Ingenuity is doing right now, which is you do onboard hazard uh, identification, right? Ingenuity now, in the last year, we we deployed uh, landing um, hazard avoidance. We never had that for the first year and a half. We just assumed we were flying in a parking lot in three forks. Um, now that we're flying up the crater rim, every single time Ingenuity lands, or almost every time, we have this new hazard avoidance feature that redirects and, and countermands what the humans ordered uh, here from the ops room if there's hazards uh, detected. So you would also deploy a, a belt and suspender system like that and and like I said, for the first handful of times you'd baby step your way in, generate those maps live on the fly, and then use that to inform your guidance system as you fly. Like you said, it, it, it's some it's things that drones are doing on, on the surface here on Earth. Um, there, it's a very uh, rich field of research in universities, and there are solved ways to to handle it. Right, the smaller the volume is compared to your blade diameter, the harder the challenge, but there are ways to do it. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you all very much.
Chris to come on. Oh, it's right. Yeah. Excellent. That was pretty cool, huh? Next up, we have Dr. Chris Zachney, uh, who is VP of Exploration Systems and Senior Research Scientist at Honeybee Robotics. His interests include space mining, in situ resource utilization, extraterrestrial drilling and sampling, and planetary geotechnical engineering. In his previous capacity as an engineer in South African underground gold, diamond, and coal mines, Dr. Zachney managed numerous mining projects and production divisions. His hands-on experience becomes became invaluable in developing such technologies for space. There we go. Dr. Chris Zachney. Cool, thank you. Super excited to be here. I love Mars Society. I've been presenting pretty much every single year. Uh, the Case for Mars was the first book I read about Mars. And um, it really kind of pushed me into, uh, you know, PhD in Mars drilling. And that's what I'm doing for life right now. Um, every day I go to work, I'm not working. It's a, it's a hobby. I haven't worked a day in my life. It's a lot of fun. So what I'm gonna talk about today is about my passion. And actually we have Larry right over there. Uh, met him 20 years ago uh, so when I was at UC Berkeley and uh, there's another fantastic person I work with. So whenever you develop these things, don't forget about people you're working with. They're gonna become part of your life and the part of your journey. So um, today, so we had a speaker talking about finding life on Mars. I think everyone knows that in order to find life on Mars, you have to go below the ground. That's where these delicious microbes are hidden. So what I'm gonna talk about today is how we are going to do that? Uh, so far, our performance has been pretty slim. Um, so on a Y axis, what you see is the depth of penetration. On the X axis, you have timeline in decades. So we had Viking, right? It dug with a scoop and a couple of inches below the, below the surface, dug out some sand, deposited into GCMS. Then you had a abrasion tool that was cutting into hard and soft rocks, literally five millimeters, barely scratching the surface. Mars Phoenix was the very first lander in the North Pole. It scooped up some dirt and also cut into ice with a drill bit called RASP. And then we had Curiosity uh, drilling two inches into subsurface, delivering uh, material into GCMS. And now we have Perseverance rover capturing two to three inch long core, uh, cores, rock cores for sample return. So overall, if you, if you think about how deep we went, uh, we haven't even broke a four inch depth record 10 centimeter record into the rocks, scratching, barely scratching the surface. There is another mission, uh, ExoMars mission from Europe. Um, eventually it's gonna fly, it has a two meter drill, but obviously we'll have to wait a couple of years, maybe longer to see this rover mission on the surface of Mars. So uh, what, what shall we be doing? And this is um, my take on uh, deep missions to Mars in the next few decades. And uh, which, what, uh, you know, what these mission, missions can do. So uh, first one is mission sort of like a, a Phoenix lander with a one, two meter class auger drill will get down sufficient enough to get something done. Then you have another mission with a technology that we called, called tubing. Uh, it can get 10 to 100 meters down. Then we have a wireline drilling system that could potentially get a kilometer down. And then you have a melt probe system that can go kilometers down. And over the next you know, 20 minutes or so, I'm gonna uh, dig deeper into each of these technologies and tell you where we are and whether we're ready to go to Mars with any of those technologies. So let's look at the first, uh, first meter. Um, we actually have done a lot. There have been a lot of studies uh, for the sending Phoenix-like follow-on with one to two meter drill systems. Chris McKay has been a champion for Icebreaker for as far as I remember. 
Uh, recently, we had Mars Live Explorer uh, with Amy Williams, um, you know, one to two meter drilling system. This stuff is actually feasible. We know how to land on the surface of Mars and a drilling one, two meters down uh, below radiative layer and oxidation layer should be possible. At the same time, we've done a lot of work developing this kind of technologies um, for on the mobility systems, on the rovers. In fact, we took uh, drills with rovers to Atacama, one of the driest places on earth, um, and dug meter and two meters down to show that some missions like this are possible on the, on the surface of Mars as well. But what we're doing right now in terms of drilling uh, is not anything to do with Mars, but it could help Martian case. Um, we're going to the moon. Okay, we're going to the moon. The paradigm of lunar exploration is different. In fact, there is not a single NASA lander being built. All the NASA landers, all the landers going to the moon are commercial landers. It's a complete change of paradigm. NASA is buying a trip to the moon paying one to $2 million per kilogram. Uh, it's paying for payloads. Uh, it's not developing essentially anything right now. Uh, the last rover built by NASA is going to be a Viper rover uh, that will launch uh, sometime in November of next year. So what I'm telling you all of this, well, we have two drills, okay? Two drills that already have been delivered to two missions. The first mission is called Prime One. Uh, this mission will land in the south pole of the moon where we expect water ice to be present. We have up to a week to deploy the drill, drill down to a meter depth and sniff volatiles coming off from a pile of cuttings with a GCMS, okay? It's very, very cold. Uh, temperatures drop below 100 Kelvin uh, in these South Pole regions. And then another exciting mission, uh, it's a Viper mission, it will go also to the South Pole outside of Nobile Crater. Uh, it will have, again, one meter drill called Trident. Um, it will drive for approximately uh, 100 days. It's gonna sleep probably half of the time. Drill, you know, 10, 20 holes, also down to one meter depth. And it has a lot of very fascinating instruments that will look at the pile of cuttings on the surface to determine what's below the ground. So these technologies, so Moon actually is pretty tough. It's much more difficult in terms of thermal environment, vacuum environment than Mars is. So once we show that we can do this on the surface of, of the moon, it's gonna be much easier on the surface of Mars. The only difference is contamination control and planetary protection, okay? And this means cleaning of drills prior to uh, taking them to, the, uh, to Mars. Pictured on the left-hand side is a, is a clean room, literally uh, across the wall from my, from my office. And this, was, this picture was taken several months ago. As of today, we have delivered drill to intuitive machines uh, for landing in a, in a Shackleton crater. And we also delivered drill to NASA Johnson for landing um, in a Mobile crater uh, next year. All right, so let's look at the deeper range, 10 to 100 meters. A very exciting depth regime. What we would propose here is a lander uh, that's delivered by a, a sky crane. Why? Um, if you if you think about if you look at the Phoenix, uh, Phoenix has all of these tanks and engines underneath. Uh, this is a prime spot for a drilling system. So if you deliver uh, a drilling lander with a sky crane, this lander could have a drill and instruments right in the center of the lander. And that's where you want it. We have demonstrated twice that we can deliver at least a ton to the surface of Mars. And this lander could be somewhere between half a ton to a ton, depending on the depth requirements. Uh, the drill itself is not what you're used to going to Home Depot. Um, it's actually sort of counterintuitive. Um, the drill is a tube. It's a metal tube uh, wound on a drum. and uh, to go deeper, you unwind this metal tube. So you have, you need a lot of power to straighten this tube and drill below the surface. Uh, at the right, at the bottom, um, it's not just the drill bit, but also instruments. Picture the right hand side is one of the things that uh, we've been developing for doing measurements while drilling. 
This is a close-up of, uh, of this secret sauce, what I call. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you can see the tube. It's like your garden hose, except it's not uh, you know, rubber. It's, it's metal, okay? It's steel. And this steel goes between a bunch of these pulleys. We need half a kilowatt of power to turn this metal tube from round to straight. And it's really, really straight. Um, just and on the right hand side, you can see the look at this tube just above the um, the pulley system. The tube is smooth between the pulley system. Right over here, um, the tube has these marks. These are the teeth that bind into the tube because you need so much torque, so much force to actually yank it out of a uh, out of a drum. Right at the bottom, um, we call it bottom hole assembly. This is where you have the drill bits. This is where you have motors. This is where you have heaters. This is where you have sensors. And this is where you have instruments. So you do not necessarily need to bring samples to the surface, to GCMS and so on. You can do analysis of those samples while you're drilling down. And pictured on the right-hand side is a, uh, is a, a microscope. We also have a near infrared spectrometer with fiber optic going down. Um, so it's very, very exciting technology. We build it. So it's not just beautiful graphics. We build the system. Uh, we put it in our freezer. And what you see is the drill coming down uh, and uh, blowing cuttings out of the hole using compressed carbon dioxide. So this technology not only was uh, you know, done in a freezer and actually we drilled very, very fast, uh, very cold, minus, minus 15, minus 20 degrees centigrade. Right in the middle, you can see entire stack of pure ice, uh, which is around 20 MPA uh, in strength. So it's, it's pretty strong ice. So we drilled down uh, you know, two meters, blew the cuttings out and uh, showed that actually this technology works. And then we put it inside a Mars chamber. This is a three and a half meter tall Mars chamber in our facilities. We had this big drum with frozen ice. And again, within an hour, we drilled down to one meter depth and to show that we can even extract liquid, liquid water out of the hole, we melted it. Uh, we pumped it to the bottle on the outside. So this, this system not only draws down, but you can always siphon water to the, to the instruments for analysis. If there are any microbes down there, they're gonna be floating in water, right? And uh, this system can actually do that. So very, very exciting stuff. All right, let's go deeper. Uh, now we're talking about you know, 100 meters to one kilometer depth. Uh, this particular technology we call a wireline system. The drill, a picture on the left hand side, uh, is suspended on a wire. You know, you go to Home Depot and you buy a drill bed and this big drill, right? And uh, you poke a hole in a, uh, in a wall. Well, imagine that the, the drill itself has a smaller diameter than a drill bit. The drill itself is a smaller diameter than a drill bit. And in order to have a Y-line system, this is what we had to do. So the drill bit is slightly oversized and all the motors, all the actuators had to be packaged in a skinny tube, all right, that's suspended on a wire. It's an inchworm system. So we lower this entire robot down to the surface, subsurface, and then we inchworm slowly down while drilling. Once we capture a core sample or cuttings, we pull out this entire system to the surface. We dump the cuttings for analysis to GCMS or other instruments. And then we lower the drill back in the hole and we carry on drilling. So this approach actually gives us a lot of sample and we can, uh, we can capture sample from predetermined depths and sizes. Pictured right in the middle is, um, is this wireline drill. It's I think something like four meter uh, tall. 10 centimeter in diameter. We drill down to 10, 10 meters in a gypsum quarry as a sort of uh, operation readiness check to make sure that everything works. 
Uh, this is how you would deploy it on the surface of Mars. Uh, so you have Curiosity size rover, with is drilled right in the center. And then once you get to a proper location, you lift the drill up, you have a launch tube and you penetrate down. Right on top of the drill, we have an instrument called Watson. This is deep UV uh, Raman uh, spectrometer. This is exactly the same instrument that's flying on a Perseverance rover called uh, Sherlock. So with this instrument, as we're drilling down, we can actually look at the borehole and get the idea of the microbes um, sitting on the inner surface. So now, where do we test? Where do we test the system um, you know, to show that it works? Well, uh, ideal way to test it is actually go to Greenland. And by the way, um, testing in ice uh, is non-trivial. Um, you see global warming and, and everything that's going on. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking for a location where ice is ice. So we looked at the Arctic. While in summertime, you get slash on the surface, so you, it's not like you can go. Uh, you have to be very careful when to go. You, you have to go early in spring or late in autumn to make sure that ice is frozen, otherwise it's gonna be wet. Fortunately, summit right in the center of Greenland is very high up. Okay, it's very high up. So temperatures are most of the years below freezing. There are sometimes years where you had a slush on the surface and we found it because we had ice lenses in, uh, in snow. When we were drilling down, we go, what's this? Ice lens. What happened was obviously there was a slush, okay? Uh, snow turned into, into liquid, refroze, and this kind of stuff you get every so often as you're drilling down. So we flew on a C-130 with all other cargo, a couple of tons of the stuff. Um, uh, the, the, it, actually, this is, a, this is one of the best uh, field deployments. Food is unbelievable, okay? This is, I call it the best vacation ever. Um, it's beautiful all, all around, um, great weather, uh, relatively warm. Um, it, you know, I, I took uh, everything off, so I have T-shirts and shorts. You can get cold uh, if, the, if the sun sets. Um, but this is where we ate. This is where we had internet. And there were a couple of other uh, buildings where we actually uh, did all the assembly of drills and things like that. It took us actually quite a few days uh, to load everything on these skidoos, um, drove it a couple of miles out of the summit station. You can see uh, into the horizon. This is where this big house was. So um, every time we, we actually uh, uh, went to our, to our campsite, we had to make sure that um, the snowmobiles are ready to go because there was a polar bear that made its way uh, right in the center of Greenland, all right? It was three years ago. So we were watching out, looking out for any dots that was going in our direction. We always had to be ready to hop on a snowmobile and, and drive. The next thing we had to do is to dig a deep hole uh, for our drill for two reasons. Uh, first one, the tent was not tall enough. Second one is we had to keep the drill cold. Uh, inside the tent, right, you have this, uh, I I the temperature rises, right? Tent uh, is, a, is a good good thing, you know, to, to capture heat. So we don't want that. We, we obviously had to open windows and things like this, but that was not sufficient. So we had to dig a deep hole to make sure that you have ice all around the drill and your drilling is done in a very cold temperature temperatures. So we put the uh, tent on top and we were ready to drill. On the left-hand side, you can see me, you know, with isoprop alcohol uh, cleaning the drill. At the end of the day, we don't wanna find the stuff that we sneeze on. Um, it has to be super clean. On the right-hand side, you can see one of the operators punching some numbers and then the drill goes down the certain, certain depth, captures the sample, and then uh, you know, 10, 20 minutes later, comes up to the surface, we get the core, and uh, we store the core in a, in a trench. So it's actually st still stays cold. Um, four days later, we were done. We reached, uh, we drove from 70 to 111 meter depth. Um, the core from this flag in the front all the way to the tent, this is the ice core that actually we managed to capture for analysis and uh, we melted part of the core. Uh, this core was uh, a, 
from like 18, uh, 1800s. Um, so just after the time when Columbus arrived, um, the water tasted really good, by the way. Um, it wasn't stale, um, even it was like 200 years old. Um, but a great adventure. Uh, and we didn't end on this. Um, our next step was determine if this instrument, um, DBOV Raman uh, fluorescence uh, spectrometer is actually working. It's sitting on top of a drill. It's yay long, yay diameter, and shooting laser on the side. Um, and then the idea is that um, if you have any you know, microbes and so on, they'll fluorescence, and this is what you're gonna capture on a spectrometer. So pictured on the bottom right-hand side is one of the signatures um, of, the, of the, you know, microbes that, that we've seen below the, below the surface. And we did, uh, so a couple, couple of colonies. Uh, Malaska et al. and the Robarsha et al. published a couple of papers on this. So that's very, very exciting because you can go down, you can look at the borehole, you don't even need instruments on the surface and you can find some life below the surface. All right, to end, uh, let's talk about my favorite, uh, melt probes and electromechanical drills. This technology actually is being developed for Europa for penetrating 10, 20 kilometers uh, through ice deep down to the ocean, but it could also be used uh, of Mars to get down into the subterranean lakes. Uh, it's around five meter long, uh, 50, 60 centimeters in diameter. It has a nuclear reactor right in the center, all right, because it has to be a stand-alone robotic system. As it drills down, it also melts, all right? So you have this bubble of water around the probe. And this water, as the probe penetrates down, the water above the probe freezes, um, trapping the drill in this bubble, all right? Uh, we have a tether uh, which connects to the lander on the surface. That's how we do a comb. This tether is housed inside the probe because tether refreezes behind you in ice. So this entire length of the tether uh, is inside the probe. All right. So now it's not just pure, you know, pretty graphics. So quickly uh, see if it's going to work. All right. We've done a bunch of tests in the vacuum chamber to show uh, that this thing is gonna work. We compared pure melting to pure mechanical drilling to pure slashing, which is melting and mechanical drilling at the same time, which is on the right-hand side. What we found is this mechanical drilling in cryogenic ice combined with heat, with melting, gives you highest efficiency, highest penetration rate, and doesn't require as much power as pure melting. So this thing worked. Uh, then we, we wanted to find out what's going to happen if we actually start drilling under vacuum conditions. What's happening is when the drill was penetrating down, some of the ice didn't melt. It's sublimed, okay? It went straight from ice to vapor. And this sublimation blew the cuttings out of the hole. You know, on Earth, we have gas to do that. Uh, on Mars, just by heating ice, you're creating your own gas, right? So you're blowing cuttings out of the hole as, uh, as you're drilling down. Eventually, obviously, the, the friction and, and the constraint is going to be so much that these uh, cuttings won't be able to come out and you're going to start melting. This is when entire probe is going to slowly get embedded in the ice. And you transition from surface drilling to subsurface drilling. Over the past two years, we developed a couple of uh, these probes, two for five of them, uh, starting with a, something really small, one inch diameter, one a foot long, all the way to salmon, which is three inch diameter, almost a meter long, dolphin, slightly bigger. Now we are building Norwal, and we also just finished slush. Uh, a lot of these probes uh, have been tested. Um, so this is, salmon um, that's being tested in a, in a freezer. And uh, let me see if I can play video. Oh, yeah, it's working. So on the right-hand side, you see this big block of ice in a freezer. 
and the, our salmon milk probe penetrating down a couple of meters. Uh, so we don't need a lot of power, probably around half a kilowatt, and we go approximately two meters an hour at this, at this power level. We can always increase power level to go deeper, um, but we don't, I don't think we have that, that much power. So then uh, we decided to go to Devon Island. Devon Island has um, ice cap with subglacial lakes. So it's a very similar analog conditions to the South Pole of Mars, where we found subglacial lakes around a kilometer below the surface. And this is our uh, test. We actually deployed this uh, melt probe um, right in the center of this ice cap. We again penetrated two meter, two meter down um, at the around half a kilowatt. Uh, the one of the saddest thing about this kind of technology is that once you penetrate down, you're not gonna get the drill out. Okay, so it's a it's a one way trip. Uh, so your tests are kind of expensive um, because at, at the end of the day, it's a mud probe, right? Things refreeze on top. Uh, we're looking at technology that uh, will be able to retract it. So you have a heater on top and you can pull yourself up, but we're not there yet. Uh, our next step is to uh, test a slush. Uh, this is upcoming tests. And uh, this is going to happen towards the end of the year to show that we can do mechanical drilling and melting prior to taking to the, to the Arctic. So where are we now in terms of technology? Well, one, two meters, you know, a couple of meters, we're good to go, okay? If there is money, we don't have to do any further technology development. Uh, the cold tubing drilling, uh, the mission is called Impact. We need to do some work. We have to develop additional couple of prototypes uh, drill deeper than a couple of meters to show that we can do that. Watson drill, uh, this Y-line system, we're almost there, okay? Uh, it's no longer technology, it's more of engineering. And the melt probe uh, with mechanical system, we still need some work and uh, we're doing it in the next, um, you know, next couple of years. If you don't have enough, we publish books on the subject. So um, <laughs> available on Amazon. Um, this, this work was pretty much done uh, under funding by NASA, all the different programs. And uh, if it wasn't for NASA, I wouldn't be here. Uh, Honeybee also put in a lot of IRAD money to make sure that um, we, we go to Arctic. And a beautiful picture from a center of Greenland. Um, I hope I have a few minutes to answer a couple of yeah, questions. All right, Larry. <laughs> Uh, so what went wrong with the inside? Um, it's, it's a good question. So if, if, you, if, if you look how the mall works, mall uh, is, um, for, for some of you who don't know, um, was a probe approximately year long. So a foot, maybe foot and a half long, um, inch and a half in diameter. It had the internal hammer. So it was internal hammering system. It, uh, it had a spring with a hammer that would impact the cone, the tip of a, of a mole. Um, and it had a couple of springs that would prevent rebound, but uh, it was very difficult to have uh, something that uh, accommodates the uh, momentum going down and momentum going up. So if you hit something forward, you also needed outside soil to prevent you from rebounding, Cons conservation of momentum, right? Conservation of momentum. Normally the way these things work uh, is goes down, the soil around you collapses, squeezes the probe on both sides. So when you hit down, there is a friction with the soil on the outside that prevents the probe from coming up. What happened on Mars is that the soil was cohesive. So the sand wasn't like dry sand on a beach. The sand was like wet sand on a beach, right? You can make sand castles out of this. So the moment you penetrated down, this wet, wet sand, cohesive sand, wouldn't collapse. So there was a gap between the probe itself and the soil. So now every time you 
to get hammer blow down, there was nothing to stop it from coming up, all right? So the mall ended up hitting down, coming up, hitting down, coming up. And that's what really happened. So you see probably some pictures with the scoop trying to push down on it. The scoop was there to prevent this rebound, but obviously you're gonna stop the moment you touch the top of the surface and you cannot go deeper down. So it was cohesive nature of Martian soil that pretty much put the end to this penetration device. Um, yeah. An actual mole, that is the animal, um, travels through the ground by taking the dirt in front of it and putting it behind it. So it doesn't make a tunnel. It just moves through the ground, taking the dirt in front of it and putting it behind it. And I don't know how much power it has, but it can't be more than a couple of watts uh, that it manages to do this with. So have we ever thought about creating a robotic device that could travel through the ground using the same technique? Yeah, actually, the, you know, we, we thought about it. There was even a startup in Norway, Badger Explorer, that was, uh, got some significant money to develop a probe like this for penetrating below the bottom of the ocean and get down uh, to the oil reserves, right? Badger Explorer, look it up. Um, the, the problem here was that, uh, firstly, you have to drill to create cuttings. Then you have to move the cuttings to the, to the top, which is non-trivial. And then you had to recompact these cuttings to exactly the same density that you started with, right? Because if you take one volume of rock and you do not compact it to exactly the same density, but lower density, you're gonna get stuck, right? Whatever you take in front of you, you have to put behind you, right? And that's one of the biggest problems. The, the animals, the moles, uh, they, they do work, but it's a very uh, fluffy soil. We're not gonna go in something that's super compact, okay? So it's got high porosity, very low density. So they can, in fact, not, we don't necessarily need to move soil behind them. They push soil to the sideways, right? And if you have soil that's already compact, you can't push it anymore. So they only work in uh, uncompacted soils. I think that's all we have time for. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm gonna stick around till around like four o'clock and then have to fly back to LA. So if you have any further questions, happy to answer them. Beautiful handoff. All right, well, we're getting those up. I'll do a quick introduction for our next speaker. Amy Williams is a, an assistant professor of geology at the University of Florida. She has been a member of the NASA Curiosity Rover science team since 2009 and currently works with the sample analysis at Mars uh, instrument team to explore the distribution of organic molecules on Mars surface. She has also joined the NASA Perseverance Rover science team as a participating scientist. Her research focuses on the interaction between microbial life, the geochemical environment, and the rock record on Earth, and how to recognize habitable environments and potentially preserved microbial life on Mars and the outer world of moons. Take it away. All right. Thank you so much. Excellent. Sounds like the mic is working. The good news is if this whole science thing doesn't work out, I'm going to quit and start a band, and I'm going to call it the Two Watt Mole based on Robert's suggestion. I think that's the perfect band name. All right. Stand up comedy over. Um, I know I am what standing between you and lunch. So I'm going to do the quick, quick version. And the really great part about this is that you've heard from Jan and Steve and Chris little snippets about Mars Life Explorer. So I don't have to go into the great, great detail. Um, although I do require that picture of me on like a movie poster. That's basically the greatest thing I will accomplish. So thank you. Okay, so this is a presentation about the Mars Life Explorer mission concept study. This is part of this most recent decadal survey. So um, it's been really lovely to see my name associated with this. I am the, the 
science champion for this mission concept, but not the PI. And I can explain to you what that means in just a moment. Um, of course, there's never just one person who runs all of this. So a huge thanks to our JPL study team and the other key scientists who contributed um, to this mission concept. So let me give you a little bit of context for what uh, Mars Life Explorer or what we ended up calling it uh, Emily um, actually is and what its context is. Um, so we were tasked with coming up with a medium class mission that could fly within effectively the new frontiers box that the rest of the, the missions run in um, without trying to prioritize for a flagship. So the decadal survey was, prior, was directed to prioritize these medium class new frontiers uh, level missions. To be prioritized, we needed to have a proof of existence and feasibility. And so that means that you can, you can demonstrate that it fits in the mass energy cost boxes. So what that entails is having a mission concept study with sufficient fidelity uh, of science objectives, implementation approach and costing to enable it. And then from there, it needed to be um, independently assessed for feasibility, cost and risk using a pro an independent process called um, TRACE, which was run by Aerospace Corp. Um, so all medium class missions, AKA those new frontiers class missions in the decadal survey are existence proofs uh, that the science objectives could be achieved within the cost cap. And as you'll see in a little bit here, the implementation approach is not gonna be prescribed for Mars Life Explorer. It's gonna come back to uh, mostly the Mars Exploration Program, the MEP running this. Um, so just really quickly, these are the last like full text slides, and we'll get into some pretty pictures of what Emily might look like in operation. Um, so the, the process toy recommendation for Mars Life Explorer is that um, there are separate panels that contribute into the decadal survey. I was a member of the Mars panel. Um, panels recommended to the steering committee the new mission concept studies to supplement those that were already in existence prior to the decadal survey. So um, at that time, the ones that did exist for Mars were Mori, Mosaic, and uh, Mars iteration of the geochronology lander. So given the limited time and resources, uh, a subset of panel recommended, recommended uh, mission concept studies could be performed. And so the Mars committee agreed that a mission with this type of concept, so a, a life explorer mission, would be uh, the one that we wanted to run from our panel. So of the medium class missions with existing mission concept studies, the Mars panel made recommendations, but the steering committee is the one that, that prioritized these missions. Um, so the, the two that went forward to be traced, so that independent concept study, um, was the geochronology lander for Mars and Mars Life Explorer. So all traced New Frontiers missions across the solar system were ranked and prioritized by the Decadal Survey Steering Committee and Mars Life Explorer ranked the, the highest at Mars. And so that's where the recommendation from the Decadal Survey comes forward that the next medium class mission um, at Mars should proceed strategically as an element of the Mars Exploration Program and specifically calls out performing this after peak funding from Mars sample return. Okay, so those are all setting all of the conditions for um, Mars Life Explorer. And I can just set it up and say again that while I'm not the PI, I've been the, cha the science champion. It's sort of like drawing the short stick, but it's like the greatest possible short stick of being, being able to say that you have guided a mission concept study through the decadal. Okay, so this is Emily, our Mars Life Explorer mission concept. One of our goals, the primary goal, and the reason I'm here to speak with you all today is that we're searching for signatures of extant life in the near surface Martian ice. So Emily would be a lander with a two meter drill like you heard from, from Chris just now, um, designed to access ice beneath the surface of the Martian mid-latitudes. So Mars Life Explorer has four objectives. One is to search for modern biosignatures and that is an instrument agnostic approach. So Jan, Alf can hang out with us. Um, the second is to characterize the habitability of ice and ice cemented regolith. And you've seen those awesome videos of what these drills can do drilling down into ice. So they're capable and they're ready. We would also want to characterize that down borehole thermophysical property of the ice and ice cemented regolith. Again, some of the stuff that you've seen um, demonstrated by, by Chris's um, drills. And then finally, being able to quantify the near surface water vapor flux associated with the ice and to monitor meteorology 
over the course of one full Martian year. And so a, a couple of things just demonstrating the, the mid latitude ice that we're discussing here, and you've seen some of these images now from, from other presenters, um, we do have this beautiful mid-latitude ice slab um, exposed and documented um, with our orbiters where we're taking these really high resolution images. You can see that in the escarpment. Um, you can see in the far right image impacts that have excavated mid-latitude ice. So we have all these beautiful high resolution pictures. We take pictures uh, you know, on a routine basis. And so you can see where you've had impactors that have exposed that ice. And then um, in the top left here is, is our concept of our Mars lander. So this is um, looking at uh, Phoenix, but then taking like the scoop and kind of dropping it as though we're running a drill. You'll see a couple of these different iterations of what it would look like to, to have Emily on the ground. Um, so one of the important things that we have been pushing is that Emily is more than a life detection mission as well. So some of the things that we wanted to highlight uh, with this mission are the decadal questions that could be addressed. Because if you wanna be prioritized in the decadal survey, you need to address the questions that they have identified as being most important, primary and profound. So that of course um, is the search for life elsewhere. And these numbers represent the, the question numbers as they're set out in the decadal. So it's not importance, um, it's just the, the order that they've been set up in. So the search for life elsewhere, dynamic habitability, and then learning more about atmospheres and climatic evolution on solid bodies. And I've got the full text from the decadal there for your reference. So the objectives for the Mars Life Explorer mission tie into them in this way. So our four objectives, I told you that we had, and I can give you a little bit more detail on these now. So we wanna search for organic molecules, nitrogen gases and isotopes associated with that ice and ice cemented regolith that we drill down into and evaluate their possible biological origin. We also are assessing the habitability of that environment, the near subsurface environment with respect to the elements that we understand to be required for life as we know it, uh, microbial energy sources, and potentially even compounds that could be toxic. We're also quantifying the down borehole thermophysical properties of the ice and ice cemented regolith for the very first time. Um, and any role for liquid water in its creation or modification. And then finally, um, we are looking to determine the processes that preserve, modify, and destroy those ice deposits in the modern climate. So that would be monitoring uh, climate and meteorology over the course of that full Martian year in one location, which we haven't, we don't have that high of a resolution data set at this time. Okay, so Emily is a life detection mission. Uh, first and foremost, right? And so a couple of points here. So the, the Mars sample return mission, which I've argued in many venues is incredibly important, can be profound and paradigm shifting for our understanding, not only of Mars, but of our other rocky uh, worlds. That mission is looking at the possibility of extinct life, whereas Mars Life Explorer would be focused on recent and extant life. One of the things that I want to point out here, I already skipped forward, um, and I can't go back, so you can't see it, but it was an example of one potential type of biosignature you might look for. Fatty acids tend to be what I mess around with the most, um, but there are lots of different ways to look for biosignatures, as you've heard from um, Jan and Steve today. So Emily is going to build on NASA's goal of seeking signs of life. And one of the ways that you can fit this into a new frontier box is by leveraging high heritage um, instruments, landers, and EDL systems. We've also made the argument that you've heard several times today already that now is the time to explore these habitable ice deposits prior to the arrival of humans on Mars, be that by whatever vehicle ends up taking them there. And so one of the points that did come up a lot is what happens if you don't find evidence for extant life? So imagine if you are an alien and you're exploring earth and you land in the Amazon rainforest, that's going to give you a very particular snapshot of earth. Now, why don't you fly over and go land in Antarctica? That's going to give you a very different view of the earth. And what we really have are these very high resolution but very locally limited snapshots of Mars. So the lack of a modern biosignature detection is still a vital data point if that is the way that this would pan out. Results from Mars Life Explorer can guide that continued search for life on Mars and beyond Earth. 
So the way that we do this is by accomplishing novel science with an entire payload that can address organic geochemistry, the habitability, stability, and thermophysical properties of ice and the Martian climate and water cycle in a previously unexplored vertical profile. Now, I will say when we were proposing all of this, getting us set up, um, this was before the Rosalind Franklin rover was delayed in launch, which also carries a two meter drill. So although Rosalind Franklin is not going to be exploring mid-latitude ices the way that we propose for Mars Life Explorer, you will have now these really complementary data sets, hopefully, of what a two meter drill into the subsurface can look like on Mars. And then finally, um, at the time that we were working on all of this, the International Mars Ice Mapper was sort of in limbo, then it was gone, now it's back. So these things are, are in flux. And so what we, what we argued is that we can be confident that water ice is accessible within one meter of an appropriate landing site. And that's what you're seeing here on the image where you have um, the, the red points are showing you impacts that had no evidence for ice. Um, the black are sort of these dusty regions that are unsuitable as landing sites. But then you do have some of these places where you have impacts with ice, like the, the, the white points there. So with our modeling, without having an ice mapper, we can select locations that would be appropriate to land. So Arcadia Planitia is one of those that's been studied extensively, both for landing a mission like this, as well as its utility for in situ resource utilization by humans who would need to harvest ice for as a water resource. Okay, so more details about the science measurement objectives. I will not step through all of these, but my point will be that we did characterize several measurements that we would like to see this mission be able to accomplish. So I didn't call out specifically DNA, RNA, genomes, right? This, this isn't a specific object, sub-objective that we see, but we do have, especially in A2, the ability to detect and characterize organics that aren't amino acids and fatty acids in the et cetera line. So the point of the mission is that it is flexible. It is instrument agnostic, so we can pivot the ability to look for different types of organics, different types of biosignatures. So this top uh, touches on the four objectives I described previously, organics and modern life, habitability, down borehole science, and meteorology and water flux. The point of, of this diagram, in addition to telling you about the measurements that we would make, is that when you do these studies, you have a baseline. Like, what would I like that I could have, right? So it's like a, it's like a, like a Camry. You know, that's going to do what you need. It's going to accomplish some things. You can have like a, a, a threshold, which like I'm trying to think, you guys remember the Geo Metro? I feel like the threshold mission might be the Geo Metro. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to get you there. It'd be nice to have uh, your baseline, but you can accomplish all of your scientific objectives using your threshold. Of course, I would like to fly the Tesla of this, but that money has to come from somewhere. Okay. So uh, this gets back to many of the, the talks that you heard this morning about what instruments do you send? We tried to build this mission concept first. You need to fit in the box to be prioritized by the decadal. The way you do that is by leveraging high heritage instruments. So what you see here, just for example, those first two objectives are different baselines where you can fly like the, the DRAMS system that's going to fly in Dragonfly, right? That's still a mass spec. Uh, system, it's going to have different bells and whistles than what the MoMA system on board um, Rosalind Franklin is going to fly, which has different things from what the SAM instrument on Curiosity utilizes. So you have this opportunity to kind of fit in the instruments you want. What would I really like to fly to Mars? More than is on just our baseline list. But if you want to get prioritized and you want to have the ability to get this, this mission literally off the ground, we have to leverage high heritage payload. And some of the really great things about this particular mission concept is that because we are launching in the 2030s, we have the opportunity to take instruments that are currently in the maturation pipeline and get them ready to fly. So this gives us the time and the opportunity to get those instruments to that state. The other thing is that per the rules of uh, these mission concept studies, we are not allowed to include any international contributions of instruments, which if you look at the missions that have been run in the past many years, they almost always have one or more international contributions. So we do have the ability to address several 
or all of our objectives with a variety of instruments, it would be amazing if ELF could fly, right? So there are opportunities to have these types of instruments that are in maturation, make it onto a mission if we can get it off the ground. Okay, so briefly, I just wanted to share with you our CONOPS. Um, the short, short version of this is that we're meant to last a Martian year. Um, a lot of this is going to end up being doing our metrology and our climate and water flux monitoring, which is the kind of final line that you see down at the bottom here. Um, what we would do with the um, life detection side of things is we have that two meter drill. We have, I think, three degrees of freedom to be able to move around if we land and there's a big rock in front of us we can pivot um, to drill in a more reasonable location. Chris hopefully would be able to advise us on this. Um, so what we would do is we would drill and we actually are subsampling every about 20 centimeters down to our two meter final depth. So this is allowing us to get a high resolution vertical transect down into these, these drill holes in order to address the objectives that we set out for this mission. Um, so this is a, a resolution and a power that we have not had before. Um, I don't believe that Rosalind Franklin's drill is meant to like drill and come back up and analyze and then drill down the same borehole again. Um, but this is what we have envisioned for the Mars Life Explorer. Okay, so just a couple of final things here with our spacecraft heritage and our technical readiness. Again, to fit in the box, you leverage your high heritage instruments. Um, and so in our case, we're leveraging InSight flight systems or InSight and Phoenix flight systems. We have a Viking back shell. So we're leveraging these to, to bring us down in cost, um, energy, and mass. Um, if you want to fly with NASA, you do have to stick to planetary protection. And so this is going to leverage planetary protection 4B, which is based on um, Phoenix and Mars sample return. Our drill and sample transfer system. So this is built on what you just heard about from, from Zach with the Trident system. Um, with Honeybee. And so the launch is planned out for 2039. Um, so quite a ways in the future, a lot of time for instrument maturation. A lot of this is built on the need to um, first not cut into what's going to be, you know, extensive costs for Mars sample return, right? So being really cognizant that we're trying to help balance the portfolio. We're not trying to, you know, Mars all the time. I mean, maybe this group wants to be Mars all the time, but there are other planetary bodies that are really interesting as well. Um, so that's why that 2039 launch is uh, supported in the concept study, although there are additional launch opportunities in 35 and 37. Okay, this is the final slide recapping everything. Told you this would be the short, short version so we can go eat. So the goal for the Mars Life Explorer is to search for signals of extant life. I guess that's the sign I have to finish. Okay. <laughs> so, so Emily is, uh, is looking for modern biosignatures, characterizing habitable environments in the subsurface, and especially those thermophysical properties down in that ice, which we have never seen before. We're also going to be able for the first time to have this high resolution year long meteorology, climate and water flux study which is going to be absolutely important for us to understand not only sort of how the water flux is behaving for our search for life on Mars, but also how it behaves when you want to send humans to Mars. Emily, in the study that we conducted, is consistent with the New Frontiers class of mission with regards to cost, volume, and mass. And the big thing that came out of this is that this would go to the Mars Exploration Program to run. So again, I'm not the PI, unfortunately. Uh, there is no PI. Um, but what this does do is gives us a lot of flexibility to, um, you know, you can have a prescribed mission where you say, we're going to fly this mission and we want instruments competed. Or you can compete the entire mission and say, all right, we tell us what your lander can do. How would you put ALF on there? How would you put all of these other incredible instrument systems that are being matured? on this on this mission so that we can search for extant life on mars with that thank you quick questions and lunch so i do see the young gentleman here can we have this speaker first i think there's a mic behind you hello um uh something that came to me is you were talking about organics and that can be a pretty loose term, but I assume you're talking about um, stuff, carbon chemistry. And so there are other elements that can act like carbon and create energy. And 
that is something not specifically about organics that we talked about in other talks, but um, there is a possibility that life that we find on Mars might not be based around carbon. Yeah, all right. Number one, can you please enroll in my class? Because <laughs> that was more cohesive than most of my responses. Um, well, I mean, like, like maybe like two more years, right? You, you need to finish sixth grade. Is that what I heard? Yes. Okay, okay that's fine. That's fine. Um, can I can I riff on your statement or do you want to follow up with a specific question about it? Um, just how the, uh, if there are instruments now or that could be advanced to detect those elements. Mm -hmm that it's not just narrowing our like because if we we could think oh there's no life on mars and then the only reason we didn't find it is because it relied on a different mm -hmm. uh, it like was based around a different element that wasn't carbon and we weren't looking for that yeah absolutely so a question that i i do get sometimes so i appreciate you asking it um so Number one, part of my approach has been, yeah, let's look for life as we know it, also life as we don't know it. And so that's some of what Steve was talking about earlier today. Um, one of the things that I've been sticking with a bit is if you're going to search for life beyond Earth and you only have one data point, which is Earth, I tend to start with what do we know? I know about carbon-based life and I can build an instrument that can detect it. So that is the starting point that I've been working from on two worlds that their geochemistry, their formation mechanism, planetary evolution and geochemistry are, are similar enough that you might anticipate life on Mars would start with a carbon-based similar biochemistry to life on Earth, given their similar starting points with regards to standard temperature and pressure and conditions that liquid water can be stable on the surface of these worlds. From there, yeah, let's diversify. Let's see what else we can look for. But I, what I've been, what I like to think about is how can you search for life as you know it initially within certain error bars? And then if you want to look for silicon-based life, there's your, there's your next step, right? How do you build an instrument to do that? I don't know that, I don't know how to do it, but there's smart people in this room who I think do. Um, another thing is that we don't really know we do know that life development probably started with a pretty key thing, water, but we don't know if they start, they were entirely similar in developing on Mars if it did or on Earth. So there is always a possibility that there's a difference in how the biology of these creatures would work. Yeah, absolutely. We don't even have full resolution on what the origin of life on Earth is, right? So are there these different possibilities? Yeah, I think keeping an open mind, that's one of the key things we can do. Um, I hope that you are instructing the next generation of people who are building these instruments and going to Mars because this is incredible. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much for your uh, talk and, and congratulations on getting through the decadal. Um, I'm also impressed with your uh, dynamic uh, response to Jan's talk and throwing out a couple of peace offerings out there. Um, I didn't I, have time to update my slides. I already turned them in or else I, I don't know what movie I would pick, but I've been thinking about it the whole time. Um, so maybe I'll just slightly put you on the spot then. Did we all hear that you're making yourself available to Jan to have a conversation about how he could get at least some exploratory funding from perhaps your budget because you're at 1.6 billion and his is 50 like it seems my like you, you could help him so not my mission unfortunately I know the names of the people in charge currently of the Mars exploration program um I I it has been made very clear to me that as the science champion I don't have the same rights and privileges of a proper PI who was funded to develop a mission concept um, the way that these came about, and that was sort of the first couple of slides I was sharing was that uh, the panel as a whole could say, what are the most pressing questions that we can address on Mars? And the search for extant life, of course, comes up very high on that. 
so then we had the ability to request that a mission concept study be conducted that could address that question. That's how Emily was sort of born. So I don't have the money. And the other thing with this is that the budget for Emily is contingent on not just a, a continuation of funding um, our funding level from Congress, but actually an increase. Um, I suspect I'm not going to see that at least in this upcoming <laughs> resolution. Um, again, there's this, this has a long line on it, right? People but, said 20 years. But, but my intuition is that you must have a whole bunch of soft skills and knowledge that you could perhaps share. Oh, Jan and I are on grants together. He, uh, yeah, like right. we're down the street from each other. Yes. So there, there are conversations, right? And I've, and I've gotten to chat with, um, his name's escaping me, but your former student about Alpha and Alpha. And yeah, so it, yes, there are opportunities. I'm all about the search for life beyond Earth. And that's what I want to share, whatever knowledge base I have with that. I can't, unfortunately, put <laughs> Alf on a mission because I'm not in charge of a mission. But yes, there's a lot to talk about with regards to accomplishing our shared goals. I decided to give myself a question. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, as Eric said, I would be happy to uh, collaborate on this mission. Uh, I would like to say that it's quite frustrating to work with NASA because you have those little boxes where you have to fit in. And those boxes are designed very illogically. Uh, for example, until 2039, you have to be, uh, there's a planetary protection. You have to sterilize everything to highest level. At the same time, uh, Bill Nelson promised we will get humans to Mars in before 2040. So I suspect that NASA suspends planetary protection in summer 20. 39 completely um, and I suppose that half of the price for the mission is going to be sterilization protocols for this so yeah a uh, question uh, since I'm supposed to ask questions why the why the panel for 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 this when all the cable sur survey uh, decided that searching for life on Mars is one of the highest priorities if you read names on the panel you are the best astrobiologist in there although you are a professor of geology. The rest is just geologists and engineers. There are no astrobiologists, no field biologists. So why, why do you think that uh, NASA selected a panel which does not contain any biologists? <laughs> so do you mean the panel that, that helped make the proposed Exactly, the, the, the panel. Mm. Right, right. So, uh, yeah, so I'm an astrobiologist, um, microbiologist, and geochemist. Um, the, the people who served on this to help figure out what we could propose, they are not the people who are meant to run this mission, right? We are meant to get this as an opportunity to be run in the future. Yeah, I get it. Uh, but in the panel, which was deciding on the missions uh, or proposing the missions, there were no biologists. So, yeah. Do you want to go to Mars or not? You know, yeah. well, <laughs> this is another question, and I, I, I know, um, I'm sure you're. I don't know, but I'm sure you're not to blame for this. But you're proposing a mission to be done in the year 2039, and this is a, a medium mission. Um, you know, the Spirit and Opportunity mission, which was a medium mission, was approved in 2000 and landed on Mars in 2004. Okay. Uh, four years, not 16. 16 years from now, who knows what the world is going to look? 16 years ago was 2007 and George Bush was president. And who would have imagined the world we're living in right now with the Donald Trump and the uh, uh, Congress and uh, a war in Ukraine and, and all sorts of things. So you're, you're talking about a mission that should be a four-year mission being done in a different time period from today. What, why are we talking about doing medium Mars missions on a time scale twice as long as it took to do Apollo? Well, but it's going to cost much more to do it over that period of time. Cost is people times time. It's, this is going to make this mission vastly more expensive than it would need to be. So if you think about how the budget has been handled with Mars sample return being a significant portion of it in the uh, latter part of this decade, to be able to get a mission prioritized for Mars 
It's basically allowing that pulse of funding to, to decrease as MSR launches and the major influx of costs from that can decrease to permit another Mars mission. So on the decadal, I mean, there are, there are panels representing a variety of planetary bodies and everybody wants to do their thing. Mars gets a lot of press funding and interest and part of the balance that was struck was if you allow the major flux of costs from our sample return to decrease so that we are not at that extraordinary high, then we can fit in a medium class mission with those other flagship missions to the outer worlds being prioritized in the decadal. So that's where larger chunks of money will end up going as you move into what is the decadal 23 to 32. So that was basically the, the sweet spot of what can you offer before humans to Mars, but after peak MSR spending. And that was, that was what was suggested. Again, that's why we included, you have launch windows in 35 and 37. 39 kind of gives you a little more wiggle room for money. If anyone wants to donate money to, <laughs> I mean, again, <laughs> to make MF, you know, to make Emily launch. Last question. Thank you. Could you elaborate briefly on what planetary protection 4B means? And also on the time frame, if by 2040 there are humans on Mars already, mm -hmm. how would, would it make the mission irrelevant or how would it change it in your opinion? Are there certain tasks that would be just humans operating the same instruments as opposed to robotic probe? How would you see the mission changing if we have humans on Mars say, in, by 2035? You know, for the, the latter part of your question, what really strikes me is when I was watching the videos from, from Chris's drilling and you have people out there putting isopropyl alcohol on, on the drill rig, right? Doing the things that only people can do to get something just so to do your science, to do your engineering. Um, I think that that combination of humans and robotics it's helped us get to the point that we are with our technology today. And I think it'll continue off world as well. So how will, would Emily evolve if we ended up sending people? I mean, I think that there's a huge variety of ways that it could evolve and it could contribute significant science if humans are there and were to interact with the mission. Um, you can also send humans over here and Emily over there and be able to answer two questions at once potentially. Um, so I think that we are far enough in the future, as Robert pointed out, that we do have those opportunities for evolution of the mission concept and our what abilities, what, what science we can accomplish with that. With regards to planetary protection for B, uh, we I got to check Coast Bar. I don't remember. I don't remember all the details. So it's about heat sterilization and having bio barriers to prevent that. You know, if you're looking for Martian life, you don't want the spore of bacillus that's sitting on your arm of your um, your rover to grab, you know, to get that into the, the, the processing stream. So it, there's details. I wrote this two years ago. So unfortunately I don't remember every single planetary protection detail of it, but you know, things are very likely to evolve. We send humans to Mars, our microbiomes are robust. So, you know, I mean, right now we, we could land in one of those locations. That would be fine. If there are humans in the mix, I'm not sure how things would evolve with that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thanks. Fantastic speech. Fantastic speech, fantastic work and go Gators. Okay. I had to say that I went to our university. All right, folks, we are going to take a 14 minute break. It looks like until the next speaker, Wolfgang Fink. Um, the good news is our plenaries do not start till 1.30 today, so you guys can go out and get some lunch, and we're recording everything, so you can watch Wolfgang uh, at a later time if you'd like to get lunch, but uh, we will be uh, starting up again in 14 minutes. No, he's here. Yeah. And for the folks on Zoom, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, go on break for about 14 minutes, but we'll see you back here.
suggestion of how to save money from the central bank. Suggestion. Well, man, this is great. Yeah. I'm in the afternoon and I have a PowerPoint on a thumb drive. Yes, sir. Are you, the are, are you in this room? I think so, yes. I believe so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, technical, check, yeah. yeah. Technical, is that here? Let me double check. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Best of you in the phone, Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Sorry. So, it's kind of a blur for me. Yeah, it might, might be better way up, but it is. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, this one, 2023 MSC07. Okay. And I don't know if you've got a naming convention. I would, no, we don't. Uh, all right. But I'm Nicholas Bennett, so maybe it's. It's it's we're just putting it on the desktop, so it's right there. There's, oh, there's okay. I'll, yep. I'll even it's fine. It so there it is. Oh, so we can just flip to it. Yeah. Flip it to Alt Tab. Yeah. All right, exactly. fantastic. All right, thanks a lot. So I don't want that all running over. I mean, I, I'm sorry, we're doing the best we can. We're all volunteers. Yeah, I know, I know. You need to push the rest yeah. back. Your your time has always been one o'clock, though. No, I understand, but he doesn't want to talk to an empty audience. Like we have several hundred people online there watching, so it's not an empty room. It's not an empty audience, even if the room is empty. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to use major point that so the ones on my the the ones in the audience go. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. You know, I'm trying to hold everything together. I know, barely. It's barely. I mean, it's supposed to be there yesterday at six. See what the venue was in. Yeah. We were in this room. You're like, where's the where's the conference at? Holly was here talking about the people that we thought it was going to be one of these back rooms. We couldn't open up because we hadn't arrived yet. We were sitting here twiddling with the drums for about an hour and a half when it suddenly dawned on us that has to be another one sitting here. Yeah. We're waiting for it out. Oh, oh, out. Anyway, it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you need anything from me? Yeah. Yeah. Bio? I love a bio, so I'm going to read that for, for your talk. Uh, email.
on ways to extending the life of the program? Um, you mean if you have a settlement already and you use rover uh, human interaction to do a certain no, service? Robotic, just like we're doing in space now. Oh, okay. So you mean use other rovers to service and maintain? Of course, you, you could think about that. Um, in this case, it's an exploration scenario where you probably are more keen on having many smaller entities being expandable and getting as quickly and as deeply as possible into the area which you want to explore rather than focusing on trying to sort of keep them alive uh to i'm not sure why that hits the question but we we can uh actually yeah i i can appreciate that response particularly given the purpose of your mission at the same time i also think about debris and environmental protections and all that kind of thing so that's the nature of <laughs> yeah, my no, question. that's okay yeah. that's true uh, so that that is the risk you have but uh, as we learned in planetary protection in fact we had a paper spearheaded um, a couple of years ago on why not go to mars right now because before Elon Musk and everybody else puts uh, McDonald's on Mars. Um, so, um, you know, that's why you want to be um, quick about it. But um, yeah, I plan that's always the risk. But, I mean, we have already a lot of debris on Mars. I mean, all the past rovers, so it's not something new. And yes, you will be potentially leaving more. But again, the idea is not to, I mean, the idea is to finally answer the question, is there life or not? And if you have it, then you can go about it in very different ways subsequently. Yeah. But until we get there, I think we need to be very specific uh, and uh, sort of minimal invasive, but get quickly as possible to the answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. We come in to meet this. Uh, you sure? Okay, good. Okay. Next speaker is Kent Nebergall. Kent is the chairman of our steering committee at the Mars Society, and he's an accomplished project manager. And his talks about the Mars Age Technology Roadmap, which has high relevance to the Mars Technology Institute. Sure, is that good? Yeah. Good enough? Yes. OK. Ah. Anybody fast forwarding this video on YouTube is going to have a little bit of confusion seeing a second Germanic bald white guy up here. Um, all right, so let's get started. Let's move it up a little bit. Yeah. On the shirt itself? Okay. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. So it doesn't bump. Okay, good. Yeah, it sounds a lot better. All right. Now let's get started. This is actually mostly about artificial intelligence. So, and some of these slides are gonna be repeats from past years. So um, be patient, we'll get into the new stuff very quickly. Uh, we had a disruption in the first space age between, you know, we were, went from early airplanes to going to the moon and then everything seemed to suddenly stop and then switch to computer stuff. And uh, this is not the first time an aerospace revolution has been disrupted by a computer revolution in the current day. What tends to happen historically is that technology revolutions follow an S-curve. They start out very slowly, then suddenly they build like their exponential, and then they level off, and that becomes the new normal. And then people just kind of take it for granted that a new revolution comes along. It's generally emerging in the background while the, next, while the previous one is going on, and then suddenly it explodes and gets everybody's attention. So this has happened a lot more than four or five times. This has happened since the dawn of history. It's just, it used to happen a lot more slowly. Every technology revolution has three components of energy, invention, and information. And each one as it matures becomes the foundation for the next revolution. But there's also two more elements which are more dynamic. Uh, one is affordability and another one is excitement because whatever gets the attention, whatever gets thousands of tinkerers around the world playing with it, that becomes the next Cambrian explosion of, of knowledge and insight. So there's a concept in information theory uh, about whatever doesn't surprise you becomes invisible. Anything that is just the same information over and over again, eventually becomes completely irrelevant and it becomes completely, uh, you know, doesn't matter how much you need it to survive, it doesn't matter how necessary it is to your life. You don't miss it unless it's gone. So 
what's happened with the excitement on this, with this recent AI explosion in the last 10 months, and it's so recent, I can't even find good papers on it. I just had to run Google Trends on it. Um, we have this gigantic explosion in interest. And uh, I noticed that it's kind of funny that uh, these things, right around the time that people's term papers are probably due for the semester is when we get these huge spikes. So we have, uh, you know, we, we went to the, the thing for our kids' schools and it was like, okay, we have a new rule to put in the rule book. You can't use generative AI to write your essays. So this is just suddenly took, took uh, attention. Now, how does that compare to space? Well, we've had two spikes in space that were kind of up at that level, but they were instantaneous. The first was when we launched the first crew on SpaceX, that's the yellow was the SpaceX interest. NASA is the red one. And they got a big spike around the time we launched, unfolded, and then start, got the first images off the James Webb. So that's not even rising to the level that this is doing on an ongoing basis. And the reason for that is it's it's disrupting people's lives in the real time, the way space is not doing right now. So as I mentioned, we had, you know, between Kitty Hawk and Apollo 11, which also coincided with the first 747, the first Harrier jump jet, the first Concorde, we're all within 12 months of each other. That hit around 1969, 1970, the same year Intel was founded. So in the years since then, you know, integrated circuits became the focus of attention with the personal computer, then the, then the internet and so forth. But what really happened is that these things were not competing, they were cooperating and we didn't even notice because every, yeah, we were stuck at launching 20, 25 pound payloads, but the electronics on board those payloads was going through Moore's law. So the satellites got more and more capable all through the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and so forth. 25 years ago, I gave a talk where I mentioned that the satellite revenue from satellite television was 10 times NASA's budget. Did anybody even notice that that was the gap? You know, everybody's like, oh, NASA's getting you know, $14 million a year. Well, it was $150 billion for satellite, just revenue off satellite television. And that wasn't everything. You know, there's a lot of things beyond that. When you throw in GPS, it's a whole other animal. But notice this little tiny spike right at the end. That is Starlink. So we're going through it again, but this is not going to be subtle. So what happens now? We've got, you know, Falcon has drop launch cost tenfold. Starship will launch it 100,000 fold eventually. So that's going to level off. But at the same time, we've got humanoid robots coming. We've got, uh, you know, large language models, as we said. We've, we've had voice generated agents for about 10 years now. We've started taking those for granted. You just ask your phone to do something that does it. So are these going to converge the same way? And can we help that? happen. So I asked Dolly how to make, you know, this. these are my prompts at the bottom, you know, draw a picture of, of a SpaceX starship on Mars, and it, apparently this is what it thinks it looks like. Um, so when I take my grand challenge map of what's it take to get from now to an independent civilization on Mars, everything in green is where I think AIs can have a really impact, real solid impact. There's hardly anything in the near term. You know, this this starts from the top left and goes to the bottom right, um, you know, vertically to a degree, but also horizontally at the same time. So I actually take comfort in that because AI just ain't ready for the game yet. I mean, you just saw these these AI generated images are still not very good, uh, but it's it's accelerating very quickly. So by the time AI is smart enough that I would trust it with life support or whatever, we'll be in a position where it will actually be of use. So we're gonna get back to first principles again briefly. Um, elements of civilization tend to be four things, matter, energy, information, and, and actors, which can include um, civilizations themselves. We have four dynamics there that I've worked out where it's like energy and work and industrial capacity and time. If we break these down like that, anything that we can build that does iterative artificial intelligent design, you know, machine learning, that optimizes for these, then we can build the best systems to go to Mars. And once we're on Mars, we can build the best systems to go forward to, to do mining, to do whatever. So 
this kind of thing for reduced waste on industrial hardware, we don't have a lot of margins in these systems, but we can build them. And what if we optimize not just for efficiency, but for maintainability, where it's just super easy to work on things? That would be refreshing now, wouldn't it? Could use that right the heck now, wouldn't we? Um, so how big an artificial intelligent computer could you put on Mars as of today? Uh, well, the uh, ones that were just announced by NVIDIA, which are roughly on the same physical scale as the, uh, as the Tesla uh, Dojo, uh, they're one exaflop per rack of 11, 11 units. They're calling this a, a pod. Uh, we could put four of those things easily in a shipping container, and we could also put a shipping container, container scale reactor, uh, low enriched uranium reactor, it would be roughly the same power output that the AI need, would need. So we're talking about what, roughly four exaflops? Uh, that's roughly what it takes to run chat GPT for something the size of a small country. Um, so when the other thing that's of, of note here is that there was this gap in the in microcomputers where you could buy an Apple IIe, but you couldn't do a lot of accounting with it because the software just wasn't written yet because people weren't didn't have an Apple IIe to write the software on. Just this year, where the software for digital twinning of factories and so forth, the drug discovery software, a lot of these other things are just now becoming ecosystems where you can go in and do everything start to finish in one system. You're not cobbling things together. So that's gonna cause a dramatic revolution over the next year or two of application software being written specifically for gigantic systems like this. This one, but this gigantic thing here runs like one GPU. So let's get down to humanity itself. What are we in the artificial intelligence age? To predict the future, you need common principles that do not change over time. And I invented a few laws 15 years ago. I was sitting in a science fiction convention where somebody was saying, well, our science fiction writer is doing a good job predicting the future. And the sci-fi writers on the panel said, it's not our job, our job is to write stories. So I thought, well, okay, well, if that was their job, who's doing a good job and who's doing a bad job? Sort of like a, I was doing the, the, the machine learning thing in my head of how you would do that. And I came up with certain laws about technology itself and how you predict that. And uh, I didn't uh, intend to name them after myself at the time, but I have to name them something. So first one is basic industrial concept is any technology that does not push the performance of efficiency will die quickly. Uh, any technology that gives you greater power or strength, whatever, like, you know, a bulldozer or whatever, anything that magnifies the effect of your mind or body or whatever is going to give you a superpower. Those things last. Things that make you weaker do not. Um, human nature does not change over time. Uh, the technology just changes how you interact with the world around us. So, you know, the the example I would give here is there were complaint letters written to parents by uh, students complaining about getting too much homework that were found in hieroglyphs in ancient Egypt. I mean, we aren't, we are the same people no matter what era. Uh, what will humans do with these superpowers? Well, most will use it for greater productive work. We're going to do greater business and we're going to do, you know, we're going to do our jobs. Some will use it for greater destructive evil. They'll be hackers. They'll be, they'll be engineering bioweapons and so forth but all will use it to reach historically unprecedented levels of personal laziness because we have a lever to move the thing. So we don't need the strength that we used to have to move the thing. So what is a human being? This is, this is a reference to the motor strip here. It's called the homoculus. This, the, this diagram around here is the different parts of the body controlled by this part of the brain and is wired to the sensory thing. The two uh, kind of, weird little sculptures over there that freaked out my kids when they walked in the room. Uh, that's reference to the, the bigger it is, the more neurons are devoted to that. So they have gigantic lips and mouths because we talk. They have gigantic hands because we, we craft things, we you know build. And this is what makes us unique as humans. Um, we have four unique abilities. We have mastery of language and creativity in the mind. And we have the mastery of tools and fire in the world around us. Everything we do of value as humans revolves around these four things. So what happens when our ability to use these tools is automated to where we don't do much physical labor, 
and we don't do much mental labor with language and we don't create art because we can just have it done where you can generate a 500 page novel not only by your own writing or by let's say i want a new ray bradbury novel even though he's been dead for you know a few years you could do that because there's enough of a sample set to do that but what happens to us you know where is our creative things there if we automate away our ability to be the very things that we are you know if i can you know the beauty of this is that yes i can't whoops sorry no one it's not gonna okay there we go um I would love to write novels. I'd love to write science books. I'd love to create artwork. I'd love to all these, these things. Now I can. I could in the next 10 years do the things that would normally take me a thousand years to do or a thousand of me to do with artificial intelligence. That's wonderful. That's amazing. When you've had all this built up potential in your life and you've not been able to execute it. But there's a little problem with that. I did this painting on the top left. I used methods my mom taught me when I was a child. I did that about, I don't know, a dozen years ago. It's a nice little painting of Mars. I don't know how well it shows up on the screen. The one at the bottom right, I did the same thing on Jet GBT in about 10 seconds. They're about the same, but one, one has meaning. The other one might as well be a grocery list. One connects me to my past, my heritage, my, my, my soul. The other one is just data. It's like a guided medication, meditation for a robot. So what happens when we can create all these things, but they don't mean anything because our soul isn't in it the way it would have been if we took the work to do it? So like I said, everybody has the good, the bad, and the lazy that they're going to use. And they're going to use AI as a crutch for the, it's going to slowly insidiously work in you. On, you know, it's hard to do long division when they haven't done it on paper for a while. And you have to look it up on YouTube how to do long division because your kid needs help with their homework. But, you know, when you haven't done it in 30 years, yes, this is a confession. But what about crafting things in your own mind? your artistic skills, your intellectual skills, your ability to research, to think, to put things together. It's a lot more significant than just doing long division on a calculator. So if you remember anything out of this lecture, remember one thing, don't outsource the things that make you personally worth knowing. Because this atrophy is gonna creep up on you the same way it did with voice, the same way it did with other technologies. I was a tech writer years ago. I used to have, uh, I had a friend who was a tech writer 20 years before me. He said, it took 10 of me to do what you do. I was like, what? And he said, well, it was me, another guy. We'd write our things longhand. We had two typists. We had two typesetters. We had a draftsman. You do all that all yourself. So 10 years from now, I go to the office. I'll have like five or six AI agents. I'll run them like a manager of a small office. I'll do the work of 100 people in the Apollo era. But what will it mean? to me, to the company, to the world. We may have this gigantic explosion in artwork and everything, but it'll get boring because it doesn't mean anything. We're going to want adventure. We're going to want to go to Mars. We're going to want to do something with our own lives. We're going to have artisanship. It's going to be white noise. As amazing as it is right now, it's just going to be noise. So what would it take to take we we need to internalize this we need these amplifiers the same way that you could take basic things like this and amplify uh you know these are garages but all these companies started in these garages we could throw the Wright brothers bicycle shop in here as well what does it take to build that well it takes ubiquitous necessities you can't be chasing after your water and food if you need to spend your time in the lab we need a full deck knowledge base which is the idea that if you have dice, you can play a few games. And if you have Scrabble, you can play Scrabble. But if you have a deck of cards, you can do a thousand things. And there are things like that in, in creativity that tend to be at the heart of every technology explosion. There's, you know, the, the books that were only this thick that taught you how to program an Apple IIe. Once you master that, where do you go from there? Well, do you write the software that makes the Apple IIe worth knowing? You know, three chords and the truth of the old joke about, you know, starting a band is like, okay, I know the basics of guitar. 
or anything like that, it, there's an explosion of creativity around that when it's small enough that you can learn it in about two weeks. If it gets bigger than that, like, you know, Amazon Web Services, there's no end. There's like 400 apps out there. Nobody gets to the end of the book and goes, okay, now what do I write? They're still reading somebody else's. They're still living in somebody else's world. So we have that finite thing. We put it in a room. We have a small team of people that are all within earshot of each other. And then we can build technology revolutions. We'll use them AI this time, but we'll build Mars next time. So what's the solar system look like in, in a while, another 200 years? Well, there'll be a zone where humans are part of the economy. Beyond that, there'll be a zone where humans are, they have outposts, they can visit, they can do things through telepresence. Beyond that, there'll be artificial intelligence systems. And there'll be a risk of, you know, the, the thing that you'll be hearing people complain about is, oh, the AI that was on Pluto was said that there was mineral resource there, but it lied so it could get more resources and so forth, because that was, it was optimized to do that. And then there'll be people who use the AIs that are definitely going to lie, whether the AI is programmed to or not. But those are the problems of the future. I've already detailed all the present problems of the present. So that's what we got. Uh, if you wanted to see this presentation or any of my presentations the last 15 years, there's the QR code. Uh, that'll take you straight to my website. And um, any questions? Mm -hmm. um, this is a higher level than we have today, based on a science that we have forgotten or could recover. For example, we don't know why we would build pyramids or how we would like um, I think we'll get the pyramids eventually. I think there's, they, things get, there's a kernel of truth to that. Like, you know, the, the Antikythera mechanism. Somebody, the Antikythera mechanism found off Greece. That, that was way ahead of its time. There is, that's a whole nother talk. There's, uh, there are convergences where if you have the tools and a genius and you capture it, the Antikythera mechanism is only captured in the Antikythera mechanism. There is no writings about it. Leonardo da Vinci was unique in that he happened to live at exactly the right time when he could afford paper. So he wrote volumes. If he'd lived 200 miles away from that location or 200 years earlier, none of it would have, he would have been a good artist and that would have been it. We would have completely lost out on his inventions. Um, yeah, but I don't think they're going to be anything too miraculous. They're just going to be, oh, somebody was a real genius at some point. I don't think it's, I don't think it gets too far beyond that. That's the trap people fell into in 1900 in the Victorian era, and then they discovered uh, quantum physics and the rest is history. Yes, anyway, sorry. I, th I think she just asked the question. Um, it seems like as things become easier and easier and easier to do through AI, are humans going to be valuing the improvements less and less and less to the point to where there's no longer creativity or desire to move forward? One of the lines in my original talk that I kind of, I kind of use these as, as guidelines. I don't really read them word for word, but my concern is it will become a personal great filter where you will get to the point where you can do everything and nothing means anything. Because like I said, that that picture to me is no more special than a grocery list. You can do stuff that's amazing to other people. Um, I've got a lot of AI generated stuff in my talk tomorrow. Some of it's really cool, but it doesn't it doesn't resonate the way something you're going to see something like uh, like LP records where it's like we go back to a retro thing because it seems to have substance. You're going to see a lot more artisanship in the future, I think, just because people are going to be craving that substance more than they will the work product. Um, when you were showing us the um, the table with the human habitat and then the human outposts and that, um, something that came to mind is that, I mean, it's constantly expanding. The human habitat is constantly expanding. I mean, this entire conference is talking about going to Mars and we hadn't been to the moon 
before the 1960s. And that's just something to note is that our habitat is constantly expanding as we are moving forward in our technology. And some of that stuff is very meaningful because it was made by humans and it took a lot of work, but you're talking about how AI could put an end to the meaning of some stuff that we're, that we do because we didn't work on it. The AI did. And that could, that could arise, that could create problems with like motivation to do more stuff like that. Cause it didn't, it, it doesn't have any work, any work. Like they said, we don't go to the moon because it is easy, but because it's hard. If there's no challenge, then why do it at all? We stopped going to the moon because it started looking easy. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that with what you're saying, it once AI becomes able to do stuff that is more than just images that are not entirely accurate, it can actually do things that are useful that a human being can do stuff will gonna, okay I'll, I'll i'll try to get i'm not i'm trying to figure out where you're going with this what we do personally is going to mean something the tools we use are going to become invisible whether that's artificial intelligence eventually it's going to be you know i think when we actually have uh you know there's there's the old adage uh um, you know, no plan survives contact with the enemy, which was paraphrased by Mike Tyson as everybody has a strategy until they get punched in the face. Nature will have a tendency to find ways to keep us on our toes. Uh, well, there will be there will be noise in the signal. There will be things of interest in the signal once we get out of our cocoons and into the universe. So we will, I think we will continue to expand in the universe because we will seek that challenge. Um, not everyone will seek the challenge. Some people will sit in their rooms and play games all day, but the ones who do will be the ones who keep the envelope going. Yeah. I just, when you're saying that stuff will start to lose meaning, art will start to lose meaning, there is some stuff that we do because challenge intrigues us. Stuff that right. is difficult to do intrigues humans. We like to explore because it is hard and it, it's something that it's not easy. It's hard to do and it challenges us. We force ourselves to do stuff that challenges us so we can learn from it. Mm -hmm. And um, when you were saying AI will start to create things that don't have meaning, but they come to the point where a human could do stuff like that, like art and music, stuff like that when you have AI that are helping you do stuff to the extent that a human being could do, it could, it could create, make stuff easier because it is, it's just the AI is doing work for you that you would have to do yourself if it wasn't there. And yeah. that could. Well, it's the same with like, if I, if I tried to write a novel longhand, it's going to take a lot longer than yeah. if I type it. So it's going to be an amplification tool. In a sense, I'm going to love the idea that I can write these books in the next 10 years or whatever, once the AI catches up to what I need. I'm, I've specifically got ideas around that. But the fact is that when you ask me this, when I'm 65, 70 years old, if it meant as much as if I had spent my 20s, 30s, and 40s writing these novels, the answer is going to be no. It's going to be, but the fact that I got them done will mean a great deal. Yeah. Because the only thing worse than not doing them with an AI is not doing them at all. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Last one. Last question. Do you see AI eventually becoming sentient? And if so, what issues or possible threats do you see coming after that? The problem with... Uh, with AI becoming sentient is not as much the AI as the people programming it, because I'm seeing a lot of misanthropic uh, personas in in certain companies uh, when somebody has you know no social skills and then they're in charge of the the thing. It's like 
are you really who I want in charge of this? You know, sort of, uh, there's no, there's no compassion in it. I mean, if you ask a AI to generate an image of something hellish, they have a remarkably creative ability to do that. It's like, I don't want you around my kids, you know, that sort of thing. So it's like, there's, that's, that's to me, the, the, the dark side of it is that something that doesn't have a, a soul of resonance of accountability, you know, there's no accountability in AI. Uh, that's my bigger concern is that it's going to either be abused by people who have no sense of that. I mean, the, the, the movie Ex Machina is a good job of that. The, the genius who creates the robot in that movie really is an, he's an NPC, he's an empty suit because he has no concept of, of any beauty beyond himself. And when people who do that project that into the, into the machine, then we're going to have, that's the bigger threat. Thank you. Hold my step. How about now? Better? Good. Hi, I'm Jonathan Huffman. I'm the CEO and founder of Orbital Arc, which you all have never heard of. So what is Orbital Arc and what do we do? Uh, well, we are building a better ion engine. We call it the Riot Drive. Riot Drive stands for Relativistic Ion Thrust Drive, which is a bit aspirational. But the gist of the idea is we want to increase the exhaust velocity of an ion thruster to the point where you want to measure it as a percentage of light speed instead of in meters per second or uh, kilometers per second. So how do we do that? Well, first, we are using field effect ionization to make the ions. So we're creating a membrane that does high throughput field effect ionization at the tips of carbon nanotubes. Um, that is good because it gives us some energy efficiency. Uh, so we expect to pay about two times the first ionization energy of our fuel to make each ion uh, compared to Hall effect thrusters or gridded ion thrusters that typically will co it'll cost about 10 times the first ionization energy. So 80% energy savings on making ions. What do we do with the extra energy? Well, we put it into voltage and we use that voltage to accelerate the ions more quickly, which increases our ISB increases our fuel efficiency, and increases our delta V, which is the problem we are trying to solve. So this is facilitated by a new geometry that eliminates most of the particle bombardment that ion thrusters face. Uh, so the, the basic idea is that in normal ion thrusters, in gridded thrusters, Hall effect thrusters, there are electrons or ions that bombard parts of the engine. Um, this is a, a, a normal feature of the way that they make the ions. So when you do ion bombardment ionization, uh, you end up with you know, free particles that are flying around and hit stuff. Uh, those particles will cause spalling inside of an ion thruster. Uh, they'll knock little bits of metal off of things. They'll eventually wear it out. And if you put too much energy through them, it'll eventually melt. Uh, it, it heats it up quite quickly because you know ions are very high energy particles in the plasma. Um, we think that with a new geometry, we can avoid nearly all of that bombardment by uh, ensuring that the vector of the ions are up the, of the force applied to the ions, points them out into space in a trajectory that doesn't intersect with any parts of the engine. So you just send them into space. They don't have any opportunity to bombard anything. The electrons that are stripped from these ions typically will quantum tunnel into the carbon nanotubes that do the, trip, the stripping. And so the electrons don't have any existence in free space to bombard anything. 
and the net, net of it is much, much lower particle bombardment. Other nice thing about field effect ionization is that it is really, really gentle on your fuel, typically so gentle that you can actually ions instead of uh, creating ions purely out of noble gases like xenon, uh, which enables us to use molecular gases as fuels, including sulfur hexafluoride, which is heavier on a molar mass basis than xenon is and costs about 1% as much. So we expect a about a 99% reduction in fuel cost for very similar or a little bit better performance, um, which is great. So what can we do? Like, what it, how does this all play out in terms of performance? Get ready, here are numbers. So when you increase ISB, you also decrease thrust per watt. And so what you see here is typically a 12 unit CubeSat version of this is gonna be power limited. Uh, so, you know, maximum you're going to get on maybe on a 12 unit CubeSat is probably 600 watts operating at 575 watts. You've got, you know, 25 watts left to run everything else on the, on the CubeSat. Um, 575 watts for propulsion, you get about two millinewtons, which ain't much for that kind of wattage, but you get 29,000 seconds of ISP, which is a lot. In fact, it's enough that you, on a 5% fuel mass fraction, you exceed the delta V of Dawn, which was operating at 38% fuel mass fraction, had about 11 and a half kilometers per second. We'll get, you know, 5% fuel mass fraction, 14,000 kilometers, or 14,000 meters per second. Uh, so 14.6 kilometers per second. So that's really great. That's, you know, enough that you might be able to go to Mars and back on want like 5% of the mass of your ship as fuel. Um, now, if you weren't power limited, if you had a nuclear reactor that could actually put all of the power that this thing could take through it, uh, you'd operate at about 527 kilowatts and you'd increase your accelerating voltage from 10,000 to maybe 50,000 volts. As you increase the accelerating voltage, it increases the potential throughput of the thruster uh, because what you are is basically space charge limited. You, you start hitting a regime where, you know, there's too many ions in space to spit any more ions into space. Um, and so as you increase the voltage, that voltage clears that space of ions more quickly. Uh, so you can put more through it. That would allow us to operate about 1.3 milligrams per second of fuel um, at about 65,000 seconds of ISP or 0.2% of C as our, as our exhaust velocity. And a 5% fuel mass fraction then gives you about 32,000 meters per second. Um, so that's great. The other great thing is this should scale. If you go up to like uh, this, you know, the, the numbers on the screen here are our are, are CubeSat sized prototype, uh, which even that one should be able to run at, you know, 500 kilowatts. Uh, but if you scaled it up and you went to say a meter wide thruster, and you charged it to maybe a million volts, and you had about a 200 megawatt nuclear reactor to power it, you could get like 200 newtons at about 400,000 seconds of ISP, um, which that's enough that 5% will take you to Neptune and back. Like you, can, you can fly basically anywhere in the solar system and return uh, without needing to refuel. Uh, so how real are these numbers? Well, moderately real. The, this is a TRL2 concept, which means that right now what we have is a very compelling spreadsheet. Um, the next step for us is going to be moving on to prototyping. We think we can prototype most of this in a garage lab. Uh, about 90% of the, the thruster can be built you know, in my garage. I know that because I'm doing it. There's, there's one component that's going to need some fairly higher tech stuff uh, to do, and I'm going to have to partner with a university for that. Uh, but in terms of the modeling, we've looked through ionization energy, power demand, ion flux capacity, solved the child Langmuir equations for the system, uh, done basic fluid dynamics work. The physics appears to check out. So that's why we're going to try to build it. All right. This one, we're not going to drain this slide. We're not going to look at it in too great of detail. Uh, but this is what the thruster looks like. You can see it's square. The, the square base plate is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, so it'll fit on one side of one unit of a CubeSat. Um, this part of it, the, the actual propulsion device is only about you know, four or five millimeters thick, but you're going to end up with electronics back of that, so we expect it to take up about half a unit. 
uh, and weigh about 500 grams. Uh, so th the other thing you can see that's not to scale is the idea of a uh, fuel flow through a porous substrate along the length of nanotubes to their tips. And that's how you create the field effect ionization. Uh, you need about 10 volts per nanometer of field to ionize essentially 100% of the passing molecules. Uh, and you get that by having a very, very, very small gap and having a field that, you know, right at the tip, because of the way that um, field enhancement effects work, you end up with about 1,000 volts if you put 33 volts into the bottom. <laughs> All right, onward. So let's assume the thruster works. There's a lot of work to get to that point, but let's assume that it works. What do you do with it? Well, our first thought was try to go to Phobos and pick up some, uh, pick up a sample and come back on one kilo of fuel. And the initial concept here was a, you know, 19 kilo dry mass, uh, 12 unit CubeSat. And, uh, you know, that's your 5% fuel mass fraction. So you'd end up at about 14,600 meters per second of Delta V, which seems like enough. Um, when we actually started looking at suppliers and parts and like, how does it all fit together? Where we, where we landed is actually a little under 16 kilos. And there's probably a few more things that get added as, as the development goes on to increase that. But we expect to actually end up somewhere closer to 17,000 meters per second in Delta V uh, from our one kilo of fuel. Um, you can see suppliers on the sides there. Those are commercial off-the-shelf providers, with the exception of Foxbat. They're a group in Houston that is probably going to have to custom build us some solar panels. The solar panels being the hardest part to get built that'll fit and perform provide the right performance uh, for for the system. And then at the bottom, there are three pieces that we're going to end up building ourselves: a launch and take a uh, landing and takeoff mechanism for Phobos. Uh, sample collection system, and then the ride drive itself. All right, here's how it all fits together. Again, we're not going to go through this in too much detail, uh, but you can basically see all the parts that were on the list on the prior slide. Here's how they fit. Um, you know, a, a square down there is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, and you what you end up with on the right-hand side, the side view, you can see how it kind of all unfurls and opens up and spreads out. Um, so, the, as I said, the hardest part is the solar arrays. They're going to end up being three meters long on either side, uh, which means they got to fold like 15 times into the, the 33 millimeters that, uh, that you have on the sides to, to fit it into. All right. Once you build the thing, how do you launch it? How do you get it to Mars? How do you get it to land? How do you get the sample? How do you come back? So launch is easy. That's, a, that's basically going to be a ride share. Um, SpaceX does these 350K will get us into orbit. Uh, the, once you're in LEO, you're, you're going to get about two millinewtons of thrust uh, at the solar irradiance that you'll have at that level. So that would be about 10.4 meters per second per day. Uh, spend 300 days to get up you know, 3,000 meters per second of your uh, Earth escape velocity. And you want to build out an elliptical orbit. And the reason for the elliptical orbit becomes clear on the next slide, because you're going to use a lunar gravity assist for, to, to capture a, a few hundred meters per second uh, of velocity. So you spiral out to a high apoapsis elliptical orbit, and then you escape on the gravity assist. From there, you are spiraling out instead of home and transfer. So a, an impulsive maneuver is more energy efficient. You'd use less delta V to reach Mars than you would if you're on a continuous thrust trajectory out in spiral. However, you get a benefit from the spiral as well. So it takes you a lot longer to get there. You spend more delta V, about a total of between the escape from Earth and, and the spiral maneuver, you're going to spend about 5.8 kilometers per second, um, not counting the, the boost you get from the moon. But when you get to Mars, your relative velocity compared to Mars will be very relatively small, um, which is beneficial because that means that you can do aero capture. And you can do it at a, a low dynamic load uh, in the upper atmosphere of Mars, where it's not going to rip off your solar panel. <laughs> so the, the, the gist of the plan is you know, get to Mars at, at a fairly low relative velocity, and then you can perform insertion by aero capture. Once you're you know, in Mars orbit, you're aerobraking in that upper atmosphere, 
uh, to lower the apoapsis, lower the long end of the, the ellipse there, down to just outside the orbit of Phobos. Um, and the reason you do that is that then you can circularize at that point, and then you can drop yourself into Phobos L2. Phobos L2 is only about 3.2 kilometers from the Phobos surface, which means you can just hang out there and examine that surface and find the ideal landing spot. And then when you want to go down, you just give yourself a little nudge and you will fall to the surface at probably no more than seven meters per second uh, by the time you impact. So the, the impact velocity is low enough that you don't need a, a retro propulsion kind of a landing system. You can just stick out legs with springs on them and, and, and go. <laughs> um, now, sticking the landing is a, a different matter. The gravity on Phobos is very low, uh, about 0 0.002 meters per second squared. So very low. Uh, escape velocity is only 11 meters per second. Uh, the ways that you might go about this could be a touch and go maneuver, a tag maneuver, very similar to what Osiris Rex just did with Bennu and got a nice sample. That would look something like this. Um, you hit the ground, you bounce off, you pick up the dust that flies out as you hit the ground. Uh, and you may encourage that dust with some kind of a charge or a blast of, of gas. Uh, and then, you know, once you're bounced off, you accelerate back into orbit of, of Phobos and, and then, you know, work your way out to orbit of Mars. Um, the other option is what I like to call the whoopee cushion lander. So the thing you want to avoid doing is bouncing off, uh, which means you need to land. You need to absorb this seven to 11 meters per second of velocity that you are going to have when you land. And then you don't want any kind of rigid parts or elastic rebound or anything that could bounce you back off of that surface. If you actually want to touch down and stay, you have to absorb the impact and then stop. Uh, and the way that we thought about this was like a whoopee cushion. So if you sit down on a whoopee cushion, the whoopee cushion slows the descent of your butt toward a chair as it compresses, and then it doesn't bounce you back up as your butt hits the chair, because the, the thing that's doing the decelerating, the gas in the balloon, has been pushed out. Uh, so you can do this with a whoopee cushion style thing, like little mylar balloons at the bottom of, uh, of, the, uh, of the lander, or you could do it with like springs on the legs of the lander that uh, as they push in, they compress in and then catch. So you absorb the shock, but then the spring doesn't unload. Um, so on the tag maneuver side, you have some pros, which are you don't need a launch system. That's nice. It reduces the complexity. You don't need a true landing system. You need a way to bounce off and get back into space. Um, but the bounce could induce a spin, and you might have trouble with uh, the sample collection options. It's kind of limited in terms of how you could actually go about collecting a sample. On the whoopee cushion side, this is kind of what it looks like. Pop out the things, they deflate, and then you settle down. Um, and then you launch on the way out. So pros here, much easier sample collection, uh, reduces the risk of a spin, uh, reduces the bounce risk. The cons, you need a custom landing system, you need a launch, a launch system to escape. So thinking it through, the deciding factor for us was the idea that the sample collection gets a lot easier if you're actually sitting on the surface compared to otherwise. Uh, so we, we think that probably we want some kind of actual landing system. All right, gathering the sample. Initially, we were thinking of, of a drill. Uh, you know, drill in a hollow tube. As you drill, the material goes up the hollow tube and you capture it. Put it in a you know, transparent uh, sample collection container with a light shining through it. When the light is occluded and the sensor on the other side is, you know, senses less light, it means you got a sample. Um, very simple, straightforward kind of a thing. Thing is, when you drill in that low of gravity, you, could, you have a high risk of torque from the drill flinging you off into space. The, the lander is not sufficiently heavy to actually weigh the drill down. So the nice thing about Phobos, though, is that it has particulates. It has uh, fine particulate matter, which means we could use a tube, an outer tube and a concentric inner tube, blow air down the outer tube, and you'll get some flow of dust back up the inner tube um, as a sample collector. 
And then the third option is just put sticky stuff on the, or statically attracting stuff on the feet. So as you land, you just pick up the dust on the feet. And then when you take back off, you carry it with you. Uh, ultimately, maybe do both of the second two. Uh, it doesn't seem like they're mutually exclusive, so why not? How do you get out? So you wanna get 11 meters per second escape velocity. We thought at first, maybe spring-loaded legs. Pros, this is really, really reliable in terms of start mechanisms, easy, non-destructive testing. It's cheap, cheap, cheap. You can buy the kinds of springs that you need for like seven bucks. Um, the con is that if you land on uneven ground, then one spring pushes harder than the other, and it's gonna flip your rover, or flip your lander over. Um, and you'll, you'll flip into a spin as you go out into space, and that, that could you know, kill us. So the other option is carry along some small rocket boosters. These are like Estes size, tiny uh, solid rocket boosters. And you know, put the thrust toward the center of mass of the, of the system. And you don't then rely on the ground conditions that you've landed on to determine whether or not you can thrust out. Um, cons, it's harder to start. It's harder to test. It's harder to build. It costs a thousand to 10,000 times as much. Um, so it's, it's way more expensive, but despite the added expense, we think that, uh, an uneven landing site's almost a certainty as you land on a body like this. And so we reluctantly take option two. So you could spring out or you could thrust out. <laughs> All right. Now the return trip to, from Mars is super boring. You basically have left Phobos at escape velocity, and now you spiral your way out, spiral, 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 until you get to Mars escape velocity. And then you're out in interplanetary space and you spiral your way back down to Earth and it takes forever. Um, but once you get to Earth, again, because of the spiral, uh, the spiral trajectory and the low relative velocity at, at arrival, you can do an aero capture in the upper atmosphere and you can slow yourself down enough to get into Earth orbit and then arrow break until the apoapsis is down in uh, LEO. And because you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of meters of sec per second of delta V, you actually will have enough fuel left to rendezvous with a, a space station. Uh, so astronauts pull your thing aboard, they collect the sample, they send it down on the next dragon, and you don't have to have a, a reentry capsule, um, which is nice. All told, the timeline we expect to be about five and a half years round trip. Um, so if you think about the timelines for uh, alignment for Mars uh, w uh, launch windows, the next one that would be achievable would probably be late 2026. In order to do that, you'd have to launch the craft in probably late 2025 um, so that you have time to get out to where you can leverage the, uh, the lunar assist for the Earth escape. Um, that would be a very, very aggressive schedule starting from TRL2 to get to like two years from now flight, uh, flying the tech, but you know, possibly feasible. Um, but then every couple of years, there's another opportunity to do something similar and, and at least to depart on this kind of journey. Uh, all right, Delta V budgeting, here are the kinds of the maneuvers that we've planned. And this you should take, into, take with a grain of salt. It's very, very, very rough. Uh, in terms of the, the amount of delta V that you expect to need here. Uh, again, as I said earlier, like the delta V on impulsive maneuvers per Dr. Zubrin's work is, uh, is only 5.48 kilometers per second to reach Phobos. We think with this system, you're going to end up spending about seven or eight kilometers per second each way, but you get 4,700 meters per second of freebies from the aero captures and the gravity assist. Uh, so all told, we expect to use about 12,000 meters per second, 12,700 12, to um, maybe 13,000. And then, um, you know, take advantage of everything that nature gives you in terms of uh, free Delta V. All right. How much does it cost to do it? Uh, we talked to suppliers for some of the parts, um, as many of them as we could. Estimated cost of building the vehicle is probably 3.8 million. Uh, then you've got ground operations uh, for five and a half years, which is probably three million uh, to, to run it with a skeleton crew that checks in every couple of days. <laughs> uh, but in total, we think we could do this mission probably around seven million, six point eight to seven million. 
notably nearly half of that is the the ground operations which wouldn't be much impacted if you had five or six vehicles so when we talk about what things could go wrong we think okay there's big time light delay if you're traveling to mars you know seven minutes plus um there's priority in terms of what equipment you really need so you want to have comms as much as you possibly can uh, and you want to route power away from everything else to amplify signal if you lose it uh, and then power loss being the worst thing so if you if your solar arrays get damaged or they don't point to the sun you've got about with the design that we put together uh, 10 hours operating everything except the throat the propulsion uh, continuously before you're you're uh, in trouble so you can build in emergency handling protocols. You can automate some of the decision-making on board the spacecraft, but ultimately it's a CubeSat. Basically everything is critical. If anything breaks, you're pretty much dead. Uh, so in de-risking this, what we're thinking is, you know, you're not gonna have the mass budget for redundancy, but at this kind of cost, NASA could build five of these for less than one month of, of the Mars sample return budget. So. You, you do redundancy with a multiple, uh, you know, multiple vehicle mission. Now, what other risks? We have, we have not built the thruster yet. That is a big risk. We've only designed it. We need a, to test a prototype in the lab, make sure it works as we think it will. Uh, conditions at the landing site are unknown. If you do the L2 insertion maneuver, you're kind of limited in the, you know, what side of Phobos you can land on. So that's, you may not have the optimal sites to select from. Uh, comms will be blacked out reefs, uh, regularly as Phobos orbits around Mars every what, seven hours or so. Uh, so there are some satellites, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and, and there are some uh, you know, vehicles on the ground that could potentially provide relay, but you, you should expect frequent blackouts uh, in terms of the comms, and you need the capability to reestablish uh, communications. So there's, that's one of the reasons there's a high gain antenna uh, on this uh, mission. The limited data rates and light delay mean you've got to automate your landing uh, with an onboard AI or some kind of system that uh, can you know, manage it and has system logic to handle faults. Uh, and then we haven't done any study on thermal management, so you might end up adding a radiator or something to, to handle thermal dump uh, from the, the big wide solar panels. Uh, and then we don't have the money to build it yet. <laughs> so darn. Uh, but that's a that's a problem for the next round of fundraising for my company. Trajectory and maneuver plans also are super rough. So right now it's like works in Kerbal Space Program level of precision. We need to get to works in STK level level of precision, and that's a that's a process that will require me to learn how to use STK, uh, which is there's a learning curve. I just started trying it a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> All right. So conclusion: Is it possible to do a Phobos sample return on one kilo of fuel. If the thruster works, yeah, probably. <laughs> I'll take questions. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm a little curious about your business plan. We have such a great thruster, why you wouldn't build uh, build and sell bigger and bigger thrusters as opposed to take on such a risky mission as going to Mars. There's mm -hmm. so many things to learn about navigation and other things. It's a difficult project. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the business plan, where we actually see the immediate uh, need is debris removal. It's um, things that need a lot of Delta V and a small package. Interplanetary research is a really good way to use a lot of Delta V in a small package. And so the, the concept of the you know, Phobos sample return, the idea is even if we don't successfully get all the way there, land, get a sample, fly back, like even if something goes wrong along the way, we will have demonstrated the thrusters capabilities long before we even reach Phobos. And that opens the market for like, hey, NASA, you want to do you know, 10 rendezvous with asteroids with one vehicle, we could do that, you know, give us 20% mass fraction instead of five. <laughs> like, it starts to be very uh, appealing for interplanetary travel. So that, that's like, we want to show that capability early on. Um, plus the, the vehicle is not all that much more expensive if you fit it out to go to, to Phobos than it would be if you fit it out to hang out in low Earth orbit and do like micro maneuvers in every direction for 10 years. Um, so there's, 
we don't see much to lose is what I would say. <laughs> yeah, it, it could be very attractive for, for station keeping. Um, one of the uh, things we're thinking about is, is defense. If you want to continuously randomly vary the trajectory of a satellite for 30 years at a time, give it three kilowatts of power and, and a few kilos of fuel, and then good luck China with your proximity operations or shooting it down. <laughs> it, it makes a, a much more defensible and responsive satellite. Yeah. I recall 15 years ago, NASA had a project in Phoenix that the soil was stickier than expected, but not that hard to get it in the answer. Okay. Yeah. That's a great idea. <laughs> the I think it, I mean it may that may work. The I think it at the very least it would greatly reduce the risk. Um, you still could have a situation where one of the drills and not the other one catches on some kind of rock that's very well fixed, but it's still. Like if it's more reliable than blowing air at the thing, then that's probably good. Yeah. Um, oh, I was just thinking uh, NASA's GMAT software is also pretty good for the trajectory stuff. And I don't know if it's more uh, accessible than SDK. Um, but I had a question about um, if you'd thought about using the airbags as the bounce off mechanism. I mean, because mm. they hit and they deflate and presumably you can modulate how much they deflate and you can- yeah. You need you need to orient yourself somewhere somehow to drill anyway. Are you, are you using the airbags to orient yourself before you take the sample, and then you could just use them to pop yourself off? Interesting. Um, we hadn't thought about that, and the the main constraint I think for the airbags would be carrying uh, like enough gas to recharge them. Uh, so we'd need two system or two like two fill ups worth of compressed gas that we could just you know spend on it. So it it could work. I think what I the risk I would see would still be if I inflate them all at the same rate and one of them's on a different surface or a different height. Do I have problems there? And if I don't want to inflate them all at the same rate, how do I do the sensors to detect which one needs to inflate how much? So. I mean, it's it's worthy of consideration, though, for sure. I saw that you had uh, Demos listed there as well. Being further from Mars and a lower mass, is it even easier to do? And could you do two satellites in parallel and visit uh, both moons? I mean, if you do multiples at once, there, there's absolutely no harm in differentiating the destinations once you get there. Um, I think I cho we chose Phobos because it was the harder one, honestly. Uh, and we, we figured that you know, it takes more delta V to get there, takes more precision, and there's a little bit more, um, a little more difficulty getting off of, of the, the system. Uh, at the same time, less gravity on Deimos isn't all great, right? Like you still have, uh, it, it increases the likelihood of, of bouncing off as you're trying to land. It increases the, uh, the likelihood of a drill that like flings your lander off into, into space again. So, there are trade-offs, but if you got, you know, two, two to five of these things, and at least two of them have made it there without breaking, why not try both? <laughs> that I mean, that's ultimately the goal of the company, right? Is to eliminate delta V scarcity as a problem and make it a power problem only, instead of a, you know, can we carry even enough fuel to do this? So, um, long run, we hope to get to torch drives. We're not anywhere near that yet, but. Uh, Eventually, the, the thought is you don't have to plan out every meter per second. You can just figure you're going to have enough and go. <laughs> is Eric Robinson here? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Oh, I'm walking off with the Sorry about that. Which is at the bottom of this. The big. Thank you.
Thank you. One second. Okay, I think you're all set. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, James. All right, yeah, my name is Eric Robinson and I'm here from Green Launch. And um, as our name uh, may suggest, we are a very green way of launching things from the planet. If you've ever heard of Jules Verne, you may recall a book he had, The Earth to the Moon. So that was maybe our original ex, um, inspiration. And uh, that in that particular book, got you. Got it. Thank you. And he uses um, gunpowder, which is a good idea, but it's the wrong fluid. It's actually better to use hydrogen, which is what we use, which is the lightest and fastest gas um, propellant known. And um, so this is a picture of what it might look like if you're at Kwajalein shooting things into space. Um, my, my background is a space plumber. I'm actually, the, I have a patented fitting that's used on both Curiosity, Perseverance, rovers it's also on the james webb space telescope in the cryogenic cooler and I'm on the dawn mission in the propulsion system on dawn so which is like in a, some kind of a parking orbit around Ceres right now so if you need fittings let me know i've got that i've got that handled um so anyway back to green launch um green launch started actually from the mars society we got funding from the first person we we met it when uh when it was mars society in dallas so so we actually owe our existence to the mars society so i'd like to thank everyone here and Dr. Zubrin for that. <laughs> um, so let's see if we can go to the next slide. So this is, you know, getting into space is difficult. So once you get to orbit, you're halfway to anywhere. So six gallons in Tempe is 26 bucks. If you go by F9, if you want to go to Leo, um, Falcon 9, it's 102,000. If you take the Delta V, which is uh, the Delta IV, which is the uh, expendable alternative, then it's a little bit more money there. But six gallons on Mars using an Atlas V, I use these numbers from the launch costs for the Perseverance rover divided by its weight <clears throat> is about $6 million for uh, six gallons on Mars. So <clears throat> obviously getting, getting to Mars is expensive and getting fuel to Mars is expensive and uh, you know, getting just supplies to Mars. So it may be, you know, there may be alternatives and I'm gonna explore those. First about reusable rockets, I mean, obviously got to hand it to Elon. He's amazing what he's done there. This difficult problem of actually having, um, you know, being able to recover a booster and also being able to deliver payload into orbit is amazing. He does pay a 40% payload penalty to have the different uh, recovery uh, instruments on board. And uh, he, he, he's got to do a little less velocity into a main engine cutoff in order to be able to get, get it back. He's got cold thrusters, grid fins, terminal guidance. He has to be able to reignite his engines. The, the engines have to be throttleable, which is uh, also a, a challenge. And then he has to have a landing platform. So it turns out that if he does two, does two recoveries, he's broken even. Anything past there is a big bonus. And he's also recovering the fairings now and they have to have a steerable parachute and recovery ship, but he's supposedly saving 9 million per launch to recover those fairings. So recovery has got some great benefits and, uh, and we're all about um, total recovery of the first and second stage because we're uh, stationary on the ground. So what if you could deliver to Leo you know, every day on demand and have price per kilogram cheaper than anything else out there and you pick your orbit. So that's what our, our challenge will be. Uh, this would be a kind of a schematic of what it might look like for something that's going to be able to have a payload of about uh, 10 pounds, 4.5 kilograms. Um, this is, uh, it's maneuverable. The, the, um, you could change the angle, you could change the direction. So it's very flexible. You could get any orbit you wanted. And, um, and so that's our, our vision. And eventually, I think there will be an economy uh, of efficient transport network between low Earth orbit, uh, the lunar surface, and Mars, and that something uh, has to be very uh, flexible and also a very efficient way that doesn't use a lot of propellant that we could use to actually move between these three location points. And probably you've all heard of mass drivers and uh, this was a schematic of what a mass driver on the moon might look like. You can shoot out almost over the horizon and obviously the escape velocity is pretty low. 
on uh, on the moon is two kilometers per second. So we can do that in our sleep with this particular system. So where are we right now with uh, with development? This is um, our 56 foot long, um, it's 175 millimeter uh, launch tube that we've got. And it's uh, successfully launched 28 horizontal shots. And we've actually had a, a vertical shot also. And uh, our, our technology is gonna, I mean, why don't people use big cannons like this all the time? Well, there is an issue with detonation. You can have these cannons blow up, which is a problem. So we've actually got an uh, intellectual property which will sustain the burn and prevent it from getting to a point where it's critical where you could actually have a detonation. So this is what it looks like um, if you hit a um, five gallon sparklets bottle at, um, at five kilometers uh, and at Mach five. So that's kind of what it looks like when you hit the big bottle of water there. This is our, one of our horizontal tests. Now this one, hopefully we can get to work here, let's see. This is uh, our horizontal shot. So that's um, Uh, Mach 5, that's, um, it went up to 30, about 33 kilometers is the altitude on that one. So we, we have shot vertically. That's the first time anywhere to ever use a light, light gas gun to shoot vertically. So that was kind of a world record. Let's see if I can get this thing to move again. Let's see. Next, right, we did that, did that already. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so now, um, so here's our here's our plan for Mars. Getting back to the Mars Society, um, could you launch from Mars? And one of the advantages of our system is we can actually recapture the propellant as the projectile is accelerated down the barrel, just like you would use with a, um, like a muffler system, or a silencer on a rifle and an uh, iris eye that could close very quickly behind the projectile, we can actually catch over 95% of our propellant and pump it back into the system. So it, it becomes much more efficient than any rocket ever imagined because your propellant isn't expended, it's actually uh, preserved. So here's kind of the, the, the challenge <clears> that we're gonna merge on Mars. We're gonna unite the solar tower. You've probably seen these at Ivanpah, which is outside of Las Vegas in California, these huge solar, uh, accumulators, mirrors. And uh, so Mars does receive uh, 500 watts per meet, square meter, which can be used to create a steam classic power, just like Ivanpah. The stream, steam drives a piston and uh, hydrogen and steam are recaptured and used indefinitely. So um, we can launch at four kilometers a second, uh, which is pretty fast. And that's escape, uh, that's orbital velocity from Mars. And uh, and so we can, uh, we can yeah, move propellant out into the um, into orbit for the uh, starship or whoever needs refueling out there. It's kind of a more um, detailed picture of the different components in this. So you've got the tower, you've got a steam accumulator, you've got a pump tube, you've got a tiny little truck there to show uh, how, how big the system is. And basically it's just a big, long, straight tube. It's really not, uh, not a challenge to make this scalable. Here's an overhead view of it, um, you know, just the size of what we're talking about. This is not, not really challenging from a uh, technological standpoint. Long straight tube with the, uh, a very fast accelerant. And uh, there's another side view. Here, this is the launch um, tower itself. And uh, this support and our final version would be you know, be something you could actually rotate to different uh, azimuth and different elevation. These are heliostats that are similar to the ones that are used at Ivanpah. Just mirrors. Um, this is yeah, the, uh, the, the powered part of the system where the piston is. There's a reaction mass on here. So our, our uh, corporate technical officer, John Hunter, built a system at uh, 
Livermore Laboratories called SHARP, and this did have reaction masses on it. So as it shot, it didn't uh, shake the system. It had a big rail car that would just pushed out as the um, as the piston came in to drive the hydrogen, to compress the hydrogen, and then break the burst disk. So with this reaction mass, it makes the system a lot more stable and a lot less uh, subject to damage just from the uh, operational use itself. So that, I guess, is the, uh, that's the, uh, the piston is going to be used to compress the hydrogen. And here's the projectile with the Sabo in the launch tube. And um, this is ready to go out as soon as that uh, burst disc is broken. And this is, um, you can see the muffler attachment at the end. And uh, in close-up view, you can see this is, this is how we capture our propellant which is key to this whole thing become, becoming super efficient for a, a method of repeated launching um, without, without use of a lot of propellant. And uh, again, the Sabo pedals fly off as this projectile moves forward and uh, goes up into orbit. A little bit more uh, detail on the Sabo, this regular kind of bullet shape projectile. And uh, here's where the payload would be. We do have some propulsion on board to help us rendezvous with a space station or uh, um, in the case of launching from Earth, we do have a, a, a small rocket to help us circularize the orbit at the top. Otherwise, it would come straight up and come straight back down. So we do need to have a small rocket, usually a solid rocket booster on this system. And then this is uh, velocity. So the green launch system only uses 8% of the launch vehicle mass for propellant uh, versus a regular rocket, which is 70% of the, uh, of the mass is propellant. So the big problem with rockets is, you know, what is the payload fraction? Well, you know, in best cases, you're talking maybe 4% payload fraction. But with our system, we're, you know, we're above 20% payload fractions. Just the physics alone, we've got a much more efficient uh, way of getting things into orbit. And like I, like I mentioned, we can use the propellant over again. And then um, here's Phobos, just a place maybe we could we could use it as a fueling station. Uh, obviously goes around three times a day, so you've got opportunities to inter uh, intersect Phobos. Uh, again, here's this current system, something, some things that we've, uh, we've shot vertically, or we've shot horizontally also several times. We haven't recovered any projectiles that we've shot uh, horizontally because when they hit the um, the concrete block wall, they end up um, vaporizing. And this is, um, right now we've got two contracts, one's with the National Science Foundation. So National Science Foundation wants to sample the mesosphere. Well, why would you wanna to go to the mesosphere? Well, it turns out um, that it's you know too high for balloons, too low for satellites, but that's where a lot of chemistry, so global warming chemistry, that's happening there. The whole energy budget for the earth, that's happening there. Things coming back from space burning up, most of that happens there. So the mesosphere is full of a lot of interesting gases, mostly uh, ions of, um, or isotopes of oxygen. So we have 16 down here, but there's also oxygen 17 and 18 up there. And those ratios are super important for, uh, for doing the studies on the origin of life, the energy budget of the earth, global warming. And so it's a very important layer. Well, you can't get anything from there. It's diff it's like five thousand dollars to send a small uh, suborbital um, sampling rocket up there, a sounding rocket. But what? And so it's hard to make a graph with one point. You really need to have a whole bunch of data, and you need to have it evenly spaced to make any kind of a graph to make any kind of uh, um, any kind of prediction as to what's actually happening up there, right? So they actually call the the mesosphere the ignorosphere because people don't know what's happening there. It's just one of these places. So we're the taxi to the ignorosphere. And, uh, and, and we can shoot probably for about $175,000 in operation to go up there with this. This is an evacuated cylinder. It goes to the mesosphere, it opens, it sucks a sample, it closes, and it parachutes back down. So we'll be able to do that like quarterly maybe, or maybe monthly if we've got enough people that are interested in our data. And then we'll be able to actually make graphs and people can then actually predict what's gonna actually happen to that, to that era, which is uh, that area, which is so important. This is a little bit more of a schematic as to uh, how this, this uh, projectile that we're using to sampling works. And 
this was also there's you know a lot of a lot of interest in hypersonics right now uh, military applications so far i think ukraine's taking some incoming hypersonics at the moment from russia so people are interested in that and um so our system can be used to check both reynolds and uh and free flight uh mock numbers and so it's a lot better than wind tunnels if you want to actually do some testing of your hypersonics you can give us a try and this was a whole bunch of programs that thought they could use hypersonic uh launch and so we may be able to help these different weapons programs too this is uh just um showing that as hypersonics come in, they come in closer to the surface or they don't get the big high arc that an icbm gets so you have a very little time to um to see them detect them and, and then get something in front of them the way that they kill hypersonics typically is kinetic kill you put a bunch of tungsten bbs in front of it as it flies through it it deorbits or it knocks itself down so you got to have some way of getting those bbs up there in front of it you need something pretty fast and so we think we may have an opportunity there too and there's always long range cannons people are talking about being able to shoot you know from kiev to moscow well we might be able to help, help them with that problem <laughs> anyway so then um yeah launching on on demand with a high cadence who can you know how fast can you turn this thing around how fast can you launch and so i think we we show we have a, a definite advantage there and then this is just um our, our multiple uh we're looking at a multiple boost capability within the barrel itself so as it's coming out boom 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 to, to extend the propulsion inside the barrel to give us a higher um higher exit velocity and also to prevent the the, the chance of a uh, of a detonation so this kind of shows that boost profile this is over uh 40 40 milliseconds pretty pretty fast time scale more boosts anyway so this just kind of shows the um the eventual goal so we're doing all of our work right now is with the uh, air force research laboratory and with the national science foundation is all suborbital just up and down stuff but eventually we're going to go to orbit and uh, we'll be using a solid rocket booster to circularize the orbit and we will be looking to launch cubesats and nanosats like cubesats in a pea pod you know a row of three of them we'll be able to launch those very economically and uh, with a high cadence and there's a team and uh there's our suborbital plan so yeah we're like a lot of companies we are originally funded by people we met at Mars Society, and I'll be around for four days. If you're interested in fundraising, you're interested in becoming part of Green Launch, give us, give me a, you know, tap my shoulder. We're interested in talking. So uh, we're in, we're in a big growth mode at the moment. And there's so Dr. John Hunter. He's he's he ran the Sharp program at Livermore Labs. He's our leading technical uh, officer. He's in, the, in this field. He's the probably top guy in the world today. That's me. I'm second. Don Whitney is the guy we met at the Mars Society who actually founded us, funded us for the first phase. And uh, this is just some different uh, contact information if you needed it. And these are a whole bunch of articles written about us just in the last year. So we've had a lot of uh, interest from from the periodicals uh, comparing us to other kinds of kinetic launch uh, systems that are out there. All right. Very good. Any uh, any questions? Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, I'm a great fan of the 1936 film, The Shape of Things to Come. Okay. And at the end of the movie, Raymond Massey was based on the H.G. Wells book. I'm getting to an important point. Be patient. And uh, they launch a probe, a man mission to the moon with a gun. Right. Now, what I saw when you were showing me all these things. There's another place to get money and another place to market your product that you may find some good interest. Uh, this would be Amazon videos, okay. uh, Netflix, and Apple TV. In other words, they create a lot of uh, in-house science fiction films. Right. Interest them interest them in a science fiction film based on your technology it's so different and so radical and then it touches back to you know even a century and a half ago so it could be a, a source of money it's sort of totally outside the box but it has some potential to, and i'd ask you to consider it yeah that's a great idea i'll definitely make a note that sounds like a great way to go yeah go ahead Considered, uh, yeah, putting it in the ocean down one end of the tube, whatever angle you want. Yeah, actually, that 
That's a great idea. And actually, that's how I met um, Dr. Hunter originally. I saw an article in Popular Science Magazine, and I was like, that's, that's a cool idea. You know, here's this thing, except for the muzzle, it's underwater, right? So that gives you the ability to be completely, you can orient your azimuth and your, you know, angle of attack. So yeah, that's a cool way to go. I mean, obviously there's a lot of operational problems because saltwater is corrosive and you're out there in the ocean. And you know, we've known people that are trying to do barge launch before and they've had a lot of challenges, but that's actually how I met John Hunter. He came to our, our little space talk and then you know, he and I got together and started working on this project together. So yeah, great idea. Quick. Uh, yes. Specifically in this on the surface of Mars, roughly what would be the mass of what you have on the ground as far as this carrying the energy and and what would be the payload of the G-force in the data from the trajectory? Yeah, so G-force is like 30,000 uh, PSI, I mean, um, G. It's a, lot of, it's a lot of G. But we've shot, um, actually, um, John Hunter's been in experiments in Largo, Florida. They shot uh, solar, solar panels, and they were able to be functioning afterwards. So a lot of the problem with G is just... Um, you know, electronics, you can, you can, you can harden them. Mostly it's just epoxy. You want things with low profile and you want things that are surface mount. And that's actually, that can be done pretty easily. But if you're going to launch fuel, which is the main mass going to Mars, you're going to launch water, building materials, all that stuff is completely incompressible. It's certainly compatible with this method. We, like I said, we don't want to have the entire project going to Mars. People got to take a, a rocket, but we only want to do about 90% of it. We don't want to be greedy. <laughs> yeah so so uh, yeah so it's like i said it's just a long straight tube and you can put composites around these metal tubes that's a lot more lighter weight which strengthens them and so forth i mean you could just dig a deep hole in the ground and make a big tunnel and line it and just start shooting out that way I mean, there's a lot of ways to do this um, but I think, yeah, I mean, obviously you're going to have to take some long straight tubes that are assemblable. Right now, uh, the Sharp system that Dr. Hunter built at Livermore Laboratory is in storage over at Davis Motham, that big mothball Air Force Base. It's not too far from here in Tempe. So that's there. We went and visited it. There, it's still sitting there. It's in pieces. It's in, you know, 10 foot, 12 foot sections. It can be bolted back together and it could be taken to Mars or wherever you want to take it. Is Paul um, Armstrong here? Paul Armstrong? Wanna... Go ahead, one. Next question. Yeah. So you mentioned 30,000 Gs is kind of what you estimate a full scale version would experience. Yeah. We all know rockets have a tendency to explode sometimes. Right. Have you come up with any sort of design that could actually handle anything close to that sort of Gs yet? Or is that something that has to be researched later? So, yeah. So, I mean, the, the electronics in that little projectile I showed you, I mean, those have all been shot out of it. So, the, I mean, we can handle the G with the systems we have. Um, I mean, obviously, if there's, if the clean is, if the tube isn't clean, if you put like just a pebble inside the tube and hit that as this thing's going out, it's like a, it's like a plastic explosive. It'll, it'll blow a hole in the tube. So you got to have things have to be clean. It has to be inspected before you take each shot. I mean, there's, there's issues there, but it's things we can handle. I was more wondering about the second stage solid rock, rocket booster you were talking about that's yeah. actually inside the rocket. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, obviously we haven't, we haven't shot any rockets yet, so we will have to experiment with that. But I think that uh, we've, we've been working with uh, North of Grumman in Utah uh, on, with their solid rocket program. So I think that's where we're going to go with them originally. And then we'll be sh shooting things probably horizontally first into our test bed to see how they survive. But you. Good question. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Come talk to me if you got any questions. Thank you, Eric. Hey, you're awesome. Job. Thank you, James. Yeah. You know, yeah, why don't you go ahead and take your lanyard off? Just put it on the table there. Yeah. Just your shirt. And then you can put that in your pocket, maybe. And then you are all set, sir. It's all. It's all. Okay. I just don't want to hit a button. Good. Accidentally, switch on the top. So. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. All right. Oh, I can talk. And this is definitely a different perspective than the seats. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is I'm Paul Armstrong. I'm an interpreter wannabe. Um, and I've come up with a concept of shuttling 
uh, between Earth and, and Mars. And this can be a part of a more advanced system for the solar system. But we'll concentrate mostly on Mars. Now, as it's been pounded into your head and into my head, space travel is very expensive. So how do we attack that problem? One of the ways, and the way I'm uh, going at it here, is through use of generic modules that you can use to put together to configure a spacecraft. And also using standardized methods, for instance, like um, your docking stations. If you go from one country's docking station to another, they build something different. So it needs to be standardized. NASA uh, recently, as far as my knowledge is, has come up with a common berthing station, which they are using on the space station. So same idea, we may even uh, make use of that mechanism, but that's something in the future. Now, let's see, I should know my own stuff, right? Um, okay. We'll move on to the next slide. And this is a picture of the cargo ship or cargo setup. Now I'm gonna go back. Okay, this is passenger ship. Now, how this is broken down, as you see on the far left, the heavy or, or thick uh, section there with the two plates and the nozzles in the back. Obviously that's the propulsion system. Engines, as I said, are in the very back. The next wafer, if you will, is for shielding. It's also where the engines, which you can swap out, they would be attached or, or bolted in place. For Mars, the initial configuration pending actual experience, it would be two electric engines and two chemical engines. All right, and I'll explain that in a, in a moment once we're done breaking the rest of it down. Then you have four sections, four essentially cube-shaped sections and they have what looks like tires on them. Those are actually deflated, inflatable habitats, okay? What I don't show yet is what goes on top of them or docked to them. And that, is, that would be a small spacecraft for emergency usage. And that would be docked to each one of these tires, as you might call it. Beyond the four tire section, that sliver is solar panels uh, at a slight angle, so you can at least distinguish them. Each pan There's four panels there. Each panel is rated at, or expected to be rated at uh, 25 kilowatts for a total of 100 kilowatts per section. And further on down the line, almost to the end, there's another set there. There's, there's a specific reason for a second set. 100 uh, kilowatts is the minimum for a electric engine. 200 ideal. Now, if you don't need the full 200, when you turn the, I should preface that saying that going to Mars, the sun is gonna be hitting the back end 
more than the front and vice versa on the way back, which is why we have a second set of solar panels. And also when coming back, the center section, which is the control center or cockpit, will be shading part of those solar panels. That's another reason why we have that second set of solar panels up front. Now, as I stated, the center section is the cockpit, uh, all the controls, so on and so forth are there. The crew that control the ship live in there. And of course you have the radio, uh, yeah, radar antenna as such uh, for communications at the bottom. The antennas sticking up on top will be for using Wi-Fi network to communicate with all the other modules. Now, going down past that, each section no longer has tires. That's because, for one, for a passenger ship, they're not needed, but we need that space for the solar panels. So that's why they're appended there. And then also each section, each little square all the way through the ship is hollow with hatches on each end so that in this configuration, the passengers can go down into the center of the ship and walk or fly down to the other end. The other end is where all the recreational facilities will be. Uh, there'll be a biodome, which is the dome you see. There'll be gyms. There'll be open living space, which is why you have portholes just at, um, just below the biodome. And that fills out the passenger ship. Now, as I said, it's configurable. You can take pieces out, add them in as needed. So for the first maybe 10 years, you'll need this setup here. You can hold 96 people in each section. And the uh, inflatable habitats there, they can hold, uh, according to the habitat I'm using as a uh, preferred vendor, uh, you can hold four people minimum up to 12, and it's a multi-level structure once inflated. So that's passenger. Cargo ship, same structure. Oh, I what I did I have that there? Uh, no, that didn't get in. Okay. Um, that set of bulbs, if you will, just beyond the propulsion unit represent a uh, few food supply where all the food's going to be stored and also grown because each little section of that bulb is a hydroponic farm, if you will. Um, so I, they'll grow all your vegetables and everything in there and supply enough for whoever's on board. Then you have uh, two passenger sections, which will hold the crew. You have the solar panels. Then you have a, a red thing, rectangle, on top of the main structure. And that, believe it or not, the way it's configured at the moment, is a cargo container. 
So if you've ever seen a container ship, we can use that same setup as they do on a cargo ship. We can stack them as many as you need. And of course, they'll be attachable all the way around the center section. So you can hold a lot. Then you have the cockpit, you have another cargo container, and then you have something that looks a little odd, but those are the, uh, oh, let's say sky cranes. They're reminiscent of uh, the eagle from the TV show Space 1999. They're, they have four legs. And what I've done here is I've give, given you or show you two different variants in size. You have like maybe a, a 40 foot or 50 foot um, rocket or sky crane. And then on top, you have like a 20 foot. So that'll handle different sizes of cargo containers, which normally run between 20 and 40 feet long. So now you need, you know, with a uh, 40 foot cargo container, you want a much larger sky crane. So that's why I show you two different sizes. And those sky cranes are vertical landing vertical takeoff as they have rocket engines at the back end to move you forward as needed. Next we have, ah, yes, the claim to fame. Um, this setup with a propulsion unit, as I stated, we can bolt on any different type of rocket engine that you might have, you might want, you know, nuclear rocket engine, the electric, obviously, the chemical uh, engine, and each one has its different capacities, its different thrust. So what I did is I went on to uh, the trajectory browser, which you can find online, at the Ames Research Center website. It's called the Trajectory Browser. And you can fill in various parameters and it'll come back with all the possible solutions. It's geared to use of the Holman transfer. So I input the minimums that I am allowed. And there was only one solution for the shortest period of time uh, on the uh, trajectory. And that was an 80 day transfer. So with all the available engines and, and gearing primarily to electric with possible use of chemical uh, engines for initial kick start from zero, you're in high orbit, then the chemical engine can give you a big boost up front and you fill it in for the rest of the time you're traveling to Mars with the electric propulsion or electric engine. And doing that uh, based on using 30, a 37,000 mile per hour uh, traveling speed, which just also happens to be the solar, solar escape velocity, you travel 888,000 miles a day, 
67,000 miles an hour. Okay, so you go nearly a million miles a day. You have at a minimum 34 million miles to go. And that just happens to divide into the um, escape velocity divides into the 34 million at 38.28 mile, um, not miles, days to Mars. Very quick. And not very costly in terms of propulsion, uh, fuel. So the only provisor to that is you have to go and break. The you can't be going thirty seven thousand miles at a well, it won't be ninety degree angle, but say a forty five degree angle into Mars and expect to come to a stop or not a complete stop, but a very close to a complete stop to be captured by Mars gravity. You can only enter Mars orbit between a delta V of two and five. So you have to, I mean, you can't, because of that, you can't just go straight line into Mars. You have to come in and make at least a little curve to match the orbital path of Mars. Whether you do that from behind or in front. Now, so now this case here, um, if you wanted to show what it would look like, it would be very close to a straight line, three quarters of the way in, and then start bending. Okay. Um, now there is another transfer that's been discussed online anyway, and actually there's someone at NASA that um, developed it, and that's called a ballistic capture. And at this point, it's been used a few times on robotic missions, and right now it has you coming in and not stopping at an orbit distance from Mars. Well, I'm sorry, that's not quite correct. Um, we're not getting in close to Mars like you would with a Holman transfer. You come in further away and end up uh, up to a million kilometers in front of Mars. And then you let Mars catch up to you. Now, end result of that is, you know, travel times of like a year, two years, if you do that. However, in some of the research papers that I've seen on the technique, there are ways of shortening that time span and presumably be much better than the Holman transfer, not only in terms of propulsion, but also in terms of um, a propulsion, but in the number of attempts, number of possible launches per year that would be available. It had opened it up significantly. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I mean, I wouldn't know the details of taking that trip 
when you're looking at the maximum distance between the two planets of 100 plus million miles away versus the minimum at 34. So on to the next slide. That's just references, notes, telling you Earth escape velocity at 25,000, solar escape at 37. Oh, Earth escape. If you go with 25,000 miles an hour to Mars, you're traveling 600,744 day and you reach Mars in 56 and a half days. Okay, escape velocity from Mars is approximately 11,000 miles. Now, if any of those speeds scare you and you start wondering about how much speed humans can handle, at the last bullet point there, there's a statement made by Jim Bray, the director of the Orion Crew Module Project for NASA, that says, there's no real practical limit to how fast we can travel other than the speed of light. Now, the bullet point before that, the fastest humans have traveled so far is 39, uh, sorry, uh, uh, 24,700 91 miles per hour in Apollo 10 on the return trip from moon. So, you know, that, or we know that speed at least is presumably easy, um, but attainable, no problem. 37 is not that much higher. Okay. And these, this is a fact sheet uh, giving different so-called bulk parameters for Mars versus Earth. Then we have orbital parameters. One thing of note, just looking at um, the average orbital velocity, which is in the middle of the screen, um, for Mars, it's 24.08 kilometers a second. For Earth, that's 29.78. So Earth travels around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour. Mars travels around the sun at 53,000 miles an hour. And so we go a lot faster than Mars. And obviously that has its implications on positioning of Earth versus Mars in their orbit. Okay, there's your references. Okay, now here's something that um, you might question. It looks very similar to a passenger ship, but this system at each destination is expected to have a fuel depot and a, what's called a living depot, also known as a space station. Why is it square instead of circular? Well, for one, which is more expensive, a curved piece of metal or a straight piece of metal? And I'd say straight. Hence, the square. Now, another thing, when you look at a space station um, that hasn't been built, they're invariably circular. And have you ever noticed where are the solar panels? What are they used for power? Well, in this picture here, it's kind of obvious. It comes with solar panels. But, you know, you're left, and you probably never even thought of it. I can't say I ever did. You know, solar panels, where, where were they getting the power? So 
you know, these are, it's basically building bl blocks. This is just a very small space station. Uh, you can build it any way you want. You can have like a Christmas tree, you have the center section and then multiple arms going up the center section. It looks like a Christmas tree. But you can also fit a hell of a lot of people. Okay, uh, the next slide. This is what I configured as a fuel depot. And of course, as everyone always says, last gas before Mars. So, um, you know, the tanks are down below. The fueling points aren't designated here. Um, they would, ex I would expect at this point uh, to have a pipe, extendable pipe that extends out to the spaceship that comes in looking for fuel or re refueling. And there'd be sufficient tanks here of different gases, you know, both your xenon, your argon, your liquid oxygen, liquid methane, liquid hydrogen. So there'd be a variety there to serve a variety of people. All right, next. I think pretty much we've covered the propulsion unit. Um, what I haven't specified though is within the center section, it's going to be all the tanks, just like a fuel depot. There'd be, um, again, your xenon, argon, lux, so on, all contained inside in a honeycomb structure to provide not only support, but also protection in case of any kind of accident or a micrometeoroid coming in, blasting one of the tanks. So there's protection all around there and it also serves as a structural enforcement. Uh, went too far, okay. Here's the food supply again. I think pretty much we've covered that. Uh, this again is just another look at those cubes, which are basically hollow. I don't have the detail here in the center, but like I said, that they're hollow and there are metal like legs that extend out on one end, which fit into whatever other one you're attaching it to. So they prov provide a little bit of support there. Um, the picture on the right shows or attempts to show the little rockets that are docked to the habitats. Um, they should have found perhaps something a little more detailed, but that serves the purpose and they can either extend out, you know, vertically or land horizontally. It all depends on the rocket that you're using. Um, solar panels, self-evident, control center covered, recreational we covered, uh, cargo extension. Hmm, we've, we've already discussed that. And that's it. Questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Just give that to him. You're going to want to clip it on your shirt, like right up there. That one, yeah. Okay. Zero seven. Awesome. Testing.
Okay, so I'll put them down. So just the, use the arrows? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, so today I'm going to take you guys through um, how I think we can do Mars for less, which will make it easier for us to do Mars for all. Uh, I'm Nicholas Bennett. I'm a, with the Space Resources Group at the University of New South Wales in Australia. And I'm doing a, a PhD on lunar propellants, but I've got a background in finance and trading and risk management software. It's going to fix this. Sure. Um, and so what I'm going to be doing is kind of I've been applying my information logistics optimization experience to the resource logistics of space. Now, um, I started looking at the SpaceX Mars project because any kind of space resources endeavor is going to need like a, a massive, consistent customer to pay all the upfront costs for research and development and prospecting and all that sort of stuff. And that would certainly be the Mars project. Um, but the ideas that I'm talking about are applicable to any kind of um, logistics con concept of operations. Um, so when I was playing around with this thing, uh, it was kind of like dealing with a hydra. If you solve one problem, it often opens up multiple other problems. But in this case, it turned out that many of those were opportunities to make further improvements. And so what I'm going to show you today is that we can reduce the peak daily launches and therefore like the ground facilities and the tankers that you need by a factor of 10. You can eliminate um, three quarters of the Mars ships and the Mars ISRU and eliminate a third to three quarters of the total Earth launches and show a pathway to even further reductions. Um, we're going to optionally use lunar oxidizer derived from water and we'll definitely be aggregating cargo in addition to the proposed sort of propellant aggregation that they they're talking about and that we're going to wait for Mars transfers in high apoapsis, low periapsis orbits. Now these orbits are kind of a key feature that I'm going to rely on today so just going to explain exactly what I mean. I couldn't really find an acronym that captured the idea that the periapsis had to be low so I've used this HALP as the acronym. I'm looking for something better but that's what I'll use as a label for today. So there are some existing examples of orbits that aren't really using the features I'm talking about. So, for example, geosatellites are launched into a GTO, which has got, you know, the high geo apogee quite high up and the low perigee. And uh, modern moon landers like Chandrayaan-3 kind of pump their way up through successively higher helps. And uh, so there are a bunch of effects that I'm going to be relying on, which is that these, these high up high apoapsis orbits have got like reduced earth heating. Um, also, because you've prepaid some Delta V, they're giving you a head start to wherever you're wanting to go. Um, I'm using apogees that initially geo, but also you could go out to lunar distance or even out to the hill sphere with kind of um, uh, diminishing returns as you go up, up higher and higher. So the low perigee means that you've got good opportunities for reuse to the surface because it just takes a little bit of Delta V at the top to catch air and get a re-entry and a landing for tankers and things. And you've got multiple re-entry opportunities. You know, for a GTO, you can re-enter twice a day and out at the hill sphere, you can enter 11 times per synodic. Now, um, the SpaceX Mars project is kind of a work in progress. So I just base things on some not unreasonable assumptions to be going on with. If the assumptions change, the actual detail of numbers will change, but the, the direction of the effects and the sort of the, the scale of them isn't going to change much, I don't think. So SpaceX's basic plan is, you know, you launch to LEO, you use LEO tankers to fill up the ships with propellant, and then you burn for Mars. But the whole kind of point of Starship is that it's uh, reusable and refillable. So I'm going to lean into those properties as hard as they can be lent into. Okay, so we start off, you've probably all seen pork chop plots before, and this is where we've got some... Um, you know, color-coded delta Vs um, against Mars departure times and arrival times. And the Mars transfer window is just that time when the delta V is low enough and the time is low enough that the, the transfer is practical. And, you know, just kind of roughly judging, that looks like about 10% of the window, which means that, uh, you know, 90% of the time. Uh, so for cargoes, we want to go for the bluest little dots, lowest for passengers we want to go for the bluest little dots because it's the you know, for cargo the bluest dots it's the lowest delta v so it's cheaper 
for the passengers, we don't mind paying more propellant to get them there faster. So we can go for a dot that's lower down, but it's maybe a little bit redder. Now, it's, about, it's practical to uh, launch for Mars about 10% of the time, which means that your ground facilities are kind of sitting idle 90% of the time, which seems like you know, an opportunity cost. Um, so this is currently Boca Chica, without, before they put in the water deluge. Um, it takes about 140 cryogenic trucks to fill up the tank farm. And all of this kind of logistics is going to propagate, propagate out through road systems. They're probably going to have on-site manufacturing. They can have many of these launch towers and many tank farms. It's just a big, big deal. And it seems a little bit crazy that it's going to sit there idle 90% of the time, or ultimately that whenever the Mars window opens, nothing else launches for that time because we're going to use all of our launch capacity to fill that window. But you can avoid only being able to launch during the window if you launched to LEO, say, and you just had all the vehicles wait in LEO for the window to open. That way you can um, you know, reduce the launch facilities by a factor of 10. But it does kind of create the problem of having super cool propellants in LEO near the hot Earth. Um, so, you know, Earth heating is a big problem because half the sky for the vehicle is, is going to be infrared Earth. And you, you've got no, you know, the minimal exposure you can have is half of your vehicle. Um, so NASA's measured in somewhere around 250 watts per square meter of Earth heating. Um, the polished stainless steel top side of the Starship means it's probably only going to absorb about 19 watts per square meter. But if you use the Stefan Boltzmann law, you're only going to be able to radiate out away about six watts per square meter. So all up, the ship's going to have like 17 kilowatts of net heating, which means it's going to boil dry in a matter of months. And then you're going to be forced to try and do things like top up flights or have shades or chillers or insulation. Again, a big problem. But the thing is that, you know, on the coast to Mars, they've got a smaller problem which they will have to solve. Just the heating from the sun, you can point one end of the vehicle at the sun, a little shade will do the job, whatever. Regardless of the details, they'll have to solve it. So we just assume that they have solved it and then show how you can get similar conditions in orbit around the Earth before you've actually left. So the thing is that once you get to geo altitude, the Earth heating is negligible. And you can see from the diagram here with the GTO that it's spending most of its time far away from the Earth. And as you raise your apoapsis, the, the time that you spend, as you raise your apoapsis, the period of the orbit varies as the apoapsis to the three half power, which means that you know, by the time you get to a five times, ge, ge, a five times geo apoapsis, which is about half the way to the moon, you're gonna spend about 90% of your, your five day orbit where heating's negligible. And if you push it out to the lunar distance, you're going to spend 96% of your time where heating is negligible. So these kind of high apoapsis orbits can solve the propellant boil-off problem, which lets you launch any time, which lets you reduce your uh, launch facilities. But they create three problems of their own, right? You've got to worry about the Van Allen belts now. If you're doing passengers, it seems unreasonable to have them wait for 26 months in orbit and for the window to open. And then also you've got these ships in high, high apoapsis orbits that are only half full of propellant. And that's kind of uh, an opportunity cost. So here I've kind of overlaid the Van Allen belts and you can see that just a GTO kind of, if it had a high inclination, it would kind of scoot over and under the Van Allen belts. Um, and at low inclination, it would probably make like four passes through the Van Allen belts every day. That's about at most 3000 per synodic. Now, apart from the reduced heating that we talked about, there are a number of advantages as you raise the apoapsis here. The first is that um, you can lower the inclination of the orbit that does miss the Van Allen belts. You know, as you go high, you can twist it a little and, and still not intersect. Also, your passes are greatly reduced. If you were doing it at a lunar distance orbit, you'd make it most 100 passes. And then finally, the cost of changing your inclination to correct it goes down as the apoapsis goes up. 
and that lets you uh you know wait in a higher inclination orbit but then adjust for the transmars injection inclination that you need in a cheap way and then later on we'll see there's even another reason to go higher okay so the passengers don't have to wait for 26 months in orbit if you launch them on a passenger shuttle just in time before the window so get a passenger shuttle launch it refill it it boosts a rendezvous with the Mars ship but that makes it look like you don't save any peak launches but the thing is that you can pack the passengers in like civil aviation because this shuttle trip is only hours long and you have each of these ships service a group of the Mars ships now SpaceX has talked about doing point-to-point -point earth travel and one of those point-to-point -point starships would fill 10 Mars starships and it seems like uh, convenient to dock a group of Mars ships onto some kind of uh, hub or infrastructure just for ease of management and rendezvous and such and uh, so the way to think about this is is this then uh, turns cislunar space into kind of like a giant airport tarmac with a lot of remote terminals serviced by shuttle buses and this kind of hub is also like a good place to put any residual infrastructure you might have to have around refilling or cooling or thermal management or whatever it is um, rather than putting trying to put it on the starships the starships that have to go to mars And then we can take care of the opportunity cost of these half empty starships because we can fill them anytime uh, while they're in these helps. You can launch tankers, the tankers uh, can rendezvous cheaply, they can return cheaply. And there's two things we can spend uh, this extra Delta V on. We can get fast transits or we can send more mass. So when you're in a GTO, uh, the starships have got sufficient Delta V to do an 80 day transit. When they're full in a GTO, they can push, well, they can land four times their nominal cargo on the surface of Mars. So the kind of um, cargo logistics that we're talking about is you'd launch four cargo ships to LEO, and then three of them would transfer their cargo into the Mars ships. SpaceX has talked about, you know, a kind of PEZ dispenser for their big Starlink satellites, and you could imagine those kind of spitting palletized cargo between ships, just like they're currently talking about pumping propellant. And then you get Leo propellant tankers to fill the Mars ships, they'd boost a GTO. More tankers would launch, consolidate the propellant into GTO tankers that would rendezvous with the Mars ships, fill them up. And then, uh, you know, a little bit of Delta V, catch air and land, and the Mars ships would, uh, you know, boost onto Mars, obviously. And um, the GTO tanker kind of, um, Conops is also what you'd use for priming the fast transit passenger ships. Now the um, you know the ratio of the tankers to the Mars ships isn't one to one. So when you do the logistic math, you have to do like a whole of fleet logistics maths. Now I'll just do a little bit of quick sanity checking on doing a heavy cargo landing on Mars. I think the thrust is going to be fine because. Um, four times the cargo is only two and a half times the actual entry mass at Mars. And the Mars, the Mars vehicles are kind of overpowered for landing anyway, and there's room for more engines on them. So I think that that would be fine. For the air capture peak heat, if, if we take the, the peak heat of a standard entry to Mars as one unit, and then we look at uh, SpaceX's proposed cargo landings on Earth, which is like a, from a faster orbital velocity, and the um, you know the extra the the extra heating is proportional to the cube of the velocity multiplier and that comes out at around three units of heat and then if you model the heavier cargo peak heat at mars that's only proportional to the square root of the mass multiplier and it comes out at about 1.6 units so if they can land cargo on earth they can probably land four times the cargo on mars but there's a lot of uncertainty around the aero effects um, you've got higher ballistic coefficient so it takes longer to bleed off heat so you accumulate more heat over time you've got a higher terminal velocity so you need more delta v for the landing and um you know so there's uncertainties there but there are actually good advantages to avoiding the mars entry descended landing altogether or at least the direct one 
So I'll just kind of recap where we're up to. We use these high, apo, high apoapsis, low periapsis orbits to cut all the launch facilities and the tankers by a factor of 10. The high apoapsis gave us a head start that we could spend on speed or cargo. Uh, the LEO perigee gave us rapid and inexpensive tanker reuse. And we can deliver fast transits for passengers by using civil aviation density, just in time passenger shuttles to service groups of Mars ships without increasing the launch facilities much. And then the cargo consolida consolidation in LEO lets us cut the Mars ships by a factor of four and the ISIU for, by a factor of four. Now, um, I used, as I said, like whole of fleet logistics to model this and the, the chart at the bottom kind of shows you how the brown baseline metrics get changed to the blue heavy metrics if, you, if the whole thing was just cargo. Um, now, the interesting thing is that the, the, the actual logistics are more intricate, but the numbers of, you know, all of the metrics are reduced, even the rendezvous. So we're using more intricate logistics, but because we managed to reduce the number of ships, it even reduces the rendezvous. Okay, so at this point, we can add oxygen derived from lunar water into the equation. Um, SpaceX baseline is going to need about 430,000 tons a year, a year of oxygen in LEO. And the moon can deliver the same kind of outcome while delivering less oxygen. So the Mars ships will meet the lunar oxygen in orbits from LEO through to GTO, will eliminate all of the terrestrial O2 tankers, and we also end up reducing the methane. Uh, and if we apply that together with the four times cargo scenario, then we can cut the total Earth launches by a factor of four. Now, um, oxygen isn't the product that most people think of when they think of um, you know, lunar water. They usually think of hydrolox. But an oxygen buyer is a very desirable customer for a lunar propellant operation. If you have a look at the water breakdown on the lower left, you can see how uh, when you produce hydrolox, almost a third of the output that you have is excess waste oxygen. Now, this is like way too much for life support and it's a pretty big opportunity cost because you spent a third of your investment producing waste and the right hand chart is um on the right hand chart just worry about the gold and the red diamonds uh the red's the oxygen delivery the gold's the hydrolux delivery and it's derived by pushing the product in the lower left through the little astrodynamic model in the at the bottom in the center now um the x-axis on the chart is, uh, or the y-axis on the chart is the capturable value and it's been normalized to delivering hydrolox in LEO. And the x-axis kind of shows you the electrolysis output utilization. So the further to the right you are, the lower the opportunity cost. And you can see firstly that delivering oxygen lets you deliver about 1.5 times the product as delivering hydrolox. And that if you're delivering in higher orbits, you can re retrieve multiples of the value of delivering in LEO. So if you're a water-based uh, lunar propellant operation, then you want, uh, you want to get oxygen buyers and helps. Firstly, you want to be selling oxygen because you can sell more of it. And you want to be delivering at higher orbits because you can capture multiples of the value. You can charge more per kilo. Now, to kind of um, reduce the oxygen that's delivered in low orbits, the lunar operation delivers only enough oxygen for the customers to make a 500 meter per second burn. They'll make the burn, raising their apogee, and then the moon will deliver them 500 more, and you repeat until you get to GTO and do the full fill. And this is a little bit analogous to, you know, if you wanted to build a bridge, you could bring in a whole lot of infrastructure and kind of lower the bridge over the chasm or you can kind of throw a thread over that pulls a string over, that pulls the rope over, that pulls the cables over, and then you lay the bridge. And, you know, the latter one uses a lot less resources and uh, it's just kind of why we, why we chose this uh, CONOPS. Um, so the gray series on the chart here is how we move the heavy blue scenario uh, to include the effect of lunar oxidizer. And the difference between those two is value that 
the Mars project and the moon can kind of haggle over how to share that out. Now, from the oxygen to methane ratio of methyl ox, you might expect like a 78% reduction in the tanker launches from the Earth, but we achieved an 86% reduction. Uh, and that's because you don't need the methane that you were using to lift oxygen from LEO to GTO. Um, now, and if you're carrying less methane, you also need less oxygen to start with. Now, I haven't done the math for uh, pumping to still higher orbits, but if you, if you, we'd originally pumped the Mars vehicles into a higher orbit, there would be less oxygen to lift through the difference. So you would expect that it would deliver larger benefits. Now, if lunar propellant were available before the Mars project was fully spooled up, we'd be able to reduce the launch facilities by a factor of 40, but it's likely that it won't be spooled up then. It'll, it'll come online after the project, the Mars project is you know, well underway, in which case, They've prepaid all the launch infrastructure. And if the thing is worth doing, it's worth doing it faster. So the natural thing to do is to just accelerate the pace of the project by a factor of four. So, so far I've kind of identified some logistic building blocks and picked an example Apogee at, GT, at Geo and uh, shown some, you know, some, some pretty good uh, uh, you know, reductions in metrics. But um, cutting, cutting the vehicles by a factor of four kind of rested on uh, ignoring some uncertainties in the aerodynamic effects. And we can remove all of that uncertainty if we just do a propulsive capture at Mars and then gently aero break down and then use local Mars-based shuttles to ferry the cargo down from orbit. Um, so the lowest kind of home and capture burn to the highest Mars orbit you can get is around 200 meters per second. And the highest stable high apoapsis Earth orbits around LEO plus 3.2 kilometers a second. So that leaves you with a, a Mars vehicle that only needs to do 800 meters per second on the transfer. And for a Starship, that means it can push 4,200 tons, you know, from the highest Earth orbit to the highest Mars orbit. And that means that you can replace the effect of a thousand Mars ships with around 40. Now the burns for the Starship pushing 4,200 tons of cargo are pretty reasonable. It would take uh, you know eight minute Earth departure, which is about the same as Apollo's translunar injection. And the, the capture would take place over about 10 degree arc of, of Mars. And the architecture kind of conceptually looks like this classic lifters, haulers, and landers, which is usually done with specialized vehicles for each segment. But here, all the segments are done by all and only starships, which means they can all land and any kind of maintenance or inspections or anything that you need to do can be done on the ground, which takes a whole lot of uh, low TRL uh, technology out of the critical path. And there's not much point optimizing Starship as a hauler because it's now only 4% of the transit mass. Uh, now, you know, the Mars ships have now got like an 80% uh, payload rate, you know, payload mass ratio. And at the bottom of the slide uh, there, I've illustrated some different behaviors you can extract from Starship as the local gravity landscape becomes more benign and uh, the Delta V demands are reduced. Now it looks kind of ridiculous, but the circus act there is, is short 13 passengers. And the Mississippi barge tug analogy is pretty important, I think, because there's a lot of uh, cargoes that won't fit inside the fairing. Now, also I think uh, having these cargoes stranded, if you like, in low Mars orbit is also actually an advantage because now you can land them when they're needed. So for example, uh, spares for some kind of stochastic failures um, don't need to be brought down until you know the parts pool on the surface drops below some threshold so you can land other things that you'd rather have first and what we've done here is that we've replaced many low reuse vehicles with just a very few very high reuse vehicles and that's what uh, can vastly reduce the cost of moving mass to mars now, um, kind of in the spirit of Dr. Zubrin's 1990 National Space Society speech, where he introduced Mars Direct and some other fun out-of-planet ideas, 
we're going to leverage today's uh, logistics to deliver a continuous human presence in the Jupiter system. So you've got to think of a, a little human outpost smuggled into a tiny icy moon on the uh, high above Jupiter's radiation hazard. Now these are some examples from NASA Ames trajectory browser. The flights on the right use a deep space maneuver to get an Earth gravity assist that reduces the required delta V. Now the upper right cargo flights are slow, but they'll get you to Jupiter system cheaper than getting to the surface of the moon. And on the lower uh, right, that you can see there's 18 month Earth Jupiter legs for a little more than landing on the moon. And these are reversible, uh, you, 700 meters per second will give you an 18 month fall to Earth. Now the trajectory browser can't really optimize just the final Earth Mars leg. So there could be much better trajectories than these. Um, now, the crew can avoid the two-year setup for the Earth gravity assist if they jump on board the moving freight train as it goes past in a um, crew hyperbolic orbit rendezvous. So the exploration vehicle is going to do a powered flyby that ends up at about 16 and a half kilometers per second. The periapsis speed of these helps um, is about uh, 11 kilometers a second. So you've got a 5.5 kilometer a second catch-up burn to do. And I've illustrated it on the diagram there with a Dragon capsule and a Falcon stage two, because uh, if that was full, it, it could catch up with the exploration vehicle. So on the lower left, you've got a 12 kilometer per second NTR designed for Mars, and it expends most of its expensive nukes and tanks, but it could almost fly the return propulsively. Now, if we maximally pump orbits using tankers or tugs, we can bring the required delta V for an exploration vehicle under four meters a second. At the lower center is a hydrolox vehicle that can get the crew to Jupiter and back. If we went the expendable Starship route and assumed 200 tons of essentials on the round trip, it could leave 1,500 tons at Jupiter. Now, in terms of um, human capital and life support, with a three-year residence, we'd have one crew in flight for every resident. So it's kind of like double the moon base. Now, I'll just recap the main takeaways. We had uh, the three logistic effects that call for these high, ap high apoapsis, low periapsis orbits. You can reduce the ground facilities and tankers by launching every day and waiting in orbit. You refill and help orbits. You can do fast transfers or increased cargo. And the moon wants to give you oxygen in these high orbits. It's the highest return product the moon can have. And the properties that we relied on was you can stay super cooled in, the, in these orbits. You can avoid the Van Allen belts. You can achieve faster heavy transits to reduce your ship counts or, or size. And the propellant and time cheap tanker tug reuse lets you maximize the work done where you can do reuse rapidly. And they're a foundation for uh, interesting possibilities beyond Mars. A human, a human Jupiter system output post, which is maybe between two and 10 times as expensive as the moon. And Saturn is only Jupiter plus 600 meters per second, but the crew has to be prepared uh, for an 11 year flight time. Now I've like pushed the astrodynamics to the limits here and I've probably like colored outside the lines a little bit, but all the all mission designs present a tangled kind of forest of issues. And I climbed a few of the trees and the view looks pretty interesting. It seems to make sense for Mar to wait for Mars windows in high apoapsis, low periapsis orbits. There are two tangled trade spaces, one around the departure orbit apoapsis and refills, and then what to do with the head start they give you, and another one around the propulsive capture at Mars with the error braking and the local Mars shuttles. But I think successfully exploiting these opportunities has very large potential payoff that could help us do Mars for less, and uh, that would help us do Mars for all. Thank you. I'm sure. Great. Excellent. Any questions? Got time for one. Microphone. So first off, this is awesome. I love it. Thank you. Um, second, if you're doing these high apoapsis, uh, low perigee orbits, can you, have you thought about using a, a lunar gravity assist for the launch phase to Mars. Oh, it, definitely. When I was looking at it, 
like that was what I was thinking for an ion thruster, but you know, it gets you like 400 meters a second if you do it right. So, uh, yeah, definitely. It's just that, um, uh, it's just a case of modeling what you can model. So yeah. that's the only reason I left it out there. Yeah. Fair enough. For phase two. Awesome. Thank you very much. It's good. Thank you. All right, Doug, you're all set. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Doug Plata. I am a uh, physician. I'm also the president and founder of the Space Development Network. It's a free to join uh, network of space advocates, um, and we're sort of projects focused. So I'm going to go ahead and present about Starship uh, timeline little disclaimer i don't work for spacex so <laughs> this is going to be a uh, speculation based upon you know the, the information that's in the public domain uh, so let's let's dive into it um, i'd like to give always uh, for my presentations overview so you can see where we're going i'm going to lay out what elon's stated goals have been uh and and there's like 2030 and 2050 what he uh, hopes to achieve I'm going to mention about Starbase and basically the factory for engines and and um, the, the the starships that they have there, uh, specifically the engine production rate. I think that's sort of an objective thing that sort of sets the anchor for us to figure out what the timeline is going to be. I'm going to mention about the starship variants uh, and how they play into the timeline, uh, and then starship to orbit. That's the thing that we've been waiting for, um, and uh, refueling how difficult is refueling uh starlink how that fits in especially financially uh and then um recovering you know the the super heavy booster uh as well as re recovering the starship uh and then going on uh when do we expect for lunar cargo to occur how about doing this lunar flyby the the dear moon uh, i'm going to briefly mention about sls and how it's impacted by starship uh progress and then um, at, at about that time, at about the time of the lunar flyby with people going past the moon, and then um, looking at Mars. Uh, so <clears throat> um, taking a look at, of course, sending Mars cargo first and exactly how I anticipate SpaceX is going to try to uh, make sure that it's safe to send people. Um, and then lunar crew and then Mars crew and then I will, since the timeline goes out to 2050, that's Elon's timeline for a million people on Mars, I'm going to take a look at lunar settlement and Mars settlement, uh, and then uh, I'll go ahead and lay out the entire timeline. Are you guys ready? Okay, four of you are ready. So let's let's jump in. Uh, okay, so Elon's goal, and I, I sort of start with Guadalajara. I think, I think since 2006, Elon has actually had a lot of this um, uh, idea. Um, but uh, particularly starting with Guadalajara, he started laying out his vision. And, and as, as I think most all of us know, his vision is for 1 million people on Mars by 2050. Why this incredibly loud, uh, round number of 1 million is because he roughly figures that's about how many people you need to be able to produce all the things to keep this uh, city going. So it's a self-sustaining city, he believes requires about a million people, plus or minus what, 500,000? <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a round number. Uh, but as a nearer term objective, he has said that he wants to see 1,000 Mars starships by 2030. And as I'll show you from the engine production rate, it actually looks like SpaceX is pretty much on track to, to achieve that. Uh, so here we are. This is sort of the end goal uh, that Elon has set 2050 with, of course, that's, that's not a million people, but you get the idea. Here's a quote. From him, <clears throat> if we could get the price, okay, so Elon's vision, how? What, what is like the business case? How do you pay for this? If we could get the price of moon to Mars down to the equivalent of the median cost of a house in the United States, we could get enough people who wanted to go, he says. It would be kind of thing you could save for and afford. So what he's talking about is sort of ordinary people saving money uh, in, in, in having wealth in the form of their home uh, like people did when they traveled from Europe to the New World, and you sell your home, and with that, you purchase the ticket, and with Starlink revenue, as well as your uh, your own savings, 
you're able to sustain yourself on Mars. That is, that's his business plan, actually. Uh, and he put up, if you recall, this Venn diagram. He says the people who are going to be going are the people who can afford to go intersected with people who want to go. Uh, and there's different things that you can do to enlarge the size of, of each of those circles. Uh, now, let me tell you, uh, how realistic is this? Well, there's about 60 million millionaires around the world, okay? So if we were to get one-tenth of one percent of the millionaires who have enough money to go, presumably, if, if uh, we could convince them that they want to go, uh, then that would be like 600,000 people just, just with that small fraction of, of the millionaires. So in my mind, this actually, uh, from a financial standpoint, it seems like there's, there's a way of, of paying for this, provided that you get the per seat price down low enough to where people, uh, can, the, the wealthier people can afford it. Speaking of which, here is a, um, here's a graph of the age distribution of millionaires. And no surprise, they tend to be older, okay? Why is that? Because it takes time to save up that much money, right? So I think that retirees are going to be overrepresented, not just because they can afford to go. If you can't afford to go, you're not going, right? Probably. Um, so ret uh, retirees who are have enough money and they're freed from child rearing responsibilities, their kids have flown the coop, as well as freed from occupational responsibilities, you're retired. These are the ones who are going to be overrepresented. There will be some younger, but you know, there, there's not that many 30-year-old millionaires. Star base. Okay, uh, how, show of hands, how many of you have been down there? Okay, I'm going to say 20, 20-25%. Okay, so obviously this is in Boca Chica, Texas. It is not just a launch complex, but uh, especially importantly, it's the Starbase factory. I mean, this is where they are really cranking out uh, starships. Like, you know, we've never seen anything like this before. I wanna focus on the engine production rate. Um, so right now uh, they are producing probably a bit more than one Raptor engine per day. Think about that. Every upper stage starship is nine engines. Every nine days, they've got another starship or, or the engines for, for starships, okay? Um, and if you had 100 days, let's say 100 Raptor engines, that would be enough for a super heavy booster with 33 uh, engines. And then assuming nine engines per starship, uh, you would have between seven and eight uh, engines for seven or eight starships, okay? So we're, so we're talking... In, in a, like a third of a year, you, you have a fleet this big and you keep, you keep adding those on so it could really add up to a sizable fleet. This, this affects the timeline of which we can do really big things uh, on Mars. So the Starship uh, variants, um, there's, it's not, they're variants. And so there's a, a lot of commonality, but there are variants and each variant has to be tested and, and proven. And that's, good, that's gonna take some time. So let's talk about uh, Starship to orbit. Uh, so this is um, obviously, this is, this is really what we've been uh, waiting for to be able to see this super head lift vehicle being able to achieve orbit. I'm saying nothing about reusability at this point, just can they get that upper stage to orbit? I would say they have at least a 50% chance of doing it on the next launch. And within 12 months, you know, provide they get the FAA launch license, uh, I, I would say that they should be able to make it to orbit almost almost 100%. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, it's doable. Okay, so Starlink. This is this is going to be obviously one of the first uh, payloads uh, that they're going to be launching. They can sort of it's their payload and they're cranking these out, so they can sort of afford to risk it uh, on these early launches. Uh, and uh, it is estimated um, by them uh, that between 20 and $30 billion per year. Think about, they're, they're already at, uh, I think, uh, $1.4 billion a year now from the Falcon uh, 9 launch of, of Starlinks. Think about if they were to get up to even just $20 billion a year, that is NASA's entire budget. That's double NASA's human spaceflight budget, okay? We're, we're talking... This, this is a, a new day, a new day. Refueling uh, is something that needs to be accomplished um, next. 
And I have spoken to possibly the leading um, researcher on, on refueling, and we have already transferred propellant in orbit, not just cr not cryogenic, but we transferred it. Um, uh, the Russians do that with the ISS, uh, and they have been able to transfer uh, cryogenic propellant in the lab. All they need to do is put it together and, and launch it. He, he thinks they'll probably get it on the first try. It's not that difficult, okay? Recovering, oh, and we haven't had, the United States has not had a docking failure in more than 40 years, okay? Uh, recovering super heavy booster. Uh, now this is, how many of you want to see this? Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I, in, in my ideal scenario, they, they target off the coast and they come, they hover, and it's like, hey, it's all good. And what they do is they do a lateral translation, translation into the loving arms of Mechazilla, right? That would be, just be epic, totally epic, okay? Now, here's the interesting thing. Uh, in order for full reusability, yes, they need to recover the booster in, in the upper stage. But, um, uh, but SLS is not gonna be recovered. So even if they, they failed to accomplish this, they've still dramatically reduced the price of super heavy launch, okay? And if they, it, I, I think uh, transfer propellant is going to be easier uh, than than probably catching it. But uh, if if you can just get to orbit and and refuel, man, you could you could send a tremendous amount of payload uh, to to the moon and Mars. Okay, recovering uh, Starship upper stage again, uh, reentry. I I think I, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't get this on the first try. Um, I've seen too many tiles coming off that thing over time, uh, but. Um, it seems as though the math should work out. And so I think it's, it's more of a matter of time. Uh, they'll, just like with, with Falcon 9, they, they certainly didn't uh, re-enter into the atmosphere and, and have it survive, but they just kept trying different things until they got it. And you know, this will be large, but fairly empty. And, and so the, the, um, the ratios I think are gonna, are gonna work out eventually. Uh, lunar cargo, you know, this is, this is not, like Martian atmosphere reentry is just a propulsive landing. Uh, and so I think it won't take them uh, too many tries to be able to, to master this. Um, lunar flyby, okay, this is quite interesting. The Dear Moon uh, mission, which you probably are familiar, eight uh, artists will, will be, or eight or nine, I think, uh, will be going around the moon, not landing, but around it. And what that is going to demonstrate is that SpaceX has the ability to send people essentially to lunar orbit. And then if they are, if they have the human landing system, combine those two together and do you really need a gateway, you know? So this, this could be a significant mission. Um, so you could accomplish, I've, I've not heard this. So, so it's, I'm not even sure I'm speculating. I'm just putting it out there as a possibility. You could launch the Dear Moon, uh, uh, astronauts, you could launch them from the ground, or what you could do is you could launch your your starship to low Earth orbit, and you could launch the crew separately on, on Falcon 9 Dragon. And then in low Earth orbit, after refueling the lunar starship, you could you could dock and transfer the people. So you could do this at a, potentially at an earlier time uh, before you really have, have made it safe for launch of crew from, you know, from the surface of the Earth. Uh, and of course, that has significant implications for uh, Artemis III and, and, and the other uh, Artemis missions if you can safely, uh, we, we, we can get crew to, to orbit safely in Dragon. That's been proven several times. So that's an interesting thing. So at this point, I do wanna mention SLS. $4.1 billion per launch, okay? So think about it. What could you do with that 4.1 billion if you had an alternate way to get people safely uh, to, to the lunar surface? Yep, like 41. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and that's just assuming uh, $100 million per launch uh, of Starship. Not, that's not the lowest price that's estimated, but uh, so just using that, I mean, this, is, this gets crazy after a while, right? Mars cargo. Uh, Mars cargo, I think, is is really a um, uh, important stepping stone in preparation for 
for delivering crew to the surface uh, of Mars. Um, so they have done this physics uh, simulation. Uh, so they think that it's doable. Uh, it's one thing to simulate it. Uh, it's, it tells you that it's potentially, you know, uh, in the realm of, of possibilities. Uh, but um, to actually do it, I'm guessing they probably won't successfully land, you know, their first, second, and third uh, safely. I think it's, there's going to be a little But here's the, something I really want to point out is, is if you are able to produce uh, a, a, a good number of starships, and you're able to launch them within the about a one one month window that the um, window is open. The delta V is not too bad to be able to launch uh, craft to Mars. You could launch multiple Mars-bound craft for each Earth-Mars window, and then what you could do is you could separate them by a day or two, and then have them attempt to land on Mars. If the first one fails, you send the telemetry back to Earth. And they go and they reprogram the second one. And then it attempts landing. If it doesn't work, you 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 keep learning. In other words, you you take, you know, think about the Falcon 9 and all of those crashes that they had. You could you can combine that into one campaign in, in landing on Mars. So in in probably they're not going to be able to attempt in the 2024 window, but I imagine in the 2026 window uh, that they can make multiple attempts. Uh, and if there's if, if they're not able to get any of them, it's probably a hardware problem. But they'll get that telemetry. They'll they'll figure out what it is, and then in, in the next Earth Mars window, they'll be able to have a modified, physically modified craft and do multiple attempts again. Okay, lunar crew. Um, Artemis uh, three uh, may not actually be landing on the surface; may be uh, going to lunar orbit. Uh, but uh, after that, would uh, they would land on on the surface? Okay. Um, so that we need to put that on the timeline. Mars uh, crew, of course, this is the the big enchilada, isn't it? This is this is what we're really aiming for. Uh, crew arrival on Mars after only after safely proving they can sequentially or, or in 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 series be able to safely get cargo. After you safely get cargo, then you figure, hey, we've proven it's safe enough; it's worth a try. There's still risk, but at least you've proven that you can land these things multiple times before. Okay. Uh, and then after we've uh, gotten the capability to deliver large uh, quantities of, of, of cargo and crew to the moon and Mars, then we're off to the races. With a fleet of starships, uh, we, we can just start sending large numbers of people, establishing a, a base, or I would say quickly transitioning to a settlement. Uh, and let me just mention about... Um, the moon is 70 times closer uh, round trip tra travel time than Mars. Uh, and yeah, Blue Origin, it's, it's aiming to the moon and it's, I call it the blue, blue turtle because it seems to go so slowly. But if, if the hare has chosen a much closer uh, uh, finish line uh, compared, compared with Mars, then they could, for the, for the same, uh, number of vehicles you could do 70 times more trips to the moon you could earn you know you could you could sell 70 times more tickets too uh, so it, it could be surprising how quickly settlement on the moon uh, could could grow nonetheless we this is uh, the mars society conference so let's focus on mars uh, mars settlement of course that is at the end of the of, of our timeline uh, and uh, you know every 26 months there would be almost an exponentially uh, or, or sort of sigmoid curve in terms of growth of, of population on Mars. So uh, before I really lay out the timeline, let me go ahead and uh, set some disclaimers. Elon time. Elon time could extend the timeline that I'm about to lay out. Obviously, engineering is, is hard. You know, Elon is an optimist. And so uh, there could be, uh, we could simply be too optimistic here. Okay. And oh, yeah. I'm not taking into account every possible setbacks. We don't, we don't know all of the setbacks, not just technical, but there could be like opposition. There could be lawsuits. There could be, we, we, we know, right? Um, uh, the media could be against them. There could be, uh, you know, opposition activists rise up and says, you know, who elected Elon to, to risk our lives bringing back these, the red, the red death bacteria from, you know, from Mars, you know, these things could happen. 
So with all of those caveats, uh, all those disclaimers, let's now get to the timeline. And again, this is my proposal of what I think is, is going to happen, okay? I really base it on engine production rate, starting at one engine per day and by 2030 or a little sooner, getting to three to four engines per day. At that rate, we, we will have enough at the end of 2023 for about 55 uh, starships. And I'm imagining that, it's, that we have a, a increase one and a half engines per day, then two and a half the next year, three, et cetera, up to four and then keeping it steady at four. Uh, and so this is, this is what I imagine how many starships it would take to be able to get to 1000 starships is what he said his goal was by 2030. And from the engine production rate, it looks like uh, they're, they're on track for this, okay? Now, mind you, they're producing a lot of engines since they don't have a craft that's like making an orbit. There's some warehouse down there that's just like filled to the gills with, uh, with engines. But once they be able to, to get Starship to, to really work, to get to orbit, then they're gonna start taking those out and, and quickly loading them, you know, attaching them onto, uh, onto Starships. So here's the timeline starting with this year and over two slides getting to 2030. I'm putting an orange. These are the, uh, the Earth-Mars launch windows. It's 26 months, so every so often you skip two years instead of, uh, instead of skipping one year, okay? So uh, we have, we, SpaceX has, um, I, I believe, somewhat more than 300 engines right now. Um, and I don't, I'm guessing that Starship is not going to have a quick, you know, authorization they're going to launch and be successful. I'm guessing that uh, it'll be 2024 when Starship will actually achieve orbit. Um, I think refueling in orbit probably occurs not terribly long after they, uh, they achieve orbit. Uh, so 2025, oh, I should mention uh, in 2023, Starlink revenue has uh, just recently been, been reported 1.4 billion per year. And as you start doing Starlink launches, which are gonna be some of the first pain, you know, pain launches, uh, self-pain, um, they are heading towards 20 to $30 billion per year. So that the, the Starlink is sort of critical to, to, to this whole thing. Um, the depot in orbit, I think, it's, I think they're already building that. Uh, I imagine 2025, maybe even a little earlier, they, they'd be able to get this. Uh, refilling in orbit, maybe late 2025. Uh, cargo to, to Luna. If, you've, if you're able to get to orbit and you're able to refuel, even if you're not recovering things yet, uh, you can nonetheless send cargo uh, one way, or you can attempt to send cargo one way to the lunar surface. Uh, by 2026, I estimate that there'll, there'll be at least a thousand engines produced, which would be about, that doesn't look right, 15 super heavy? No, that's too many. Uh, I, I think I got that wrong. I think it's, um, I don't know, it's about four or five uh, super heavies and 56 starships. So with that many, I think that we can actually go ahead and attempt uh, Mars cargo in this window of 2026. 56 super heavies times 33 engines? Oh, okay, okay. So, so it is correct. I, I wouldn't do that. I would probably shift shift the engines more towards starships. You, you don't need one to four ratio between super heavies and and starships, I believe. But yeah, I, I guess the numbers do come out correct after all. Just the ratios. I I, I think they they're going to skew it otherwise. Okay, Artemis three. When when is Artemis three going to occur? That. <laughs> Um, not not real confident in this number, but I'm saying 2027. And is it going to be orbit? Or is it going to be a surface of the moon? It's at this point, it's hard to say. Looking at what NASA is saying. Um, now, Elon has said has specifically said that in 2029, he thinks that's the earliest that they'll be able to get uh, people on the surface of Mars. And I think as you take a look at at uh, the engine production rate. And in the, the windows, I think this is the reason why he has chosen 2029. I think 
I, I think we're onto something here. Now, what I'm doing is I'm saying, well, there's all sorts of things that can happen. So I'm actually putting it in 2031 is when I think the first people could land on Mars. I'm guessing you probably need two, two, car, two windows of cargo attempts uh, before you're gonna send crew, okay? But again, you got this, this series of landers all within the same window. So I, I think they could uh, fairly quickly get confident that they can land, land people there, okay? And then what I'm doing is I'm sort of uh, shrinking together the, the, the Earth-Mars uh, launch windows. And uh, at this point, I think that they're probably um, going to send, if, if they do land people in 2031, I'm guessing they're not going to send very many people. I, I, I don't think they want to risk 500 lives on, on the first crew landing. I think it's going to be real, you know, just a, a, a three dozen. Um, and uh, and then um, by the, and, and then I think there will be sort of a, a bit of a J shaped curve of growth, population growth. But then after they're really comfortable sending people, there's not too many crashes. Then I think it's a thousand ships going every 26 months, and this is how it plays it itself out. I'm saying they don't quite reach the goal in 2050, but it will be a couple windows after that. And this is probably optimistic. It's it's where that you know there's not they don't have to wait three years while they do an investigation while there's a crash, for example. So this is my uh, timeline uh, for, uh, towards Mars settlement, and I'm very curious to find out what you guys think if you think this is realistic so thank you for your attention I think it's really one of the things I want to address is your, your criteria your criteria for people who might want to go and and the millionaire scenario certainly is an easy one to look at but thinking back to explorers and adventurers through history human history uh, the people who go to these places are ones that are looking for new opportunities to break away from established societies. For one reason or another, they're, they're in, in, incapacitated, unable to reach their dreams. So I think it's more likely that Ellen is going to have to do something, if it's him that's behind it, is financing dreamers on the basis that they're going to create riches for him on Mars. Uh, that's that's the only comment it wasn't really a question but okay maybe for others out there a different theory on that i don't think you're getting many millionaires to risk themselves in the way that you think they might uh, we only need like one tenth of one percent practically and, and, yeah. and we're there but you're so. also the odds what percentage of the older people are going to do that versus the, the fa fair, fair enough but again we only need one tenth of one percent but what i there, there could be things like uh mormons will say hey we want Mormonism represented in, in this new branches. There, there could be all sorts of interesting motivations. Yeah. For uh, a cryogenic orbital propellant transfer, um, I, I think uh, it's been mentioned just small thrusters providing milligy. Uh, is that still sort of the default? Uh, do you, can you just pump it, or is there ever any efficient way to sort of spin Not, and have some advantage from some you, you could spin, but I, I think it's ollage burn. It's a, just a small burn, just to just to settle it on one side, and you start sucking from there. Okay. I don't okay. Think it's Keep difficult. it simple. We have one down here. Yeah. Are you saying can um, uh, Chinese using March nine also deliver cargo to start to? Uh, and, um, no, SLS doesn't really only launches people. Well, no, it can launch co launch cargo, uh, and could that be transferred over to HLS? I, I sort of don't think they're planning on that. Yeah, and, and China is not going to cooperate with us, I think. Um, just following on from the early comment, there might be a market for some kind of venture human capital, who, you know, people who are going to fund the people to go in, in, you know, in exchange for a little bit of the game. I, th I think the business model is really quite simple. I, and Elon, this is Elon's business model. Governments pay to have their people go to represent themselves. This is, this is funded human space flight you know, from the beginning till now. Uh, and then private individuals through their savings, they take money made in other markets and they, they use it to go. 
Uh, and then uh, Star, uh, Starlink revenue will go to fund the infrastructure development on Mars. This is, this is what has been, been stated. With the cadence of the ships intended to launch from Earth during those years from 2030 on, has anybody done the estimates for all the consumables that are going to go into that? The fuel, the oxidizer, as well as the materials and stuff to go onto those ships? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm guessing that they've done a pretty sophisticated sort of logistics analysis, uh, a, a propellant wise for sure. And you can launch propellant outside of the windows and you can have it up there uh, in, in time. So that helps. Uh, but frankly, you need to get the bulk, bulky materials produced on Mars as quickly as possible. You need all of your water produced there. Plastics, I think, should be produced there from which you can make things like furniture and stuff like that, and then, and then metals as well, as well. If you can get those bulky things, you can reduce uh, your, uh, what you need to transport in terms of cargo, reduce it by about maybe 75% or, or 80%. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Doug, amazing yeah. talk. All righty. Our next speaker is Torsten Eckweiler. How do I do that? Just pin it to your uh, shirt. Oh, okay. Let me just go ahead and grab this. Okay. Put it in the Oh, so pretty much like this. Neat. All right. Can everyone hear me? Awesome. So I'm very excited to be here and uh, yeah, talk about audiovisual entrainment and probably having clinical and physio physiological aspects for our spacefaring future. So a little bit of background to, to myself. So hi, I'm Thorsten. I'm here because I see audiovisual entrainment technology as a key component in making us a spacefaring species, pretty much acting as an auxiliary shield in uh, human factors in space operations. I'm a prospective analog astronaut and graduate student, and I try to raise awareness for the technology and bring it into the space sector and maybe yeah, make the world a better place. So before we start, has anyone here heard about audiovisual entrainment before? So what it basically is, it's like light undergoing a stroboscopic effect. We have tones. When we break them up, we have pulses. It is pretty much a multisensory neuroentrainment approach. It's novel and innovative technique. Also, it's kind of 40 years old. And it uh, has an inductive effect on neural oscillations with pretty much the brain waves. I guess. Like that? Yeah. What is it? Oh, you have a different display. Okay. Okay. Uh, there we go. That's the. I'm going to. I don't know how to do it from that display. So I'm gonna... Okay. But I think it's working. Yeah. So, what it basically is, it's like pulses of light and sound at specific frequencies that gently and safely guide the neural networks of the brain into various brain wave patterns or neural oscillations. And it's a clinical and physiological effects are scientifically proven, which means that AVE, which stands for audiovisual entrainment, it does reflect reality. And it's pretty much applic applicable for a raft of detrimental health effects on Earth and pretty much beyond. So a little bit of history of AVE, it started in 1934 with Adrian and Matthews. They discovered that the alpha rhythm, like 10 hertz, so that's pretty much flickering lights driving a burger rhythm up and down from its natural frequency. And then the breakthrough come, came during the Second World War when William Kroger, who was a physician with the US Navy, was tasked with the weird assignment to figure out why the radar operators on ships and bomber planes in enemy territory were not doing their jobs. And it turned out that these radar operators were tranced out. They were put into hypnosis because these old fashioned radars, when the wiper goes around, goes around, we have a blip anytime there's an enemy 
vessel or plane approaching and this blip was enough to have a hypnotic effect on on, on people and that was pretty much the birth, birth of clinical entrainment. So not only gave the Second World War us rockets to go into space, also it gave us audiovisual entrainment technology. Then later, 1958, Kroger teamed up with uh, Sidney Schneider and they developed the brain synchronizer, which was pretty much using uh, therapy like uh, dentistry or gastrointestinal surgeries. So I'm talking a bit, little bit of Mind Alive and the David. So the David stands, is, stands for Digital Audiovisual Integration Device. It started in uh, 1985 and all the way through today, various iterations of the technology. Like I said, it stands for Digital Audiovisual Integration Device. It's a flagship product of Mind Alive. It's a unique fusion of AVE sophistication and simplicity. And all these sessions are thoroughly tested and the designs are based on current research. So what's uh, important about Mind Alive is that they will receive awards all the time. This year they received the award for best manufacturer of innovative neural entrainment equipment. They're based in Canada. And about AVE, there are some common early misconceptions and challenges. One of them is like, what do we call it? Is it like brainwave synchronizer? Is it like brain sync, hemi sync, mind machine, or whatever? So Dave Siever of Mind Alive, he came up with the term randomized audiovisual entrainment. But for this presentation, I refer to it as audiovisual entrainment or AVE. Technically, we could call it rave. And in the 80s and 90s, we had unfortunately a lot of esoteric misuse by the esoteric uh, movement, early and lasting pseudoscience is still lasts today and is completely stigmatized. And we, in the past, we had a lot of deficiencies in science and neurological understanding because the technology was way too immature. That's why most shops did sell uh, just snake oils and all that stuff. That's the reason why pretty much since 1985, 40 companies and 60 AVE or AVS devices came and gone. AVS stands for audiovisual stimulation, but um, it's pretty much the same thing. And the scientific validation of properly designed AVE is especially with cranial electric, elect, sorry, cranial electro stimulation or CES. And we, if you combine these three, light, sounds, and the CS, they undergo an amplifying effect. And it's, in my opinion, an ideal approach for extraterrestrial applications and building upon its terrestrial experiences. So two quotes that hammers it home about the technology, Dave Siever says, audiovisual entrainment appears to relax the mind, yet stimulates the actual and supporting structures of the brain itself. So it's pretty much, it has an effect on the complex mechanism of the brain. And another quote is, we don't know what we don't know about how deregulated we are until something regulates us. If we think we are relaxed or we try to relax, then if we try to measure it, then it turns out we are not. And that's, that's profound. So about the human brain, so when we, it comes to entrainment, it completely relies on the thalamus. And the entire brain is innervated to the thalamus. And it's the origin of the alpha, delta, and theta rhythms. And all senses except smells run through the thalamus. So we have different brainwave types. So we have delta. Every time we go to sleep, we have delta waves. It's the slowest of the brainwaves, around 1 and 4 hertz. If we have no brainwaves, we are pretty much dead. Then we have theta between four and eight hertz, dream and twilight state, alpha between eight and 13 hertz, like for relaxations, deep relaxations, increase productivity, reduce anxiety, and so on. And beta is when we are relaxed and focused, pretty much between 14 and 40 hertz. We are highly awake and have an alert state of consciousness. So it turns out that 40 hertz is now around the gamma frequency range, and it might have good effects on the cancer research and so on. 
So we have different pathways. The auditory pathways is um, when the brain or the ear hears something, we have an uh, auditory evoked uh, response. So we have three different kinds of auditory stimulation. The one is monaural beats. It's pretty much, we have two oscillators, it's just different frequencies. And when they, when these speakers blend, they have an overlapping effect with which then will drive the thalamus. And both stimulations are based on vector addition. And the good thing about monaural beats is they drive the thalamus very well and they're a real beat. Binaural beats, however, don't work that way. So we have pretty much two tones in each eye, but there's no pulsing in the cochlea. And as you can see here, the differences are not very profound. And it's, um, yeah, monol and isochronic beats are pretty much better suited. So there's no excitation of the thalamus and entrainment effect is close to zero. Why do binaural beats don't work uh, compared to monaural beats? It's pretty much, uh, we can see uh, on the upper part, it's pretty much um, the binaural beats and we can see on the lower part that monaural beats have an effect on the brain. Another tone is isochronic tones. It's pretty much evenly spaced tones which turn on quickly off, quickly and off quickly. And they elicit a strong auditory response via the thalamus. So the only tones we can use are isochronic tones and monaural tones or beats. For the visual pathways, so in the past we thought every light that flickers in the left eye goes to the right hemisphere and vice versa, but that's not the case. It's even more complicated. I get to that later. So photic driving, photic driving is pretty much scientifically proven as well. So we have visual evoked potentials or VEP. And we can see that um, the frequency induction leads to uh, entrainment but the frequency and the brainwave stimulation is the least of what entrainment really does. It's pretty much a convoluted neurological mechanism that uh, pretty much engage in synergy. And what's important to mention here is that visual entrainment is a vector summation of potentials in reality and not only an undiscovered neuronal process. Photox stimulating waveforms are very important. That's one of the reasons why all the early companies failed. They use square waves, so we have all kinds of problems, harmonics, much more aggressive. If we want to try to stimulate around 10 hertz, we get harmonics, let's say, about 33 hertz. And then you put people into anxiety and depression and whatnot. So that's not what we want to have. Same as sine waves are much better, good for harmonic uh, induction, good for cognition. So if you want to simulator on 10 hertz, we maybe get 20 hertz, which is beta. So that's, yeah, that's okay. And the approach that Minor Life is doing is pretty much sine wave, sine wave stimulation on 10 hertz. And it's pretty much uh, the most powerful and paramount uh, effects on, on entrainment. So if you want to stimulate at 10 hertz, it just randomizes between nine and 11. So that's an excellent way to do it. So visual pathways, as it turns out, not the left eye goes to the right hemisphere because it's an evolutionary disadvantage. If we lose one eye, we lose half of the brain. What they're doing is that every left visual field of each eye goes to the right hemisphere and vice versa. So we can target both hemispheres separately. And that's the beauty of Mind Alive because they have a split screen pretty much and uh, yeah, field independent stimulation. So what are the effects on the uh, ABE? We can think about, oh, it's just brain activity for one 10 Hertz, one alpha relax, then it's kind of a frequency following response, but it also leads to dissociation and meditation. Also autonomic calming, it breaks the HBA axis. It increases cerebral blood flow, lactate and anaerobic ATP. It balances neurotransmitters. It gives us neuronal excitation and glial, which is pretty much the garbage collection in the brain. It increases heat shock protein 70. It activates specific cytokines. 
it potentially increases uh, dendritic growth and so on. And it normalizes EEG and QEG activity. And I think the list goes on and on because we are discovering more and more of this. So it's not like light in brain waves out, it's much more. And it's, like I said, not a frequency driven entrainment alone, the neural complexity of brain mechanism lead to potent effects. For example, if we stimulate at beta, if we have the eyes closed, we have an EEG activity increased by 49%, which is massive. If you close the eyes, EEG activity increases by 21%. If the eyes are open, it's still 27%. Dissociation effects is pretty much clear mental shatter. So um, it increases use stress, what we want to have and decrease distress in high and dangerous counterproductive uh, pressure levels. It triggers relaxations, DAR, dissociation, restabilization of the brain. And the good thing about entrainment is it uh, shuts down a race they had pretty quickly and effectively. And if you can see here, it's the good thing about entrainment is the effects are measurable in five or six minutes. It has autonomic calming. Like I said, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, if this axis is activated, we are in stress. Cortisol gets uh, released and we have fight or flight response. And entrainment pretty much breaks the axis and shuts down the loop and cortisol. And yeah, we are good to go. It has an effect on blood flow response and visual cortex as a stimulation function of stimulation rates. So we have a 29% in uh, cerebral blood flow change. And just after a few minutes of induction, which is paramount in my opinion as well. And Fox indicated that 50% increase in cerebral visual cortex blood flow and increased glucose uptake. And what's interesting about this is that the cerebral blood flow it peaks around 7.83 hertz, which is pretty much the Schumann resonance frequency of the Earth. Not sure if there's a correlation, maybe. It has an effect on lactate production. Even after five minutes, lactate production skyrockets by 216%. This is, this is incredible. And it pretty much leads to uh, the immune system of the brain. And it uh, increases uh, brain glucose metabolism. It has an effect on astrocytes. Astrocytes are important for lactate release. And if there's a shutdown of lactate, we are pretty much in trouble. It's pretty much this. So the lactate is the integral signal, signaling molecule that goes to the LC, to the locus corollis, and pretty much is a, leads to all the signal transmissions. AVE has an effect on neurotransmitter production. As we see, uh, stress is a result of neurological dysfunction. And when we are in a state of fear, serotonin crashes in a few seconds. And we are in a preparation for fight or flight. And with AVE, we can get rid of this. <clears throat> so the uh, lower on the, on the bottom is a study shown by um, Shidi 1989. And that was done in winter. So usually in winter, the melatonin levels up. And if you use AV technology, we can see melatonin drops and serotonin rises, which is pretty much like a happy brain. And that's where we want to go. And I want to say that entrainment is doing these effects naturally. There's no, no wonder involved. It normalizes EG and QEG activity. So for example, this person, which is uh, yeah, 18 year old male. So he's pretty much deficient in the SMR band. And if we use AVE technology, it normalizes everything. And this goes after one session, which is remarkable. And it stays that way. So pharmaceuticals cannot do that. Or are not supposed to do that. And normalization EEG, QEG activity, like if you have ADD, ADD is usually uh, when we have high alpha in the prefrontal cortex. So that's why most people who have ADD or ADHD or even the, the depression, they have too much high alpha or high theta. If you use 
AVE, for example, the David device, it normalizes everything. It could happen after one session or maybe after 10. And it increases heat shock protein 70. So it's pretty much important for the human, uh, the human system of the, uh, the immune system of the brain. And it leads to a significant rise in uh, heat shock protein 70 because it rises about 184%, which is massive. And it has an effect on concentration and memory. So for example, on the left side, if we use um, beta SMR, we can see that the control group has pretty much no uh, important effects. And if you use ABE, the effects are dramatic. Same goes for memory. Control group crashes because they got tired and AVE is doing pretty well. And if you, so this is another factor, stressors of long duration space travel. So now I'm combining everything. Stressors are pretty much common. So Earth is out of view, communication delays, isolation, confinement, extreme hostile and closed environment, alter, altered gravity fields, radiation, mental stress, you name it. And it all leads to stress, information, cognitive dysfunction, sounds, behavioral impacts, performance decline, PTSD, SAD, and so on. Even mood disorders. So we will pretty much encounter everything in space. And that's where uh, AVE comes in. So we can use it pretty much for, I wouldn't say for everything, but for a lot of detrimental health effects we have. And it can lead to pain relief, uh, even treatment of PTSD, which we will probably have in space. Cultivating self-efficiency, reducing anxiety and worry, mental sharpness, alertness improvement, insomnia reduction, and so on. And if it works, works here on Earth, it will work in space and extraterrestrial settings. So human systems that are known to be impacted by the space environment, musculoskeletal system is probably not treatable by AVE. The same goes for the geniturinary system. But what it's probably going to do is it has an effect on the neuroendocrine system, endocrine system, and the immune system. But the problem is we don't have studies in space yet so we need more people in space and do a lot of studies potential AVE applications those pretty much applications here on earth are promising so we can adapt that to space we can prove the effectiveness in space with more studies and more people up there AVE provides a suitable approach for mitigating health risk cognitive decline is probably likely in space and on mars it strengthens astronauts to be prepared for all kinds of eventualities, new challenges in the world applications. The question is, do pulses in, uh, with light and sound have an effect in space? Or are these completely negligible? How will gravity change the mind in general or the neural oscillations? What are the consequences of microgravity? Any effects that make AVE non-efficient if we have sans syndrome so which frequencies can be used to apply it to improve it and it's not only important to to, to boost the mindset lifestyle and health inducing diets because it's primary goal in all stages of life on earth and beyond and the good thing about ABE is it's immediately immediately applicable so in case we have no space pharmaceuticals so we can switch to ABE. So methodology, like um, we can use, for example, the David Light series, which is a portable hand device, non-invasive and non-pharmaceutical technique. It comes with 25 sessions, five sub-sessions each. We could apply the David in the morning before the execution of task assignment for analog missions or in space preparations for EVA as an accompanying factor introduce a modulation for deep sleep and so on or we combine the best of both worlds and fuse AVE CES with meditation mindfulness techniques what pretty much a lot of the analog stations are doing right now complementary methods David comes with a session editor so we can com pretty much customize the, the technique for, for space 
pretty much everything is possible. So we have to just go through all kinds of trials. AV in analog missions, next level engagements, um, pretty much mental preparations and boosts, facilitations to execute tasks, mitigate any uh, possible risks that might occur. It increases pretty much efficiency and survival. Because in space habitat, we are stuck in uh, complex uh, preparations. AVE would facilitate moving to a smoother way of life and habitat through alleviating mental processes. And it gives us the maximization of potential for every space setting. And what's important is that we share stories of improvements and uh, lead to AVE appreciation. And the question is, can we have an engineering solution for space suit integrations? It was pretty much a call to action, open space for everybody. Not only is it a low cost approach, but it only provides great safety and less risk. What we are doing here is we are leveraging, we are leveraging the developmental process to begin to heal the brain. Learning objectives, pretty much we need studies and people up there. High fidelity to present in future human space exploration, produce human factors data, produce and develop uh, knowledge that is transferable into space exploration. And like I said, determine if uh, current AVE devices like the David have to undergo modifications. If you can use it right now, or do we have to change it? perform studies in analog missions, MDIS, FMARS, high seas nascent Mars V, among others, and pretty much validating the effects of microgravity later on in artificial gravity and have biomedical analysis prospects coming to an end. Um, pretty much collaboration with Mind Alive, recognition of the space industry and use their innovation for adaptation and space missions, like on the ISS, Orbital Reef, Axiom Space, Pioneer and Voyager Station by Above Space Development Corporations and so on. Maybe even on Starship when it becomes its own space station. It's going to be interesting. Uh, pretty much, like I said, implementation, implementation of the David with uh, guided heart rate variability. That's another technique for neurofeedback. Or it's pretty much biofeedback and see if it has any effect. Um, so the important thing to note in here to mention here is that the gamut of environmental to physical factors can upset mental processes. That's where AVE comes in because it triggers relaxation response on a deeper level and reduces or produces dissociation and restabilization. For interplanetary and deep space travel, we should integrate AVE into space, healthcare, space medicine, astromedicine, or whatever. And it's a powerful tool in a much bigger toolbox. We need, so important to mention here is we need to awaken the power of our minds and keep our mind alive in space. AVE could refer tremendous benefits on people in space. Conclusion, the whole AVE technology is a potent, novel, and innovative approach to tackle future challenges in regards to space. It's ease of use, especially the David, which has a portable hand device, cost-effective, non-invasive, and non-pharmaceutical technique. And we can combine that with CES as well. Scientifically proven, however, we need studies in space, urgently. It's a low risk and high value intervention procedure. It's an excellent potential as an auxiliary mechanism to aid human factors in space operations. And the good thing about, for example, the David is it can manifest its value after just one session. It supports cellular genesis, 42 cells growth and so on. And it's a paramount piece of a much bigger puzzle for health healthcare to aid life becoming multiplanetary. Besides using the David, for example, maybe we can use the Oasis Pro with primary CS, or we can use other companies like No Optimal. Food for thought, could we fuse AVE with TDCS, TACS, or PEMF, or another technique? 
And this is pretty much a call to action. We are making life with our planetary very soon. So this is science fiction finally turning into reality. And it's not only the countdown to orbit for Starship, also the countdown to orbit for ABE technology. One last sentence. If we had more access to this um, knowledge and uh, technique, the world would be a much better, healthier, and more peaceful place. Uh, these are my references, one and two. And thank you very much. And by the way, I forgot something. I have the David device here. If someone wants to try it, feel free to approach me. So I'm I, I'm here until Sunday. So got time for yeah. one quick question while I'm still oh, yeah. here. What time is it? Oh, yeah. I don't time. Thank you, Thorsten. That was my my second time always seeing a your presentation. I always I always learn something. I I want to, with all respect, say that this feels like it's too good to be true. It's like the pill yeah, that I solves know. all problems. If it is so effective, and maybe the obvious the answer is obvious given the pharmaceuticals industry control, but why is this not prevalent? If it's so effective and so proven and documented and peer reviewed, why isn't everybody doing this? Why isn't it being sold on Amazon? Everyone's got one at home. Yeah, there's probably one aspect to it and the kind of stigmatization because of the esoteric misuse of the 80s and 90s when the technology was still embryonic and it was misused by the esoteric movement for spiritual awakenings, lucid dreamings, out of body experiences and so on. And th this stigma still lasts to today. And another aspect is companies want to make money. So the pharmaceutical industry is pretty much power and profit. If they have something like this, like it's just pretty much a control device, a control pad, and just glasses with flashing lights, they would go out of business. I mean, these are the two things I can think of right now, because there are more ethics to it. And then many people are not open-minded to this technology as well. It's like, oh, it's not scientifically proven. My journal of medicine says otherwise. But we need more awareness of this technology. It's, it doesn't have to be mind alive per se. There are other companies that are doing it as well. Yeah. Well, welcome. Any other questions? Yeah, like I said, I'm here until Sunday. Feel free to approach me anytime. I knew I forgot something. Yeah. Oh, it's right here. Oh. Absolutely. I hope you guys are enjoying the conference. We're getting kind of close to the end of the day, although we will have our evening panel here at 7 p.m. Uh, that one should be really good. It's a discussion of the search for life on Mars, kind of following up on some of the excellent talks we heard this morning. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what, uh, what that panel is like tonight. And also, we have a very special demonstration tonight uh, after the panel. Uh, that you won't want to miss. Uh, it's uh, Larry Kuznets, who's worked on spacesuits for NASA for decades, um, is going to, uh, with his uh, colleagues, demonstrate the first spacesuit made for Mars by NASA, right here. I'll get the oh, it's uh, the high end and then desktop, and then it's going to be on oh, okay. the right there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, yeah.
It's, I'll, I'll get it up on the okay. Go ahead and put this on here and clip this maybe to your tie. Yeah, as high up as possible. No, I think you're here just so it doesn't interfere with. So you're going to show that's the main screen right there. Okay, let me just get the zoom. Okay. So this is the main screen. You want That's to the main screen. Yeah, introductory screen. Awesome. Okay, I'm just going to sh uh, share that to the Zoom audience. Um, let's just do whatever you're seeing. So we'll just do that, and then I'll flip over to it. So whatever you show, they'll show. Okay. okay so perfect. So our next speaker is Daring Phillips. Welcome, Daring. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Darian Phillips. Today, I will be talking about Mars Transit Direct. Mars Transit Direct is a project that utilizes an interplanetary spaceship called the Hermes. It's about 2 million pounds dry. Um, wet, it's about 30 million. Um, Size-wise, it's about the size of two and a quarter ISSs. So just picture the ISS from outside, um, Trust to trust, starboard to port. Pack them together, and uh, it's a pretty long ship. So, the first thing is um, once the ship is assembled, assembly should start in 2030. It will be docked to the International Space Station as a Node 2 module. And to do that, you're going to need an IDA port. which is uh, seen right here, um, a Bigelow Galaxy module. It's about 500 cubic feet interior, so you could fit astronauts in there. They'll have plenty of room for their EVA suits, backpacks, and all that stuff. So next, this little tour here. Okay, so that was this section right here. So this front section right here is where the IDA port is. and um, so now we're going to go tour. Our tour is going to go from fore to aft. So four is the front of the ship, aft is rear. So we're going to slide down this tunnel right here. And um, we're now in this section right here. This is where the galley and lounge will be. Now this top section up here, is where the flight deck will be, but only be able to have that. So just start from this section right here, see where the mouse is and move back right here. That's where the flight deck will be, um, hosting five astronauts. Uh, the gallery lounge will be the lower half down here. That will have an interior volume of, I believe, 600, I think it's about six, sorry, 6,000 cubic feet. Here's a visual perception of uh, what that will consist of. You see how much room, there's about two people, there's about three astronauts in there right now. Um, so yeah, we're looking at about six or 7,000 of cubic feet of volume. They have plenty of room to socialize, uh, talk to friends and family, play games, um, you know, all the socializing stuff that uh, astronauts do. Plenty of room, plenty of room. Okay, so that was this whole sector here. Okay, so now we're gonna slide down this little tunnel right here. Now all this would be the same. This is where all the communication and navigational uh, equipment to be, all that remain the same. So now we're after another section. This middle section right here, this is where uh, the workout room is gonna be. And uh, so the workout room is going to be a Sun Dancer Bigelow module. This one I believe is also 6,900 cubic feet of liberable, vo of liberable volume. Um, the ship inside will have two a res t2s and two services so they have plenty of workout equipment uh, plenty of room to work out and stuff like that um but this, this ship is not going to have any uh artificial gravity i'm quite sure that's not going to uh, be the future of uh mars missions so they'll have, just going to work out they'll be able to work out and uh, be able to recover from the 
loss of a uh, muscle due to long duration space flight. We've had people get off of uh, the space station and um, walk off, so it can be done. Um, these solar panels, all that will be the same. However, uh, you know, 10 to 15 years from now, they'll, they'll be completely retractable and expandable for the burn. Because yeah, you can't have a, a ship uh, spitting out 30 million pounds of, uh, pounds of thrust and have um, solar panels extended like that. So they will be retracted for the burn and um, the radiators are right here. That'll probably be the same. Um, so now we're moving, we're now in this section right here, moving out for another section. Now this section right here is where the cafeteria will be. And that is essentially a NASA trend hat module. It's got three sections. Uh, the lower section right here is where the eating will be done. Um, the middle section right here is most likely where the food prep will be taking place. Uh, you can see it's got plenty of room to store food, got plenty of room for food warm ups, food warmers, and refrigeration, all that stuff. You see the size comparison compared to people. Now, this top section up here makes a great solar storm shelter. So you can take the walls and fill it up with uh, five inches of water. That'll make a perfect st solar storm shelter. Oh, this module is about 10,000 cubic feet of interior wise. So they'll have plenty of cafeteria space. All right, let's go now to, okay, so that was that section. So now we're now in this long little vertical section right here. That is the V1 truss. It's gonna be about, um, I don't remember. I, I think it's going to have a radius. Of, it's going to have a radius of about 50 feet, I think, something like that. Sorry, either a diameter or a radius of 50 feet. I've, you know what? It's going to have a radius of 30 feet. It's going to be about 30 feet radius. Yeah, radius 30 feet. And um, mounted on the truss, there'll be five uh, beam modules. And uh, Quite sure everybody's seen that before. So here you see an, uh, an interior view of the beam. This is the entry port right here. And um, so yeah, this whole module is about 560 cubic feet. That'll be uh, personal crew quarters. So there'll be five, five for five astronauts. And um, you know what people have in their personal crew quarters, uh, pictures, sleeping, sleeping bags, things like that. Plenty of room, plenty of room. Okay, so now let's go, let's go one more section aft. Now we're in this section right here. That's where the bathroom is gonna be. Now this uh, bathroom will consist of a, a whole module of itself, the B330. Um, I believe this one is, around 9,000 cubic feet. Most likely it will consist of two toilets, uh, two showers, two sinks, and all the other type of laboratory stuff that normal bathrooms have. Let's see here. Okay, so now we're gonna move. Now this, we're in another vertical section. All right, so the top, the top section is, will host the lander. Now the lander is gonna be hoisted, hoisted with a, uh, this section right here, this vertical section right here. Let me see. Okay, I'm sorry. No, the lander is gonna be on the bottom. Okay, so the lander is at the bottom right here. The Mars lander, I'll talk about that in a minute, but that's what we're The lander is gonna be at the bottom. And uh, this module right here is gonna be where the storage compartment is. So the lander will be docked to the storage compartment. And the storage compartment consists of Genesis modules. Um, I believe the Genesis 2 will be the storage compartment. And where is that? Let me see here. Genesis, Genesis. Here it is. Okay. So, yeah, this module right here is the Genesis module. Um, and, yeah, it has an interior volume of about 890 uh, cubic feet. 
So they have plenty of room to store everything you need for space flight. Boots, helmets, EVA suits, um, I guess, you know, spare equipment, spare tools, whatever you need, plenty of room, 890 cubic feet. Now, on the other side up here, this module right here, that's gonna be a science lab. Now that's gonna be a Genesis one. So the Genesis one and Genesis two are essentially identical. So again, 890 cubic feet. Um, however, each side have a science rack. So that's not so we flowing in through the middle right here. Then, you know, down here, one science rack up here, another science rack. So when the astronauts come back from Mars, they'll be able to, you know, uh, analyze the rocks and, you know, do all kinds of science experiments. Plus, I'm sure they're going to be doing plenty of science experiments on the trip to Mars, because, you know, six months trip, got to be doing science. The whole, work or, the whole workhorse of the space station is science. So they have plenty of room to work. All right. Um, let's see here. Okay. All that will be the same. I believe that's the trust. Um, now, okay, so this top section is where the Mars ascent vehicle will be. Let me talk about the lander first. Okay, so the lander, I'm quite sure will be, I didn't, oh boy, I forgot to bring that, sorry. Okay, so the lander will be essentially a uh, a vehicle built by SpaceX, I'm sure. Um, the Red Dragon is uh, has already been assembled by has already been assembled by SpaceX, um, but it's going to need some modifications, longer landing legs, uh, extra hovering fuel, um, you know, hand controls for manual flight, things like that. I wish I had to, I wish I would have brought the picture, but sorry, but um, so yeah, the lander will be down here. It was just essentially a uh, red dragon, but just picture it with uh, sort of like standing room by the front windows. And then I guess the whole entire trunk section, you could picture that to be extra hovering fuel. So up top here would be the MAV. I'm quite sure you all are familiar with Robert Zubrin's Mars Direct project. Uh, that'll essentially consist of uh, his ERV makes a perfect MAV because it's already got main engines and orbital maneuvering engines. So this picture is similar. Now, you can only dock the upper stage of that vehicle to here. So the, the bottom stage will probably just be mounted on this truss right here. Now that's gonna be an extra MAV. There's already gonna be one on the ground landed two years ahead of the astronauts, but it's good that they have a backup dock to the ship so that if something happens to that one, they can refuel it, bring it down. So now they'll take the upper stage, they'll mount it onto the lower stage, which will be Mount it on this truss right here and then bring it down next to the to the damaged MAV. They'll attach hoses, refuel it, and um, take off from that one. All this will be remain the same. Solar panels, heat radiators, all that. Okay, so now we're moving aft again. Now back here, okay, this is a nuclear power, but no, the, the real ship will not be nuclear powered. The tanks won't fit on the screen, so you're looking at just a nuclear ship, but forget that. Forget about that. Just picture um, in a tri-star formation, three space shuttle style fuel tanks, something similar like that, 800 feet. So you're going to start right here, and you're just going to all the way back, longitudinally, 800 feet. That's how many feet of fuel tank the ship is going to need. So yeah, that's long. Two and about two and a third ISSs, it's long. Now in the back of that, 
800 feet of fuel tank will be 30 to 50 Raptor engines. Now, Musk has got engines ranging from 680,000 pounds to 500,000 pounds. Now, if you use the 500,000 pound engines, it could take up to 60 engines. However, you use a 680,000 pound engines, you only need, I'm sure you won't need no more than 30. So the less engines, the better, because the less engines, the less turnaround time, and the more easier it will be to get productivity out of the mission. So we want to strive for the least amount of engines as possible, but whatever gets the job done. All right, let's talk about attitude control. Now this ship is huge. It's a monstrous ship. It weighs massive. Several hundred pound RCS thrusters aren't going to get the job done. So what are we going to do? Each of these supply modules, the lander and the MAV, they each got their own main engines and they each got their own orbital maneuvering engines. Now the orbital maneuvering engines are going to be the engines that are going to be used to maneuver the whole ship in attitude. That's roll, pitch, and yaw. So the green dragon, that's going to be the lander, dragon three, whatever you want to call it. Um, one quad has 32,000 pounds of thrust, you know, because the lander's got eight, eight quads. Um, no, I'm sorry, four quads, eight thrusters total. So one quad has two 16,000 pound thrusters, which gives you 32,000 pounds. That's all you need to maneuver a 30 million pound ship. In attitude, of course. Now, this whole truss right here from this section and back will be spinnable. I think about 90 degrees is probably all you need. 90 degrees of rotation, all you need. And the module that they're docked to, both of these, the top one and the bottom one, will be pivotable. So it can be pivoted 180. So from this side, and then you pivot around the other side. So now we can get attitude and roll, pitch, and yaw. And with attitude and roll, pitch, and yaw, you can also have translational. So now we got a full maneuverable ship, roll, pitch, and yaw, and translation. We're in the game. Now, what if you want to change orbit? Well, when you come back from Mars, you're obviously not going to be on the exact same orbit as the ISS, so you're going to have to dock to the ISS. So what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to change your orbit. You're going to have to seek orbits. You're going to have to rendezvous your ship, a massive ship, uh, however many million pounds of ship is going to weigh when it comes back. It's probably not going to be 30 million, but it's probably going to be, you know, some, a fraction of that, maybe a 20%, 10%, I don't know. You're still going to have to rendezvous. So what are we going to do? We're going to take two Falcon 9 blocks and we're going to mount it on the back with the 30 Raptor, with the 30 to 40 or 50 Raptor engines that are going to be on the back. Now with two Falcon 9 blocks on the back, you're going to get, I think, what, 3 million pounds, of, yep, 3 million pounds of thrust and that'll be enough for orbital maneuvering. So now we've got a ship with attitude control and orbital maneuvering. So now, let's talk about how we're going to get to Mars on a TMI. Well, once you undock the ship from the, once everything's loaded and ready to go, checked out, you're going to undock the ship from the ISS, flip, turn, twist it, however you need it for TMI orientation. Once the attitude is correct and everything's nominal, you turn on those 30 to 40, 50, Wrap your engines and you're going to get about 30 million pounds of thrust, probably a little bit more, of course. And that's good for TMI. TMI 1, of course, you're going to need, you're going to need to do another TMI 2 after you're out of uh, lunar orbit. Um, sorry, a translunar orbit injectional for TMI 1. And then you're going to go on a TMI 2, which would be a course to transfer you to Mars in the Holman style. Let me see. Yeah. So we got a full ship. We got roll pitch, y'all. We got orbital maneuvering. We got orbital insertion and the orbital interjection. 
And let's see here. Is there anything else? Oh, yeah. Um, the modules, they're going to have access. They're going to have tethers. Now, um, the tethers are going to be extended. Like, so you see where the mouse is on the, um, on the map right here. Okay, so the tether could be extended out this way. And then when it's flipped around, it'll be extended out towards the front. Now, they're going to need they're going to need anchor points when they're fully extended, because if they're not fully extended and you try to maneuver a 30 million pound ship with a however many hundred foot tether is going to be, what's going to happen? It's going to snap like a twig. So they're going to have anchor points. The anchor points are going to be on the um, on the Ida port right here. So when in, so when the ship has a um, the supply mod, the map fully extended, it's going to anchor right here. And then you can, you know, apply your thrust, move the ship, and uh, it'll be fine. You don't have to worry about it snapping or anything like that when the anchor is attached. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad I covered that. Okay. Um, I, you know what? I think it's question time, guys. I love questions, so let's let it roll. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay, awesome. Are you planning to use uh, any SpaceX hardware to get all this material up into orbit, or or is there like another uh, uh, company you would you would want to go with? Oh, SpaceX, NASA. Um, I've heard of. Okay, let's start first. I know for sure SpaceX, NASA. Um, quite possibly Blue Origin, um, Chinese cases. Um, those I'm sure are going to be the the main ones to help um, assemble the ship because SpaceX alone cannot do this. NASA alone cannot do this. The Chinese cases alone not, cannot do this. This is an international cooperation and it's going to be assembled in orbit with numerous companies just like the International Space Station. They're all going to help deliver fuel. Um, Starship can deliver fuel. If if Blue Origin, I've heard rumors of Blue Origin is building a super heavy. If that's true, we're talking about four companies with super heavy rockets. That 30 million pounds of fuel is no longer no longer 30 million. It's only 7 million because each company has four years to, to bring up 7 million pounds of fuel. So it makes it so much easier when you have more companies. So it just depends on if Blue Origin gets that super heavy. If not, then we'll just have to rely on the Chinese cases, uh, NASA's SLS, and um, the Starship. So that'll be three companies. So they're going to have to they have four years. That you know, four years in between, which is, you know, two years, two years out, two years back. So you got four years to turn the ship around and get it to Mars again. So that means SpaceX is going to have to put, send up ten million. Uh, NASA's SLS, they're going to have to send up ten million, and the Chinese cases, they're going to have to send up ten million. As a as a follow up, how yeah. many orbits? Uh, sorry, how many launches sure. do, do you estimate it would take to build this thing? Awesome. It's a massive ship. It's awesome. Great question. So, this the the assembly is going to take place uh, right after. Uh, well, once once Artemis is uh, groundwork has been laid, so maybe you know two, maybe it's really on like maybe two, three manned Artemis missions underway. We got like two crews landed on Mars and they've already conducted science and stuff. Then you start uh, assembly of the ship. That'll probably take, take, take place like around 2030-ish. You start assembly. Um, so Artemis might still be going on while the assembly of the Hermes has commenced. And I'm quite sure, well, it's, I'm quite sure it could be done by 2030. 2038, 2039. That's when the first man uh, Mars missions can they can head on out. Uh, five astronauts. Yeah. And I have a what's the name of the flight? Oh, here it is. I forgot to mention the flight deck. Um, so five astronauts. It'd be a crew of five with five astronauts. Uh, the commander will be here on the left. You see right there. Okay. On the right next to him would be the executive officer. Um, there's gonna be a seat right here in the middle. That's gonna be a a comms officer uh, on the left side of here will be the crew scientist and the, on the right side of here will be the crew engineer. So the crew engineer will be in charge of all the electrical equipment. The scientists will be in charge of all the environmental. 
uh, the PR media officer, the comms officer, they're going to be in charge of all the communication equipment. Uh, the commander of the mission will be in charge of the propulsion, and the executive officer will be the navigator. Yeah. So, yeah. Any more questions? Okay. You got one? We're uh, thanks, Darian. I, I hear a lot of passion going into this uh, design um, and concept. So I'm just curious. Uh, so what what are some of your inspirations? What's what's uh, triggering your passion, and how does that inform the design? The movie The Martian. Ever since I saw that movie, blown away. I feel like a little kid again. Like you know, wake up in the morning and want to be an astronaut ten times more. Like I want to fly that ship. Look at that ship. No, because when I first saw it. I went into like this phase mode. I went from like, man, I wish NASA had a vehicle like this to, man, you know, it doesn't look that much different from the ISS. Is there any reason why NASA can't have a vehicle like this? I mean, who wouldn't want to go to Mars with a vehicle like this, huh? So, and then I just kept, I just kept looking at the vehicle and thinking, okay, it doesn't look that much different from the ISS. What does this vehicle have or what would it need in order to get the job done? And then in the movie, I saw that they were using a nuclear propulsion. I'm thinking to myself, okay, NASA has been flying people in space since 1961. We never sent a man on a nuclear rocket. Probably won't happen on a Mars mission. I was like, is there any reason why we can't put a chemical rocket on this ship? So then I started thinking, well, what do we know about chemical rockets? Massive amounts of fuel. So I started researching and came to this. This is what it's going to have to be. Well, well, it looks like I'm out of time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Great job, man. Thank you. Here's your lady. I do not see Colin Lennox online. You give him a quick email. Hmm. 
So while we're waiting for our next speaker, hopefully to join the Zoom, um, what do you guys think of the conference so far? Awesome. So I'm James Burke. I'm the lead conference organizer and the executive director of the Mars Society. Um, I'm really proud that we are doing this event for the 26th year in a row. Uh, we did it. We've done it during COVID and through thick and thin. Um, attendance is a little down this year, but the content is just as amazing as ever. And so, uh, very proud of this event. Looks like our speaker is now on. Let me promote him to panelists. Hey there, Colin. James, hey. thank you nice very much for the email, dude. <laughs> nice to see you. Good to see you as well. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I guess I've only got a little bit of time here and dinner is short. So, um, you can, James, you can take, uh, you get, you know, you're only five minutes over. Um, you got, uh, you got a crowd here. So feel free to just do your normal talk. And we're looking forward to hear, hearing what you have to say. Awesome. Thank you very much. Of course. Um, so you can do the screen share. Um, but real quick, uh, hi, thank you for uh, coming today. I was there where you are uh, last year, met some really great people. Uh, Tempe was wonderful. Um, and as well as the conference, James, once again, thank you very much for having me on. Uh, quick shout out to Dr. Dan Tompkins, uh, Stella J. Ford couldn't make it this year. Um, Stuart Nelson, who will be presenting, Doug Plata as well. Um, Briar Fisk, uh, Frank Italian, um, James Parsons. These are some of the people that I've been working with that I have had the good fortune to meet um, through the Mars Society since 2019. Uh, and uh, when, when I did my first presentation on self-organizing wetland bioreactors, that was part one. <clears throat> Tonight is essentially a continuation of that. Last year, 2022, Tempe, um, did uh, manganese biooxidation and rare earth elements. Mostly what I work in is acid mine drainage remediation. <clears throat> but part three tonight is nitrogen. Um, Going to go more to the biological, kind of more where I began from uh, back in the day when I was starting off in my business, Eco Islands LLC, started with some really good friends of mine. Um, Major concerns were in the Terran here, Earth environment, was um, what's called uh, hyper eutrophication uh, or too much nutrients in the water. In plants, in primary productivity, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, you know, what you get in Miracle Grow. In, <laughs> in, in, in amounts that are too much, these can really create a lot of problems. But when we're going up, nitrogen is really kind of one of the biggies. Um, so part three of my self-organizing wetland bioreactor talks are gonna be about um, nitrogen because that's a biggie. So let me go ahead and share. Uh, let's see if I can bring this up. Um, one moment, please. I'm gonna figure out where to bring up the presentation. Even how, my apologies. Let's see if that works. Hey Colin, what's the problem? Oh, uh, just trying to share my, uh, um, uh, the screen there. Okay, uh, for the presentation. We're, we're seeing your, uh, your, um... Oh, oh, great. Oh, okay. My the slides. Yeah, we're seeing your Thank screen you, now. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so uh, continuation of, like I said, this is part three. Um, email if, for the slide deck. Let me know. Um, quick shout out also to uh, Groundhog Solar, who I work with uh, flipping solar panels, you know, because that's how you got to get swole. Um, but talking nitrogen, but Every single time I do this a general presentation, it's, it's always appropriate to do the first four or five slides, and we'll go kind of smooth through these, on um, what is a wetland? Because a self-organizing wetland bioreactor is still functionally a wetland. Um, what's a wetland, right? 
holds water. Water moves through it actively, fast, slow. Um, there is a very high surface area to volume. It's not a river. It's not an open ocean. There is surface area that is biologic inherent in this, this entire structure that you know can be generally measured cubic meters. That's one of the metrics you want to keep in your head, cubic meters. Um, there's a high biomass to volume. I have a high biomass to volume that the, the, the cat has a high biomass to volume. We are aerobic critters and we require a lot of consumables, a lot of food to support this mass. These are all considerations in, in, in closed ecologies. Um, Wetlands also cycle matter and energy um, in a whole bunch of different ways. Like that's that's a whole biogeochemical. Those those are whole degrees. Don't worry about that. We're not getting into that now. But the thing is to consider like it's both biotic, living, and abiotic, non-living. And it's that interplay back and forth that allows wetlands through you know decomposition is. I don't want to. It's it's kind of a loose term because there's a whole bunch of ways that it happens, but that that works. Um, and most importantly, and why it matters for what we're talking about tonight, is that wetlands, they self-organize based off their Gibbs free energy, and there's a little Gibbs roll there, <laughs> um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later, depending on the prevailing atmosphere. When I, when I say prevailing atmosphere, you think about, you know, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, carbon dioxide, noble gases, uh, you know, th th those things, but like predominantly, whether it be oxygen rich or oxygen poor, those are some of the major determining factors of what a wetland can and can't do for a habitat off planet. Um, what is a bioreactor? That's what I build, you know, I think back in the corner, that one's going to uh, Panama. Uh, that's one of my next builds that I'm working on right now. That's probably the first one that will actually go reductive and can be pressure tested. So we're moving things along. And we have a shop going um, down the hill as well, at the, the old silk mill. Anyway, what is a bioreactor? Um, it does predictable work. It is useful. Um, it is this, I mean, essentially a biological engine ruled by the laws of conservation of energy and mass, just like any other engine. Um, this is kind of like hedging towards engineers because I'm, I'm an ecologist and a microbiologist, eh, kind of a microbiologist. Most of the people attending these conferences are, let's get things up there. You know, Elon presented six years ago or whatever it was, you know, let's blow shit up kind of a thing. The, this is not that. This is more, you know, the, the biological ends. Um, and they catalyze re reactions producing useful dry product byproducts. There goes the dog. Um, and uh, biological in situ resource utilization. That's kind of my bad. River. My God. Uh, and natural ways. <laughs> and then um, they are self selecting and organizing, which is generally called natural attenuation, as opposed to constructed or manufactured wetlands which are uh, conscious selection of environments to cycle matter and energy. Self-organizing wetland bioreactor is one of those manufactured wetlands. Um, so what, but also what's a wetland, what's a bioreactor? There are natural wetlands, methane digesters, reclamation ponds, technically a fish tank, a greenhouse where there's a flux of energy incoming that is photic, uh, and it produces a whole bunch of reactions that then give us things that, upon which we can live, primary productivity. Wastewater treatment plants, um, not plants intentionally, but uh, you understand. Uh, wine and beer vats, it's still a bioreactor. It's a batch reactor. Everything that you're starting with goes through one process to uh, you know, produce alcohol and then you move on. But then also by proxy, people, plants, box turtles, and river back over there in the corners after something. Um, I'm mostly just showing this slide just to show a couple of the re, uh, other kinds of forms of reactors that I've built recently. Actually, the one on the top right is the one over in the corner. Um, the one in the uh, bottom right corner there is right next to me over here. That's the first tide pool, um, which is 
exactly what you'd expect it to be. Uh, learned a lot and then built the one behind it, the tide pool going down to uh, 2.0 going to um, Panama. Over on the um, left side there, uh, that's a larger facility um, for wastewater processing from a mushroom compost or, uh, well, it's, it's a mushroom growing farm uh, in Kennett Square area. And um, they've got fecal coliforms. Uh, you have to cons uh, consume BOD. They got a lot of um, oil and grease coming through their system. And the, uh, the basic concept is to capture as much of this as possible before it goes to the reverse osmosis machine. Now that, that's a work in progress. Um, we're still moving that one forward. Ups, downs, big wins, things that were surprising, still dealing, dealing with the oil and grease. Uh, you know, there's ups and downs when it comes to commercial sales. Um, thing I like the most about that system, um, other than, you know, the exponent of treatment better that we saw uh, than expected was um, that one was covered over. Heat, thermal energy coming in, uh, increasing biological uh, productivity. Uh, okay, so trophism. Once again, uh, for the most part, there's not a lot of biologists that go to these, um, but the important thing to, is to really understand is that all energy is coming from the sun, except for deep sea vents, essentially. There is a whole lot of biogeochemistry going on, but the the vast majority of the energy on the planet is coming from the sun. This is growing plants. That's primary productivity. And everything thereafter is dependent on the amount of energy and the amount of biomass created at the, in this case, the bottom pyramid. And that at every step, it drops by, um, it, it, it's only one tenth of a transfer. So you lose a lot of energy really fast. This is important to know. I'm not going to get too uh, well. And 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 in the concept of our talk tonight, we've got um, you think about primary productivity, the nutrients that you need for any biological primary system is you know carbon, nitrogen, potassium, and uh, uh, phosphorus. And in this case, I said it wrong. Uh, how it is listed? The, the, that is the um, the necessities. It, there's the red or Reynolds ratio, Redfield ratio. I get it wrong every time. Um, but, you know, the, the amounts that are required um, for plants to grow at their peak. Um, of course, there's the micronutrients, iron, magnesium, uh, calcium, uh, manganese, sorry, I said that one backwards again, uh, sulfur, selenium, boron, blah, 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 blah. Um, not getting into all this. Um, and then there's secondary tertiary productivity. But, you know, that, that's, that's all the farther I want to go into that one right now. Um, so, but why all that is important um, is, so what these self-organizing wetland bioreactors do essentially is that they are able to take an open environment with all of the biology that is available within an open environment. And that when you then essentially seal the reactors and remove the oxygen, depending on what is coming into that system, whether it be mine drainage, um, wastewater treatment, um, it is then able to biologically sort and or distill essentially the products going into that system, like a distillation column for oil, um, but it's based off of the reduction oxidation potential of the metabolic pathways. And the big thing is to go back to that Gibbs free energy. That's why it matters that the there is a selective advantage in organisms and metabolisms that have the most energy. And when they're used up, the biology, when it's self-organizing and all the critters are allowed to flow through the entire system, kicks in the next one. And it uses all that up. And now it creates a selective advantage to the next critters for the reproduction fecundity and moving on and on and on and on and on. It's the exact same things that happen in our guts, essentially. That's why not to be obtuse, farts are stinky. Because if you look there, sulfate reduction, sulfate reducers, hydrogen sulfide production, rotten egg smell, yellow stuff. Um, there, there are a lot of ways to really, I mean, it's, it's just one of those things. It's like it's kind of staring you in the face until it's uh, properly explained. And it took me a really long time to even pop on as well. Um, but uh, 
most importantly is, so oh, I, I didn't add in here, um, the Winogradsky effect, essentially. So Sergei Winogradsky was a Russian, Russian scientist working back in the 1920s and he columns that would do exactly this process where you have a vertical distillation of different um, materials based off the reduction oxidation potentials. And you'd see them, they'd be color coded. And so what I what I then build uh, the self organizing well wetland reactors instead of being vertical or you know horizontal, but then that allows for very convenient degassing throughout the system, and it also allows it to move backwards and forwards depending on the influent. So as the wastewater that is introduced into the system changes so too does the position of the individual microbiological niches that then reduce or oxidize, generally speaking, uh, whatever the products are. And there's a whole, it, it, it's, it, there's a lot of ways in which a wetland actually works, but that's the general idea. And it's that step ladder and it's consistent. And that's the important thing about it. It's, you know, it's a testable hy hypothesis that is Oh, wastewater treatment facilities that we're walking, like you drive by one and you spill it, it's stinky. It's like, well, it's working, but you know, there's sulfate reduction. These, these are, it's an old technology that's been understood for a very long time, just refined, I would say. And um, speaking of Winogradsky, and one of the most important things that for the engineers this helps out is like, this is literally voltage. You've got 450 uh, uh, millivolts DC for aerobic, ex, you know, oxic, breathing oxygen versus negative 450, at least in my own personal experience with my work here uh, at, uh, at home and at the lab, um, is the methanic. Um, you know, so it's 0.9 volts, which is cool. And which is, that's beyond what I'm talking about tonight. Um, but that's, you know, the, the lead on the research. Um, but for the engineers, because I had the Ukrainians tell me, it's like, dude, you got to give it, you got to give it to me simple. In this context and application, SOBs, the, the boxes, are multi-fuel and multi-oxidant biological engines that self-organize to use, to use each reductant and oxidizer sequentially based on the energy released and the availability of metabolic pathways. It's a lot. But in one sense, that's what I said for the last five minutes. And that most importantly, they'll also metabolite. Well, it's all important, but metabolites can be skipped over if the genetics aren't present. If the critters that aren't within that wetland do the job, it'll just skip over. And then that material, those oxidizers or reductants are going to flush out again. You missed a shot. But maybe you want that um, in, in the the bigger scheme of biogeochemical processing systems for Mars, cislunar, lunar, uh, zero, zero G, or just right here. Um, so primary productivity, cycling nitrogen. Um, nitrogen is the second major macronutrient, to primary productivity, growing plants with light. Of course, after carbon, then, you know, going back to the, the, the ratios that I was showing you earlier, it's like 122 to I, I forget what they are. It doesn't matter right now. I can send it to anybody if you're interested. Um, but the more nitrogen, the more primary productivity, more O2. Do you need moxie? Yes, to start. But do you want to also get it from the plants? Think redundancy. Because, you know, moxie is great, but you can't eat it, but you can eat a, a rutabaga or a potato or a yam. I mean, you know, once, once we go up, I, it's got to come with us. Um, so continuing, there are three main methods of nitrogen fixation, atmosphere, lightning, and UV, I'm not talking about that too much. Uh, Haber-Bosch, this is how we got where we are. And the biological, which can aid to Haber-Bosch or do its own thing, which we are going to get into just a little bit. Um, thank you, Wikipedia. I give them 20 bucks every single year, please please. <laughs> uh, but lightning in the UV, not getting too much into that. Um, Haber-Bosch. Uh, let's see, it was uh, 1907 and 1913 when it was really refined. Two gentlemen, Haber and Bosch, I believe they're both German fellows. Um, B-A-S-F. I didn't know they'd been around for that long. Um, and they, this is, this is how we still do it today. 
and it's 2% of our entire gross domestic electrical needs. Blew my mind. I didn't know it was that much. 2%. Um, so I, I think it is, a, from a starting point, I think it's fair to believe that, you know, that's what's going to go up as well. And so considering how energy poor we are likely to be, especially considering how do we get rid of waste heat, how do we really, how do we get the most bang for your buck, but also get other products? So we can't be reliant on just the electricals, obviously, because um, they, they don't by themselves grow the food or reproduce the oxygen through photosynthesis. Um, what we're really going to need to look at is how do we really maximize Haber-Bosch. Um, now, sending something like this up, yeah, absolutely. We still want this. This th There has to still be a unit if you're really serious about growing your own um, uh, food sources, at least e even if you're going to be straight vegan um, when you're up. This is not beyond the realm of possibilities of sending up either. I mean, 200 atmospheres, 450C, three to five I've seen. This is not my bag. Um, but just in general speaking, this is doable. And iron, uh, we're going to find that on Mars, one would wonder. Um, but here, this is how we do it right now. This We get 150,000 something or other tons a year uh, annually. I believe I got that number right. Um, this is We still rely on this today. It's not going away. Um, but okay, so biological uh, nitrogen fixation. This is the direct capture methodology. This is directly potentially through um, the boxes, but how we do it, uh, well, how it occurs on, on earth right now, cyanobacteria, urea capture, uh, you know, P. So there's, I would, I would advocate always to have a separation source, even if it gets a little, it's a little bit into the privy, you get the idea. Um, what, but what I haven't tested yet, what I think this unit might be able to do is ammonia volatilization and capture back into another solution from SOAP distillation. So what that essentially means is that at some point when you've got a highly nitrogenous source, um, like lots of meat, Honestly, that's probably not going to happen a whole heck of a lot when you're going up if you're talking about vegan diets. I'm just, it, it's important to think about for right now. But if you have uh, a high nitrogen environment of whatever that should be, you want to make sure that you don't recapture that or else you're going to lose, lose it as, you know, N2, which is not necessarily bad if you're trying to, re you know, if, if you're trying to get an atmosphere and bulk it back up with more nitrogen, as long as you've got the mixes, you know, I mean, it's, it's all about that atmospheric pressure. I mean, that's, you've got this constant concern about that. I mean, that this is, it can't be understated. Sometimes you just want N2, nitrogen gas. You don't want it to be anything else other than exactly what it's at its, its, its most stable state. Um, but if you want to grow things, you still have to, re, you know, whether it be through, um, you know, nodules on clover, as mentioned, or otherwise, you got to get it back into something that is usable, because N2 by itself doesn't do a plant any good. Um, I'm sorry, I'm doing a lot of hand stuff here, uh, having a good time. Um, hope you are as well. But um, going back to the boxes, uh, when you engender a niche that is capable of uh, ammonium uh, ammonia removal. And once again, going back to the redox cycles, I mean, we got aerobic and then the denitrifiers right off the bat. Nitrate, nitrite, nitrogen in general provides quite a lot of energy. Um, it is one of the preferential redox couplets because it does, based off of Gibbs free energy, provide a lot of energy. Um, so that's that's something that you you have a chance to play with a lot, but it's also easy to lose. Um, generally speaking, incorporation of you know the honey wagons going down the roads, going to the farms, and and, and you know uh, tilling that material into the soil. If you don't get it in the first day or two, and incorporate it and allow those uh, nitrifying bacteria within the soil to really get a hold of it, you're going to lose half of it like in a couple of days. I mean, it goes fast. Like you, this. It can't be understated how easy it is, it is to lose closed environment or otherwise the nitrogen. Potassium, phosphorus, they're salts. They stay in the water. They're not going anywhere. <laughs> like you don't have to worry about those. It's the nitrogen and the carbon cycling within these enclosed and semi enclosed environments that we're going to need that are the ones you really got to watch out for. Um, and so, in this hypothetically, I, I believe that if you can 
get to the point where you've got a niche within the, that series of bioreactors and then off gas that. And if you pull a vacuum on it, and that's a sterling vacuum on Mars that just pulls pressure out and essentially creates a Benz like situation, like the Benz when you're diving and you, you, you come up, not Benzo, <laughs> um, when, uh, that you can pull off those gases. Same process could be used for hydrogen sulfide removal as well. That's another, that's the next slide, but I just want to, I want to let you know that in an environment that is producing an enormous amount of soluble, water soluble material that can also be degassed, that gives you an opportunity. That's that vertical distillation. If you don't pull it off, it's going to continue through the rest of the system. So you really want to pull it where you can. Um, now uh, there's the potentials of cryo distillation of uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere in general. That's kind of another point though. I don't want to well, I'm just going to leave it right there for right now. Please get a hold of me if you have questions, because of course I do as well. Um, but the combined. Okay, so going back to Haber Bosch, um, most of the hydrogen coming from modern ammonium production is coming from methane. Didn't know that until like two or three days ago. I had to look that one up. Um, but one of the other potential processes here because of this distillation, I just mentioned a moment ago, the hydrogen sulfide, um, or the, excuse me, sulfate reduction. If sulfate is in the water, I mean, that's, this is all based off of the influent. Once again, I'm just saying like, these are the potential steps that you could go through to a biological manu uh, uh, chemical production system, essentially. Um, but if, the, uh, if you can pull off the hydrogen sulfide, now you've technically made a sweet methane, because if anybody, anybody in the room who's ever done like, um, uh, just like a batch methane reactor. It's stinky because you still have the hydrogen sulfide in it. Yeah, it burns, sure. And you've got like, um, the, you know, the, your noxes and the soxes, so to speak. Um, but if you're dealing with like, um, if you wanted to go electrolysis, you can't have sulfur of any kind in, um, in, 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 in your gas stream or else that sulfur is going to wipe out your uh, proton exchange membrane, you know, the, the PEM. Um, it'll just degrade it. Um, yeah, I can't... That, this is what I've read. I have I have no personal experience with this, um, but I do know for sure that you can't introduce um, super sulfur rich uh, methane into a pipeline, right? Um, and uh, the same with methane. Now, can you have some small amount in there? You know, are you allowed a level a level of impurity? Sure, uh, I I would expect that. I, I like I said, I don't have any personal experience with this. But in, in this case, if you can remove all the sulfur and you can get the sweet methane, then that methane is still the proxy for the natural gas that is introduced into the Haber-Bosch process. And then you're just back to that anyway. So that is the indirect potential. You've got the direct and the indirect. Um, and now once, you know, at that point, you know, the sulfuric acid um, is, is a potential byproduct of hydrogen sulfide production. If you're pulling it off and you're distilling it, you know, okay, so now you've got ammonia, you've got methane, you have sulfuric acid. Um, one of the other products of um, Haber-Bosch is uh, after some other work, and I don't understand, I, I don't know what it is right now, but nitric acid. Like those are the four biggies to an industrial revolution right there um, that can be hypothetically you know, but because like I said, I haven't done the, the gas stuff yet. That, that's the box. Mining, I got you. Manganese, sure. No problem. Iron, aluminum, yes. Not a problem. That's what I, that's what I do for work. This is the hypothetical stuff uh, that I still have to, I mean, we know it happens. It just, I haven't done it yet. It's one of those. Um, but it gives you a lot of opportunity and it's doing it. The wetland is doing it for free. It's peanuts. I see James kind of walking into the view, so I figure that's about my time. <laughs> uh, okay, these are other boxes I did. Um, I built them right back over here. Uh, those are 450 gallons of pop. That's my drainage stuff. The wet, the takeaways, uh, wetland cycle, matter, and energy. Nitrogen is really important and hard to hold on to in a biological system. It's got like 23 something or other different pathways in wastewater treatment. Nitrogen could go all sorts of ways. Um, but in hope for the future, uh, I have a feeling, it's my, it's my gut feeling that if we had 3 billion distributed soaps, the boxes, that's one for every two people, maybe a little less, 
at 10,000 each, and it could be a lot cheaper. That's just where it would be right now. The $3.5 trillion over 35 years. Um, now, just real quick, that's, that's a lot, 3.5 trillion. GDP last year was 96 over 35 years. So it's 3.1% of one year's GDP can have a major impact on climate change, world health, and hunger. Um, that's my prediction. It's something that we could see potentially in our lifetime. Um, and I'm just gonna leave up the, uh, the, the final slide there. I guess I've got one question for the Q&A. Uh, uh, what's the optimal concentration of CO2 for plants and how efficient could they be at scrubbing the habitat air? Um, well, the pot growers like to go up to about one and a half percent, anything over 5%. Um, it's going to knock your ass out. You don't want to be in that grow room. Um, but you can also, from talking to Dr. Dane Tompkins, he's the man to talk to, uh, he'll be coming up later on, um, is that um, he can tell you a lot more about that. Uh, I actually, um, and also Doug Plata can tell you more about what the actual requirements are for um, primary productivity of CO2 concentration based off of the pounds per square inch or the atmospheric pressure. And it's a lot lower than I would have thought. Um, that's important because that means you don't need to have anywhere near the amount of pressure within that, whatever that grow vessel is so that the whole damn thing doesn't pop, uh, essentially. Um, uh, John, I hope that answered your question. You'd put that in there a while ago. I really appreciate it though. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Any uh, any questions from the room? Come on over. Oh man, there's actual questions. Okay, <laughs> is there anybody out there? All I'm seeing is like a floor. <laughs> well, there's, there's people out here. So I wanted to mention, uh, I remember reading somewhere that Abel Bosch is so important that the average American, about 40% of the nitrogen in our bodies comes from that process. And uh, so, yeah, I just thought that was fascinating. But I, I also had a question about the stoves. I, I didn't know that, thank you. That, that, that's 20%? 40%. And, yeah, yeah that's... It's, it, it's, <laughs> it's wild. Yeah, that's, that's why there's seven and a half, eight billion of us. I mean, it wouldn't have been otherwise. I mean, that's, that's science for you. <laughs> sure, thank sure. you. Yeah. And, oh yeah, uh, please, the question, please. Okay, yeah, yeah, my, uh, so my, my question was, uh, with uh, one of your, one of these soaps, do you ever come across, you know, an opportunistic microbe that will just take over? Or does it kind of, you know, keep everything in balance? Uh, well, the, the, yeah, yes, uh, no, exactly. Uh, the opportunistic microbe is the one that uh, takes advantage after all of the other metabolites have been consumed by the prior over, o overall metabolism occurring beforehand. And, th and that's that redox ladder. So if you're going oxic, nitrogen, manganese, um, iron, <clears throat> excuse me, selenium, sulfur, and, and, and these are just the biologicals. There's a whole bunch of them. I mean, they're like, uh, think, think like a battery, uh, you know, if, if, if that helps. I mean, it's, you know, your lithium ion, the new sulfur iron, uh, uh, irons that I hope are going to be coming out, the, the, the basic alkalines. You know, if, if in each one of those cases, there is literally a voltage that is that, that can be applied or at least considered to each one of those systems. And that a higher voltage means more energy, for, which also means a selective advantage for a certain set of microbes predominantly. I mean, overall, I mean, you're still gonna have like oxic and anaerobic critters within a biofilm overall. And these boxes are essentially just really big biofilm reactors. The idea is to grow a whole lot of biomass and that the overall metabolic shifts are determined by that redox ladder. So great, great question. And it's just, it's even bigger than that, essentially, but that's that selective advantage. I hope that answered that. Thank you, Colin. Uh, one Thank more you. question. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> Stuart. Oh, hey, what's up, Stu? Hey. Hey. Um, the, the last question got me to thinking, what about uh, viruses? Because there are biological, are there viruses that can attack bacteria? Um, have you ever run into that? Uh, once again, Dr. Dan, um, and it's not so much the viruses, it's the prions. Um, that's the one he really turned me on to. So in an entirely enclosed 
life support system. Um, it's the prions that are really difficult and thinking like mad cow disease. Um, and and the, 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 pri the main concern is that biologically they are damn hard to wipe out. Um, you know, um, thermal depolymerization, uh, Brian Appel from way back in the day, I don't know if anybody remembers that one from Popular Mechanics 2003 or something like that. A uh, cool guy, I talked to him. Um, but it's, it's very difficult to, to break down prions. Um, so this is why I'm an advocate of all of the above, that, that wetlands and boxes, uh, the, the boxes essentially can do 90% of the cycling within a habitat because if we are biological critters we can't do this without biology long term sustainably um so but that said redundancy that we still need other technologies haber bosch thermal depolymerization um you know like well electrolysis is a huge one we absolutely are gonna i mean that's so old school though i mean it's it's so well understood like it's we, we we have the answers, uh, but yeah, uh, but uh, Stuart, going back to it, yes, uh, virus and viruses and prions, yes, absolutely a concern. Um, something you're really going to, I mean, that's going to be one of the primary jobs of either an AI or a person uh, uh, keeping an eye on it. And of course, the neural networks that we're working on, um, everybody, Stuart and I are uh, as well, some others are working on some projects uh, also involve, involving neural networks. Um, and so the, those would be the oversight AI, ultimately, um, but absolutely a concern. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Okay, we've got one in the back there, Ron. I, I hope nobody's already asked this question, but um, will the reverse osmosis system remove your prions and the uh, viruses? How big are they? <laughs> Good question. Um, that's another one I would send to Dr. Dan. I mean, that's that's a thing like viruses and prions. I mean, sure, I'll take it. I mean, oh, I'll, yeah. Is, is Dan there? That's me. Yeah, I'll take yeah, it. Yeah, um, take it, buddy. Yeah. They, uh, to my knowledge, they don't evaporate. So um, prions, um, if you have uh, evapotranspiration through a plant system, you can recover that water and, and kind of bifurcate it out. Um, the challenge is, is that they do move through like um, uh, chronic wasting of uh, deer and elk do move from the roots up to the shoots of the plants. So you really have to, I mean, talk about a critical failure point. You know, you don't want, you know, one of these diseases to come popping up 10, 20 years into a settlement. So. Which is why redundancy. I mean, my avocation, like I said, is that most of the work can be done by wetlands, but boy, don't bet your ass on it. <laughs> you know, you're really going to need everything when it comes down to it. And that's why I like working with these guys, <laughs> you know, because they can answer the things that I can't. Um, that's, that's probably my time. And I think you guys are probably hungry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Colin. Great talk. Thank you very much. James, of course. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Slava Ukraine. All righty, folks, that concludes our technical track this afternoon. We have about a 47 minute break now uh, before the evening panel starts. Uh, and like I said earlier, you're not going to want to miss this one. Uh, there's going to be after the panel a very special demonstration of the first spacesuit for Mars designed by NASA. So we'll see you in a little bit. Have a good dinner. The Zoom audience will go ahead and keep this rolling. We'll just put a uh, backdrop up. See you soon.
Yeah. To talk to talk. How many? One more We we don't recognize each other. Oh yeah, I know you got a document. Okay, <clears throat> I'd like to welcome people to the evening session. Um. Um, and um, I guess let's just see something here. Um, uh, first, we're going to have a discussion uh, covering uh, uh, the the the. the, the, the uh, actually, there were several different working titles for this panel. One was What's Next for Mars Exploration? And another was How to Search for Life on Mars. The other was What do you think of the Mars Sample Return Mission? Um, and we'll try to sort of cover all of that. Uh, the, um, but in other words, how, how should, basically the question is, how should we explore Mars? Okay. Uh, and this is in the context largely of the robotic Mars exploration program. Okay. And then uh, after this panel, we're going to have a demonstration of a prototype Mars spacesuit. Uh, is uh, Larry Kuznets here? Yeah. yeah. And you will be able to do that, Larry? Okay. So that, sh okay. So the show is on. Okay. So this is great. Okay, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, the now, uh, I think you know almost all the members of this panel. If you were here this morning, I'm Robert Zubrin, the head of the Mars Society. Steve Benner, a, a very eminent uh, astrobiologist, actually one of the founders of the field of synthetic biology. Jan Spasek, who also works with Steve at the, uh, the Foundation for Applied Molecular um, Something. Uh, <laughs> okay, and uh, uh, Amy um, Williams, who is the champion, but not the PI of the uh, MLE, the Mars Life Explorer. Okay, and I thought it was like Emily. Like, okay, Emily. Okay, and, um, and then uh, is also here is Rachel Tillman. Uh, and uh, Rachel uh, is the daughter of James Tillman, who was uh, the chief uh, meteorological investigator on the Viking experiment. Uh, and uh, he um, passed away fairly recently, actually. 
um, but, uh, but she also has uh, a background in Mars exploration that goes back to Viking. So um, the first, uh, well, okay, the nominal title that actually made it into the program was How to Search for Life on Mars. And since uh, the, the four of us uh, from Amy on to me have already spoken today, I'll let Rachel open this up. How do you think we should search for life on Mars? The first thing we should learn how to do is learn how to use our software and hardware. So is this working? Okay. All right, good. So there are, number one, the question that I get asked a lot is, well, should it be NASA or should it be commercial? Should it be US or should it be, you know, China? And I said, yes. So I don't think it's controversial at all that we should be doing all of those things simultaneously. Um, I think one of the biggest problems we have is competition versus collaboration. Um, we lose a lot of inertial, social inertial with division. We lose a lot of funding. Divide up scientists into competing parties instead of working complementary, as we saw a little bit of that today. We had some opportunities to see sparks of hope for collaboration. Um, and the will of the deciding bodies should be all of us and everybody that inhabits the planet and not just limited to some of the decision makers that currently are holding the purse strings, which again is why I think that we should be doing this with uh, commercial and private and public commercial and NASA and international. So the things that I talk about are not the science. I'll leave that up to the experts. So I'm gonna be quiet during those questions. Um, but again, for me, it's about properly educating our kids so that they grow up and ask incredible questions. We have some of those in the room and facilitating environments that empower people of all backgrounds to ask difficult questions and to train themselves as scientists to focus on result sets and not proving themselves right. That's another thing that we've done uh, poorly, I think. So those are just a little bit of my nuggets and we'll have some more discussion amongst everybody else. Okay, now um, about, I guess a year ago, uh, Steve, uh, Yan and I wrote an article that appeared in uh, a, a science policy publication actually known as the New Atlantis it has a, a certain following. Uh, and it was how to look for life on Mars. And the basic point we made was uh, start looking um, as, as the key uh, to looking for life on Mars. And that was uh, sort of the point of, uh, but made in a different way. And Steve's um, uh, talk this morning, okay, that the, these committees that say, don't look, that that's not a productive path there. Um, but uh, Steve, you didn't really go into uh, any more specifics. So how would you look for a life on Mars? Um, let's see, that's a good question. Okay, yeah, let's start there. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, there's a hierarchy of things that have been approached in the past. So one question is clearly that you would look for uh, organic molecules, and people have looked for organic molecules. We've now had, I think, extremely productive spirit opportunity, curiosity, and to some extent, Perseverance ro rovers that have done a very good job of uh, showing that there are organic molecules on Mars. Now, you got to keep in mind that there's, well, there are papers from 2016 where there's a raft of sulfur-containing molecules. Um, the problem that one has here is one has to decide how to get the molecules out of the rock so there are a couple ways of doing it. One way that people do it is heating the rock. And so there's 60, 650 degrees centigrade is a common way in which samples have been heated in some of these rover. Uh, but the problem, problem there is that there are perchlorates here. And so almost everybody is working backwards from a highly thermally decomposed sample back to uh, 
back to uh, uh, trying to guess what the organics were that produce it. But when you have sulfur in these rocks, you also have pyrite in the rocks, which is a mineral that is going to generate sulfur once you heat it in some high temperature. So the organics, next thing people try to do is they try to extract the organics at lower temperature and derivatize them so that they can fly in a vacuum so that you can do mass spectrometry on them. And that's a problem because the derivatization flask can break and there's all sorts of chemistry associated with that. So the organic molecule pursuit is something that's been well trodden. And the question is now, can we do something a little bit more um, directed towards the kinds of molecules? So my, 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 my problem is I'm being constrained this evening by the Feynman remark that people are easy to fool and the easiest person to fool is yourself, right? So, so we certainly have been strong advocates for looking for polyelectrolytes as molecules that can be a definitive and unambiguous detection systems, biosignatures of uh, systems able to do Darwinian evolution. We think for a variety of reasons that Darwinian evolution is the archetypal feature of chemistry that we would call alive. And we think that if you do have a, a Darwinian system, it must have these polyelectrolytes. If you don't have a Darwinian system, you can't have these polyelectrolytes. And as Jan mentioned this morning, um, uh, um, it's convenient that you can concentrate polyelectrolytes from dilute solution. So if we can get very large samples like water mining, in, in, in Mars in situ research utilization. That would be a way in which you could take advantage of the fact that the molecules that would be unique and necessary for Darwinian systems to be able to be concentrated, even if they're in low abundance. But that's, I'm not gonna this evening advocate that because that's a bad way of going about a discussion like this. I'm going to say that that's our opinion. And then I would love to have people tell me I'm wrong. Well, let me take it this way. Uh, Amy. You are the champion of a particular mission, which, however, has been proposed in the context of an overall Mars exploration strategy that say, well, you know, would you believe Emily in 2039? And the Okay, so there you have it. But if you weren't proposing it in the context of the current structure, but rather defining what the structure should be. Okay, uh, I mean, there may be people here on the panel or in the audience that disagree with me, but I think that the fundamental question for the Mars exploration program is to determine if there is life on Mars and if so, to characterize it. Uh, and so what is the right strategy for doing that? What kind of mission should we fly? Uh, should it be 10 Emilys or should it be a combination of of, of, of various different kinds of missions with helicopters and stuff and, and, and uh, particular kinds of orbiters with particular instrumentation. In other words, if we were to take this thing with a clean sheet, which you may have sooner rather than later, um, the, 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 um, what's, how should we explore Mars to find life on Mars? I think that, you know, what you, what you've said is, is, the right approach that whatever it takes to find that life, if it's there. And I think that, you know, the decades of exploration that we have completed have helped us understand what a hostile surface environment Mars does present to life as we know it and its ability to protect itself, replicate and thrive in the very near surface. Um, when we start getting down into the subsurface, we talk about lava tubes, we talk about these refugia where organisms could survive. I think that that is sort of this untapped reservoir we have yet to explore. And so I think part of our challenge is the technology to enable us to access these locations. You know, we heard from Chris today that we have only drilled, you know, six centimeters into the subsurface that, you know, we're scooping regolith, but we're not, we're not even at two meters yet, which is what is uh, flying on ExoMars, which is what would fly on Emily. Um, and, you know, he pointed out all of the other deeper drilling opportunities and what that could potentially yield with regards to detection of cells in the subsurface, gleaning energy from the rocks and kind of eking out, um, you know, their existence. So, so what does it take? So far, 
what we've thrown at it has not been enough, right? So it takes more. What that more is, I think really depends on what everyone is willing to contribute to this exploration, right? And this is government, it's private, it's commercial. Like if we want to answer these profound questions about whether we're alone in the universe takes more than the, you know, $10 billion a year or whatever it is that, you know, we're officially given it, it takes, it takes a community to complete this search. And I have a lot of hope. We have the opportunity to detect life beyond earth in my lifetime. I don't know that sending 10 Emily's is going to do it. Um, I, I don't know that if you send a human necessarily that we could send the equipment with them to perform the experiments. We'd have to get the right spot. We'd have to do all that. And so I, I still think that it is a learning experience that is going to be this serial exploration as we try to find the right place to find that life on Mars. Okay. Jan? Uh, we'll just comment. Um, well, what Amy just said, uh, we, we are looking and with that, uh, well, we, we haven't even sent a mission that would be able to find life in Atacama Desert so far. So although we throw a lot of stuff to Mars, we actually haven't thrown a modern molecular biology mission to look for life as we know it in the region which we can uh, access. Uh, so I think the threshold should be the next mission should be able to find life on Earth before we send it to Mars, <laughs> which is not much to ask. Uh, I think the field astrobiologists who are spending their time in Arctic are like, come on, guys, we know how to do it. Let's just try it. Maybe the life on Mars using DNA, which we can easily amplify. And when you can run PCR on Mars, um, then you can access such a high sensibility um, sensitivity of uh, of detection that even if there's a life in some refugia uh, and you just scoop some soil somewhere else, you can find uh, just the traces of life delivered to that um, site where you digging your sample just through air transport. So we, we can get very sensitive with the search for life as we know it. Search for life, which we don't know, it's uh, harder, but you know, missions, yeah, I'm just repeating myself, basically. <laughs> Let's look for life as we know it because we have very sensitive tools to do it right now. So I I, I love this because that is when I, when I started thinking about what would you put onto the Emily mission? I was like, you have to you have to start with very specific things, right? You want amino assays. You want the ability to perform PCR and and try to get at the genetic material that might be present. And you need the ability to look for life as we know it, and life as we don't know it, right? So some of these like unique um, genes or or non was it non canonical DNA, RNA, something something that's maybe close to our biochemistry but a little bit different. I was like, let's put an SEM on there, right? A scanning electron microscope. We've never sent anything like that. We have the ability to, you know, resolve some microscopic features, but not truly microscopic. And I'm like, well, then, you know, GCMS, this has been flown how many times on, on a variety of missions. So now let's send that along with these other ones as a comparison, right? You can compare what you see with that system to what we've seen with previous missions. You have it sort of as a benchmark. We just flew deep UV Raman. So now let's send that too. That that is like the flagship of flagships. Like that's like Amy's mission that Amy would like to fly with ALF on it, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but those instruments are not what astrobiologists use on Earth, right? Some of us do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, what, what do you mean? What do you... Uh, no, I mean, when you are looking for sparse life, you don't use electron microscope because you need high concentrations to find the cell you are looking for. Sure. So it's all it's all sort of meant as a suite, right? So if there is a refugia, perhaps there would be a, a higher cell density or something, right? So it was like, if you can have everything on your wish list, this is the mission that you would fly kind of thing. And so that that's where I would like to see things move, right? The maturation of these instruments. We don't have SEMs. We don't have PCR. We don't have immunoassays. Well, so I'm mean, flying to Mars right now, I mean, um, but we're working on it, right? And we're getting pretty close. I think by... 
2039, we can get it. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. okay. Let, let me jump in. Um, so <clears throat> since I am not someone who cares about trying to get support from uh, NASA's science directorate, um, the um, I'll say that the key thing right now to uh, be able to look for life on Mars is to cancel the Mars sample return mission. Um, that is the, that is literally the the elephant in the room. Now it wouldn't be the elephant in the room if there was more money, so we could actually run a Mars exploration program and still have the sample return mission. So I, I have nothing against the sample return mission as such, so long as it's not interfering with what I want to do. Um, the you know. But the, the problem, I mean, is this. I mean, look, we haven't flown a life detection experiment on Mars since 1976, and uh, which was the, 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 the 47 years ago, uh, which is a fairly long time. And, and if the things stand where they stand, uh, we're hoping to send one in, in the year 2039, um, which is like in the future, okay? Um, it's not part of now, okay? That is 16 years from now. 16 years ago, George Bush was president. Barack Obama hadn't been heard of yet, okay? And neither had Donald Trump, except in the context of a TV entertainer. And the, the it was just like a different, reality okay and the year 2039 is going to be a different reality from this reality and the 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 and 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 it's just the one experiment going to one place and there's been various criticisms offered that instead of her instrument there should be a different instrument and so forth and to me if we wanted to look for mars a couple of things that you need to do number one you have to look you have to look in a lot of places, especially the most interesting places. We don't want to avoid the most interesting places. We want to go to the most interesting places. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're not going to Mars to do a life detection experiment to try to confirm that that location does not have life in preparation for humans, because first of all, you can't confirm the location doesn't have life. And second of all, that's not interesting. And if I could find life on Mars with robots, that's exactly where I'd want to send human explorers. Um, but we need to go to a lot of places with a lot of instruments. So I believe that in addition to that as a general guide, I believe the Mars exploration strategy that was uh, more or less enunciated by Dan Golden and more or less followed in the following decade of the late 90s and through uh, most of the, the, the first decade of the 21st century of having uh, two things go to Mars every two years, a couple of orbiters, an orbiter and a lander, a couple of rovers, uh, this and that. And nowadays that could be amplified to include, include helicopters and perhaps balloons and all these things. And I think helicopters would be great with ground penetrating ro ro uh, radar to look for little subsurface caverns and stuff. And then various rovers with different instruments going to all sorts of different places. Because if you got any of these conferences with the Mars scientists are, there's always people thumping the table that this is the landing spot that we need to go to. And the other one wants to go to the other landing spot. And the, the, this and that. And the only way to resolve that is to do all of that. And, and to me, that would be a healthy Mars exploration program. So do people agree that uh, sample returns got to go? <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me interject here. I was enjoying this back and forth between Jan and Amy, and I was going to try to provoke a little bit more of it. So, so if I start just assuming that Martian life uses DNA, so this let's just say it followed the same natural history, RNA first, and then DNA for more stability, and or maybe got DNA by panspermia. So let's assume there, you would both want to send a PCR, full stop, yep, and then sequence the products to make sure that that's not coming from Earth. 
Yes. Okay. So now on Earth, we know that there are some organisms that use non-canonical DNA. So there's some cyanobacteria that have viruses that use diaminopurine instead of A. For those of you who are not following this, G-A-C-T is what you guys have in your DNA. But there is life on Earth that does not use G-A-C-T. It uses G-D-C-T. And that is less efficiently PCR amplified by the C. So how would you manage that? Okay, I'll answer first. So first, first of all, uh, this is a very sensitive way how to look for life as we know it, uh, which mostly used is normal DNA. And we will catch that one when we have astronauts on Mars because their DNA will not interfere with uh, search for that. But also, as you know, ALF proposes to use uh, different ways. So you are not sending just one instrument. When you have enough capacity to send a PCR, you are likely going to run other experiments as well. So I like the, what um, Carol Stoker and other people in the Red Dragon proposed. You have one very specific way. Uh, they were using SOLID by Victor Paro and his team, which is uh, that immuno, immunoassay against proteins and DNA as we know it. And then they proposed uh, mass spectrometry, which is uh, just general search for organics. So you are covering what you know very sensitively and what you don't know, you cover more generally. So Amy, you're shaking your head. Oh, I'm all about sending some PCR. Like that That sounds great. And I, I appreciate the idea, and this is what I was trying to promote as well, that you would want a variety of kind of scaffolded detection techniques. So starting with that most specific, so like very specific proteins with the immunoassays that Jan just mentioned, moving up into less and less specific ways to identify organics um, and to identify things that are more complex than you ought to see from abiotic synthesis products. And so, you know, we've some of the ideas that are out there are to instead of instead of sending a system like we have sent that has somewhat limited GCMS capabilities and specifically as you alluded to the derivatization reagents. So these are going to be uh, basically chemicals that allow the molecules in your your sample to be come more volatile and amenable to your detection technique. So you might not see the molecules without it, but when you create that reaction, now you can see them. And so we've, you know, there are ideas out there about doing um, solvent extraction or um, uh, uh, supercritical CO2 extraction, where you are still pulling those organics out of their matrices and you're able to identify them more complex, more complex molecules, which may point at a more complex source. I'm, I'm surprised that you go along with solid, both of you, because if I'm an immunologist, I will tell you that the antibodies are raised against a specific protein and will not detect even that protein if one or two amino acids have been changed. So it seems to me that the solid would be so narrowly constrained that it would never be able to see anything interesting. Right. I don't agree that solid is a very good idea, but you cannot have never can have both to have an instrument which is very sensitive and very um, broad range, not agnostic, I mean, agnostic, you have to pick your battle. So if you want to be very sensitive, you, you go for PCR. Then second step is to use nanopore without amplification, which would catch the DNA without need for PCR. Then you have the solid state nanopore. Then you go to, uh, some extractions, uh, concentrations of, uh, of organics and mass spec, I guess that's, uh, that's our hierarchy of experiments and then you go even further down which i don't like morphology looking for shapes uh looking for actually or, or using microscopes to look for something that looks like cells but we have bad experience with that because when something looks like a cell it can be just some minerals yeah, that's true. That's one of the challenges. So morphology um, does kind of have a bad name because if it looks like it doesn't mean that it is. Um, but I, I see sending SEM as an ability to characterize, you know, something that you see that is compelling potentially. Um, but it is also a really important characterization tool for the mineralogy, um, the environment that these microbes might be inhabiting. I and mean, you want to look at microbe mineral interactions, you use SEM. The scale of SEM, this capabilities that we would be able to send on spaceflight, I think in the coming decades, it's not 
it's not going to be what you would get in like the most state of the art lab, you know, on the ground here, but it still would give you pretty advanced capabilities. So I see it as sort of a, a complement to these, these organics techniques. Can I include uh, people on sites now? Uh, if, if you think to this. I think that one of the questions that hasn't been asked is why hasn't another biology instrument been sent thus far? I mean, that's the question that I get asked all the, all the time. And um, there are a number of reasons for that. But I, if I were to say that I wanted to see uh, something done differently, I would say take the data that we got from Viking, learn what we did from Viking, know that we have to um, add some knowledge base that we didn't we weren't able to design the instruments to do everything then that we could design them to do today. But but examining metabolic responses to a variety of um, uh, food sources, if you will, um, I think is is a valid methodology and should be done again, but using again more advanced tools that we have today that we didn't have then. When you get asked why we haven't sent something, what what do you answer? <laughs> there's 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 actually a lot of reasons. I mean, people ask me why nothing happened for 20 years on Viking, and that's a socio-political answer. It's a funding answer. There's a, a variety of reasons why that didn't happen. Um, the Viking lander, the VC3, VL3, um, what used to be Viking A that then became Viking C, you know, right? Um, that lander was looked at as a, a follow-on rover mission. But by the time that funding was, by, by the time that mission was actually being examined as a potential mission, you already had in the funding pipeline, Shuttle, Voyager, and Helios. And so that's the funding reason why it didn't happen, because all those funds had already been allocated. And that's a, you know, 10 to 15 year planning cycle when you're NASA. It's not the same in the commercial sector, and it wouldn't be the same now as it was then. But that's one of the reasons why it didn't happen. You know, other reasons why it didn't happen was because of the the communication style that we had then, and the information that was given to journalists was given in a was given in a manner that was dumbed down. And as a result of that, it was misinterpreted and then miscommunicated. And it's like the game of telephone. You start at one end. I mean, I could whisper something in Amy's ear and, <laughs> and we could go down the line and there would be, you would say something different than I did if it was somewhat complex like Viking. So we talked about, people were talking about the search for life on Mars and we still talk about the search for life on Mars. And I have to say that even though I'm not as smart as you guys in the science field, my degree is in biology, but I, I didn't pursue it. And talking about the, the words that we use matter. So what we really should be talking about is discovering the differences between chemical and biological organics. We should be talking about testing regolith, not soil. We should be teaching our journalists how to ask appropriate questions. And we don't do that. That's pretty basic stuff. So I'm actually creating at this time a, a Q&A question sheet for journalists around the world so that they can learn how to ask the right questions. Okay. Now, by the way, you should know, uh, you're behind the times because officially I, I heard that NASA says that we should refer to the, the surface material of Mars as soil and not as regolith. That, 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 the, okay, so they have switched the correct uh, words to you. So you're now in the out crowd, but the, uh, I, okay, <laughs> but the, um, uh, but the thing is, uh, I mean, look, um, there have actually been eight American Mars landers sent to Mars since Viking, okay, of which seven were successful, okay, and not one carried a life detection experiment, okay. So there clearly is a decision here not to carry a life detection experiment. Now, nevertheless, if you go to the NASA public relations in describing every mission that goes to Mars, what do they tell the public that the purpose of the mission is? To help find life on Mars. They don't go there and tell them the purpose of the mission is to characterize the, the rock formation process and the, this and that. Okay, the, 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 it, but nevertheless, they, they don't. But 
so yeah, we absolutely do need to fly life detection experiments. But once again, you know, we had this discussion here about uh, some instruments and the preferred instrument and so forth. But what good are those instruments if you don't actually fly them to Mars? And the 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 and under the current strategy, the earliest date on which one would consider flying them to Mars is 2039. Uh, now we do have someone at this Congress, uh, yes, yeah, right here, uh, who might very well be in his scientific prime at that time, um, and a, a few might still be working. But the uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but there you have it. So you have to you should take notes on what instruments should be on that mission because the, you're going to be in charge you are the new pi okay <laughs> of Emily. Uh, but so but look i i do want to confront the panel with this situation in which um the uh, i mean do you believe that the the mars sample return mission will help us find life on mars and if it doesn't why should the search for life on mars be suspended until that gets off stage let me suggest that maybe we're beating this as a dead horse now. Everybody, I think, agrees with this. Now, Amy is a public. Well, you haven't said it until now. But Amy is a public figure, and okay. she cannot go on record. Okay. On this. So the rest of us, I think, are not public figures, so we can go on record. <laughs> and my view is that I was on the Mars Sample Return Architecture Definition team in 1999, a quarter century ago. I learned at that meeting that Steve Squires was going to take a uh, laser Raman. We had by then said that they would find benzoic acids on the surface of Mars. Squires whispered to Charles Alachi, who was the engineer at NASA uh, at JPL, saying that this would be exactly the kinds of molecules that his instrument would detect. I learned that the only important meeting to go to at NASA is the last meeting, because the last meeting is when they take off all the equipment you thought was going to go. And if you think you've been to the last meeting, they will schedule another meeting afterwards. And so that laser Raman did not fly. And so it took how many, when did it actually, it was, which, which machine is it? Which would, which we, where we got benzoic acid? Well, which is the one with laser Raman on it? Oh, so Perseverance has a deep UV laser Raman, yeah. So the bottom line is that, I mean, I um, I regret, of course, that there by 2013, we knew about perchlorate. We knew a lot more. And unfortunately, the sample return mission was not adapted at that time. And so Amy has to give a talk to an angry mob out here, right, where she is basically describing a constraint on finances that was put in place before she was born. Yes, almost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but more than a decade ago, her constraints in 2023 were already set in place. But she can't say anything about it, but maybe you can. Or well, I mean, I do think that one of the problems that we have is that um, so is, is risk aversion. And some of us were talking about this in the hall. Um, the, more, the more weight that's put on any announcement that we make, the more likely it is that we have a target on our back. And I think that unfortunately, we have become as a, not as a science community, because the science community, if they had their druthers, would do all the right things. I'm just going to put that out there. But the institutes that are funding and, and organizing all of that are trying to play dodgeball while they're managing the resources that have the real know-how, and that's the scientists. So they're trying to figure out how do we stay, how do we, how do we not become a target while we're defining missions that may or may not answer the questions that we say we are trying to answer. And I think that that's a very difficult thing to do. We have not sent another biology instrument. I personally think we should have by now. I don't think anybody on the Viking mission would disagree. We actually, at the original um, case from our study before, you know, the, the meetings that we had with the Mars Underground, by the way, I was a kid then, so I was not discussing these things. I was sitting around in the room with people like Chris, you know, Chris and, and Penny and Carol and other scientists then, 
who had incredible ideas about what we should be doing next, but it took them years to establish the credibility to actually become a part of this machine that then goes out and funds and these missions. And, and NASA is just one of the machines that's doing this, but it's the one that you hear about the most. Um, and yes, there are constraints because NASA is reporting to the people that give them money. And those people are literally politicians that are trying to become re be reelected and their job is to get is is to get people excited about them being in office so the black eye that people get when there's a target on their back and the and the mission doesn't achieve the results that it says that it's going to is is really big and that's part of what happened with viking is the miscommunication of what they were doing they literally ignored seven other instruments and the incredible scientific um, knowledge base that that viking generated because they communicated they communicated poorly about one thing and the very fact that there was that the the labeled release and i'll speak, speak specifically about this the labeled release instrument met all of the requirements that were defined at that time for a positive result so the way it was designed it worked however they didn't anticipate having two instruments on the same mission potentially disagreeing with each other. So then it became a discussion of, you know, what weighs more. And they could not say, they could, they were unwilling to say that there was a conclusive evidence of life on Mars because they did have the conflicting information. And so what they said was it was inconclusive. But what the world heard was it was negative result and that we didn't find it. And that wasn't even true. When I did the oral history interviews with all these, you know, folks that worked as PIs, um, you know, even Dr. Beeman in charge of the, the GCMS, he, did, he said, you know, we never said that there wasn't and that it didn't meet those requirements. He said that it was inconclusive. Well, so, that, so it's the, in translation, that the translation of what is said is one of the biggest problems. Okay. By the way, um, people know that, uh, may know, okay, that uh, the Mars Society has sponsored an international secondary school debate about Mars questions. And the finals are gonna take place about 6 p.m. Saturday, uh, our time here. Uh, and the, the, for the junior highs, the debate question between the United States and I think Singapore teams is, is there life on Mars? And I don't know which team has the uh, Gil Levin side of this and which has the Norm Horowitz side of this argument, but this is a, actually a very instructive question to have a debate about because you basically have to dig into the evidence and see if you could, what, what uh, arguments you could marshal out of the data and the means by which it was taken and all this kind of thing. But, but, but look, isn't it interesting that yes, as you said, Rachel, the Viking landers had the uh, atmospheric experiment that your father led that took all the data on the change of the Martian pressure over time, over years. It had XRF that Ben Clark led that characterized the uh, inorganic uh, elemental composition. And, and it had several other things, uh, but, Aside from the actual photographs taken by Viking, which were widely viewed and, and appreciated, the only interest that the public had in the Viking mission was the question of life on Mars. Okay, there was not, you know, the zinc concentration of, of, of the, the, the rocks, okay, uh, although Ben determined that to several decimal points. Um, the, the, and, it, and it wasn't the fact that the atmosphere varied, you know, 25% in pressure in the course of the year. Okay, it was th th this debate over life. This is the question. And so now you have contradictory evidence from these uh, uh, life detection experiments in the gas chromatograph. And the, obviously the thing to do it, it, well, at least to me, obvious, is that you would send another lander with experiments that could distinguish and judge in favor of either the label release experiment or the gas chromatograph. Um, the, you know, who, is, which of these witnesses is telling the truth? And the, the, the uh, and we've had eight landers that could have done it um, already. Uh, so, 
you know, I, I, the thing that I don't understand is you said the politicians are dictating. I, I don't believe that because the politicians are most, they know the public is interested in the search for life on Mars, that, that as opposed to the characterization of Martian geology or something like that. So this thing is, is being done by a segment of the scientific community that has got control of the program. It's not being done by congressmen saying, oh, we don't want you searching for life on Mars. Congress was the group that said that they wanted to reduce or defund MSR. Congress yeah. said that. So I, I think that there is some pushback from some policymakers for the, the value of these particular activities. I mean, you might have, I know more information about this than I do, but I got the impression that was a budgetary pushback based on cost overruns and not anything more than that. But I don't, I just don't know. I think um, each individual that's a part of Congress is looking for something that is specific to them, and they're really not looking at the greater good for the scientific, inter, uh, you know, world and the and the and the the knowledge base, you know, growing our knowledge base, and so that's a problem in and of itself. But they are the ones that hold the purse strings, and so when you look at a mission that is flown, you're essentially looking at that mission. And a hundred others, and we were talking about this earlier, a hundred others that were not accepted, their proposals were not accepted. So to some extent, it's also the ability for teams who propose missions, who want to do something, to be able to attract the right interest and sell their pitch, their, you know, pitch their programs. And so that's a big part of it too. And I, um, when we were talking about this earlier too, not everybody can pitch a viable mission, even if the actual science behind it is solid as a rock, right? Because we have type A personalities and then we have agrophobics that have are, are absolutely brilliant. And on the on the Viking mission, there were people who had who were critical to the mission that literally couldn't go out in the hallway when there were other people out there. So they had to wait till the hallways were empty. People would slide information under their doors because they had sensitivities and personalities that didn't allow them to interact with people. They were brilliant, but, and they may have the right answers and the right questions. And that's another important piece of this is asking the right questions, but they couldn't go up and pitch these in front of people. I guess I'm going to have to agree a little bit with Robert on this one, because where I was really quite disappointed was when this community standards report on life detection came out, because there were these three examples that they used to justify the existence of this report. And one was Viking, one was the phosphine observation over Venus, and one was the interpretation of the microfossils from the Pilbara from Australia. And they got all three of them wrong. <laughs> And so I, at that point, I must confess, I, I mean, I've lost Vicki Meadows as a friend. I mean, she won't respond to my emails anymore, but I was quite, I, I agree with Robert on that. That, that was a 82 people. It was a big consensus committee. They got together and NASA did not demonstrate its ability to do what it needs to do as an intergenerational entity. That is make sure that the kids know what the adults know. And then, of course, the kids are not supposed to believe us and then move on. But that's, we didn't succeed at that very fundamental level. So I'm, I am curious because I know that the um, National Academies Committee on Astrobiology and Planetary Science uh, wrote a report based on that. I was curious if you if you have any thoughts on on their response or take on that particular statement. Yes. Yeah, so the national. Okay. So for those of you who don't know, there's a pecking order in science. Okay. The national academies, normal people, every now and then rotate on to the. Or some of them are elected. Of course, they're the creme de la creme of American science. But then people rotate onto the space studies board, and these are, for some reason, when you're on the space space study board, your pronouncement have much carry much more weight than if you said the exact same thing by the same person in a bar. I never understood this. But that's the fact. So the National Academy was approached to endorse this report. And what they did was they came back with a split the baby response where they said it was very nice to have this whole thing, but they didn't see the prescriptions as being necessary for science because the prescriptions 
we're not recognizing the back and forth that goes on when a scientist claims to have discovered something. And so I, I actually found the report from the National Academies quite to my liking. Yes, so that, does that answer your question? Okay, I'd, I'd like to ask a question to the pan, every member of the panel. Okay, which is this, based on your understanding of science as a whole, and of the such data as we do have, do you believe there is life on Mars? Yes, certainly. Um, it's just the question how deep you need to dig to find it. Uh, because we know that there was liquid water maybe just 2 billion years ago. Um, and as uh, Mars was getting colder, uh, and drier, the life would migrate down uh, with the still liquid water, which is heated by the still hot core. So if you go deep enough, you have a layer where you have liquid water. And we know that on Earth, wherever you have liquid water, regardless how deep you dig, you have uh, lithotrophic bacteria munching on those rocks. So I'm very certain that yes, Mars holds life, but it might be quite deep. But I'm quite optimistic. I think that if we send ALF, we will find life in, a, in, the, in the glacier ice or ice, which is in mid latitudes. So yeah, I'm quite optimistic even for close to surface life. Amy? Jan and I are discovering that we have a lot more in common than I think we originally knew. Um, so I think that Mars certainly did have life. My question is, where is it now if it if it is still extant? Um, I think that going down into the deep subsurface is one of the best ways for it to survive, um, following that thermal gradient, following liquid water. Um, we know that there are cells kilometers down in solid bedrock. We've been able to to detect that. So yeah, the 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 question is how far down is it still? metabolically active is it in stasis or did it go extinct but i i do feel that there just had to be life on mars uh, i think that yes i i agree that i think that we have already found indications of um biologic organics i'll use my term <laughs> and i think that um we need to do we need to uh, do things a little bit more aggressively than we have been. I, I honestly think we should have been there a long, long time ago doing more tests. I don't think any of us would actually disagree with that. Um, but I also think that we need to employ more of a co collaborative model, which you see it's working, right? No, I think this is pure competition. <laughs> um, but but in, I do believe that there is and has been. I think that one of the things that we have to look to, at too, though, is as scientists, since, in, since I'm not as knowledgeable as these individuals in, in science, microbiology, chemistry, et cetera, um, one of the, the things that I'm fortunate to be able to do is actually to sit back and look at things in a more broad way. If you look at the MAVEN mission, okay, I think that we need to step back. We need to look very deeply and listen to the microbiology and, and, and the, the different approaches that you have. But I think we also have to step back and look at the planet, planetary evolution. And MAVEN has shown very dramatically uh, that the ion stripping from Mars is you know, also happening to us. And so, yes, a long time ago, Mars was a very different planet and was populated in some manner or other very differently than it was now. And so we have to, again, look deep, but we also have to learn from other missions. And I think probably a lot of people don't even know about the MAVEN mission. So I think we need to inform ourselves um, through a myriad of sources that are both broad reaching and very, very focused. Yeah, I think it's important that you listen carefully. These are not people expressing a belief. They're expressing a reasoned explanation for yeah. why they've drawn the conclusion. I'm coming, this is from a different direction. So I'm basically... Uh, as of maybe 20 years ago, would have been more negative because I did not understand the chemistry of life's origins as much as I do now. And so I actually think it's a very high probability that life originated on Mars. 
Now, the question is whether it persisted in the, was during the dramatic change in the environment. Now, on Earth, life persisted in the change of the environment, but they had done so because it had invented protein encoded translation. And so you have the question about whether an organism that say started off in an RNA world, which is using RNA as its only genetically encoded biopolymer for both catalysis and genetics, whether that will be robust. This is the Jeff Goldman, you know, life uh, finds a way, right? So the question is whether an RNA organism alone that had not invented translation would have been able to survive this global uh, planetary transformation as it occurred on Mars like it did on earth is the one remaining question that would uh, would cast a negative uh, answer to that question that you asked about whether it managed to find a way to survive okay well i'll just also answer my own question uh well just briefly um is uh the reason why i um uh believe that uh there is life on mars is because uh we know that life appeared on earth virtually as soon as it could and that means that either of two things are true. Either the general theory that life emerges from chemistry with high probability wherever you have physical uh, and chemical conditions that are appropriate, uh, and those conditions on Earth and Mars were reasonably similar uh, at that time, or it means that uh, th there's uh, microbes traveling throughout space, uh, the panspermia in one form or another, uh, and in other words, Earth either spontaneously evolved life or it uh, was uh, quickly seeded by life when it became acceptable for life. And either one of those would uh, imply that Mars also had life. And then as Jan said, if it ever had life, it would have, if it had to retreat from the surface, it would retreat from the surface, but it would still be there. Yeah, uh, I think it's uh, more like you have one biosphere they are not talking to each other very often, but I think there is a exchange of material going back and forth between Mars and Earth. The question is, when was the last time Earth seeded Mars? I'm quite sure that it was uh, two billion years ago when we have some evidence that there was still liquid water on the surface. It might be more recent, but until we go and actually search for it, we will never know. And that would be after, by the way, translation had occurred on Earth. Certainly. So I wanted to say that your comment was quite pointless. <laughs> so if there is life on Mars, do you think it does have fundamentally the same biochemistry as Earth? Or is there, a, this is a harder one, uh, is uh, do you lean towards, do you think it is reasonably probable that it has a different biochemistry or is it going to be simply a transference? Yeah, uh, well, if you, if you believe that uh, there was this transfer, then uh, it will be one family. So yeah, I expect that if there was a genetic polymer more successful than DNA on Mars, more robust or more useful, it would be spread on Earth and then outcompete it uh, DNA-based polymers. Uh, that's one thing we don't agree with, Stephen. Uh, but I still believe that I can be wrong. And that's why we have solid nanopore on ALF as well as the biological nanopore. <laughs> I think one of the things to keep in mind as a, as a geoscientist um, is that, and Bob alluded to this, that these, these planets started out very similarly, right? We know that both worlds had water fairly early on that, you know, Mars had a, a dense enough atmosphere to support water at the triple junction. Um, although plate tectonics did not get started, um, you know, it had a lot of the characteristics on, on that, that young earth did. And so, you know, that, that leads me to expect that life, if it arose on Mars, would have a similar biochemistry. And so, you know, it's when we talk about, is it life as we know it or life as we don't know it, there's of course this huge continuum between those two end members. And so whether it's something that has a non-canonical DNA, you know, if it does something that is a little bit different, I think that there are possibilities and opportunities for that. But I think, you know, as we discussed at the earlier on, I think Sasha asked this, like, what if you have life that is 
uh, really life as we don't know it, you know, silicon based life, the rock, uh, you know, organism from Star Trek, right? Like that, um, th there, there are probably almost infinite possibilities, but I think in our neck of the woods with similar geochemistry of these worlds, similar starting, um, uh, conditions and our, our relatively close proximity to our sun, I think that you probably have a high likelihood of very similar biochemistry, if not the same biochemistry. Let me ask Amy a question, because because whether or not you have similar biochemistry by reason of origins, right, which is to say that the same geology drives the same sequence of events that leads to the same ribose borate complex as a stable organic mineral, which is is a similarity by origins. But this does require that water not be earth not be a water world. And it also, so when, what was the amount of subaerial land at 4.3 billion years ago on earth and how much, when did plate tectonics get started? Yeah, yeah. Um, relatively early on for plate tectonics and how much would have been subaerial at 4.3? Mm. I mean, not a whole lot. So there's like these little islands effectively of material that would have been exposed above the water, but because June Karnaga has a spaghetti diagram, which goes all the way from zero surface to all modern surface, which is it? <laughs> well, here's the thing. Uh, I think there was always some surface because if you look at the ocean, in other words, we have islands, uh, volcanic islands popping out of the ocean all the time. Uh, and uh, the, 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 there isn't a reason to believe that the global ocean of uh, the four billion years ago was uh, much deeper than the current average ocean. Uh, in fact, it would have been a bit shallower if there were no continents. Uh, and uh, volcanoes are capable of penetrating that. So you would have had some islands. Okay, you would have had some land. You might not have had continents of land, but you would have had some islands. And you only need one island with little pools in it, for example, to have the situation that in your book, Steve, you talk about needing to concentrate things through evaporation of puddles. And so if you have islands, you can have puddles and you can have concentrations. You don't need to have a whole continent. You just need an island. I am I am curious. I can send this back to Steve. So there are a couple of different, you know, origin of life hypotheses, like very broadly, right? There's one, could it start on on land? And there are reasons why that seems the least likely of the options. Could it have started in these small pools? Um, or could it have started at uh, deeper hydrothermal vents um, in the in the oceans? And uh, I feel like a lot of the literature is pushing toward the hydrothermal hypothesis at this point. And I'm I'm curious, as you were saying, you've gotten much more into the origin of life chemistry. And I was curious what your take is on this and how it might impact our our discussion with regards to Mars. Well, yeah. well, well this is a paid political it advertisement, is. so. <laughs> No, no, no. I mean, look, um, the sub, uh, these, uh, Mike Russell and Nick Lane and these furious people have been very persuasive on subsurface uh, hydrothermal vents. So these are things that are occurring at volcanic spreading ridges or also the what's called the lost city, which is a derivative. It's not necessarily next to the black smoker, but is doing other things that are associated with uh, serpentization, which is producing reducing power. And I'm getting too technical already. Um, we think they're wrong. Um, so what we say is that this chemistry has to be done in constrained aquifers so that your stuff is not being diluted into a global ocean, having access to a post-impact reducing atmosphere. Okay, so the impact is important. The constrained aquifer is important. And the reason for that is because, okay, here's another technical term. Um, the rocks are at a phthalite magnetite quartz translate that to the public <laughs> so it's it's at a level where iron is iron two and iron two plus a little bit more but it's not iron three and rust and so the argument is that you're looking at a uh, rock record that is not conducive to having nitrogen at the oxidation state that you need to have for g a c and t or g a c and u and so you get that by having a vesticized impactor, which is delivering an iron core, which is reducing transiently the atmosphere. Now, if Worth was a water world or did, did not- Did you all get that? 
<laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you're going to translate that because you're used to talking to these uh, people about this term. So the point is that um, I mentioned this. Joe Kirschvink came back and said, no, 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 no. Earth was a water world. But you couldn't, uh, you could have all this chemistry on Mars because Mars never had the same inventory of water oceans that Earth had, maybe. And so I, at a Florence conference in 2014, stood up and said, well, yeah, but all this chemistry could have occurred on Mars. At which point I found myself 15 minutes of fame whisked onto BBC breakfast and the title of the headlines that came out, we were all Martians. So, right. So this goes there you to go. Rachel's, you know, communicating to the, to the journalists who then take it forward. Right. Well, I mean, there are these thoughts that there are, are, are multiple genesis of life on earth or have been right. You have, you have a Genesis, you have, uh, you know, a sterilizing impact event, you have another genesis. And there's this, this concept that this probably happened a couple of times before whatever finally took hold was able to, to stick around. And I, and then that makes me curious about what that story could be on Mars. Could it have experienced that same cycle? So there's a, okay. So for those people, so one of the questions in this business is carbon dioxide is available, but carbon dioxide is very oxidized. At the subsurface vents, you can get much more reduced carbon. And so they're talking about making acetic acid, very simple compounds, but they don't ever get any molecules that start to look like a genetic biopolymer having access to Darwinian evolution. So that's the principal argument that we have. The second statement is that, yes, you are forced to have control over what's called the tar paradox. If I take any one of you as an organic substance and give you energy without having you access Darwinian evolution, you do not give more life. You give tar or asphalt stuff that is more suitable for paving roads than you know doing things that we associate with biology. So one of your major problems in understanding how organic chemistry evolves on the surface of a planet is to control it's a propensity to form tar. And of course, our organics on Mars, a lot of them look a lot like tar. Okay, that's just the way it looks. So the, one of the arguments is that borate minerals, okay, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, okay, control the tar forming propensity of carbohydrates and give you ribose. Five carbons is the first. So if I talk with carbon dioxide, do some reduction because of photochemistry and then mature those organics, they stop at ribose borate complex. So then, then people like uh, Bob Hazen and Ed Grew said, you cannot have borate on early Mars, uh, on early Earth either, because boron is a very scarce element and it's only concentrated on Earth because of the fractionation of plate tectonics and Mars never had plate tectonics. Okay, but then Patrick Gazda wrote a paper where he said, hey, there's borate on the surface of Mars where it's concentrated in the hydrosphere as well as in the residual melts of the igneous basalt formation. So Hazen at this point, a geologist conceded to an organic chemist who is only credential in geology as I was a rock hound as a kid. Okay. Mm -hmm. So everybody now agrees that you could have had this without plate tectonics. So the question I asked you about plate tectonics is not quite relevant anymore to the discussion, but it used to be. Uh, I think we are getting very technical, going deep. Let's let's go back up and let's discuss one thing. Uh, I talked to some people who wants to go to Mars and tell me that searching for life on Mars is detrimental to the goal to sending humans to Mars. And I think we should build up the case and then discuss whether it's a good case. So I, I'll, I'll be the devil's advocate because that's I enjoy that, although I don't agree with this. So the case is this. Um, if we find life on Mars, people will be trying to protect that life and prevent people from going to Mars. So we shouldn't go. So let, let me start on this side. Rachel, what would you tell people? Hey, Rachel, why, why do you want to uh, search for life on Mars? I want to go to Mars. So we should not look for life on Mars because if you find it, then, you know, it's wrong. I would say that all of the places that we're exploring now that we were unable to explore a hundred years ago, are you going to say that we shouldn't explore them because there might be something there? Maybe you don't want to find that it's dangerous before you go there, right? No. And there's no reward without risk. 
But there is an argument that you should no got go to outer Tasmania for fear that you will kill the indigenous life. That's a perfectly acceptable argument. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, no, the, you should seek the truth. The truth will set you free. Oh, right, why? To quote Lenin, the truth is always revolutionary. Now, the, uh, no, look, uh, first of all, you want to know the truth. Is there life on Mars? You want to uh, base your actions on truth, not on falsehood. Now, so you, you don't want to base your actions on uh, a lie. Now, I believe- But Robert, that Robert, we're saying there is life on Mars. You, we, that, that's the truth. Well- Now well, you no, can't go there because you're going to kill it. Well, no, 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 no. Wait, if there, first of all, there's life on Earth and we haven't killed it. The, uh, there's- even an entire biosphere of organisms that previously dominated the surface of the earth, which have since retreated underground since 3 billion years ago in order to hide from the oxygen that us and our comrades in the plant world have polluted the atmosphere with. Um, and they've been down there, you know, and they've seen the trilobites come and go and the dinosaurs come and go and the Wehrmacht come and go. And, you know, they'll be there once we're gone too. And the, the, if we were to go to, I mean, look, my argument is this, as far as that's concerned, number one, if there is life on Mars in any quantity, it's underground, okay? And just like the underground biosphere on Earth, which has been essentially unaffected by humans and, and various other surface species, they'll get by. Number two, the word should, okay, implies ethics, okay? And so now the question is, on what basis do you do ethics? And my argument is ethics is done on the basis of human flourishing, okay? We do not say you can't use mouthwash because you would kill bacteria. You cannot use antibiotics because you kill microorganisms, okay? The, the, but we do say we shouldn't use silver nitrite because we're actually destroying the organics in the streams where the runoff occurs. Well, but, but wait a second. The, Okay, the question of polluting surface streams on Earth is a question of, of how does our behavior affect human flourishing? We prefer to have streams that have fish and all kinds of things like that in them, and so we don't want to ruin them. But, we, but in other words, if you have, I mean, Mars is not just an object of scientific inquiry. It is a planet, okay? It is a, a world Okay, filled with wonders waiting to be discovered and history waiting to be made. Okay, and the okay now number one, as far as exploring Mars is concerned, uh, I believe that the most effective exploration of Mars will occur once it is settled. Uh, we know much more about Earth than all the other planets because we live here, um, and we will know much more about Mars once we're living there. Um, the 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 idea that one uh, should abort the creation of human civilization on Mars in order uh, either to a protect the Martian microorganisms from potential harm or b preserve it as a research object for exobiologists uh, those are um, well, those are arguments that are in the ethical sphere, although I do not believe that they are ethical arguments. I believe that they're aesthetic arguments. Um, the, 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 uh, and so, but as far as how the discovery of life on Mars would affect the prospects for human exploration, okay, I believe it would help it greatly. Once again, the Immediate result from the Allen Hills meteorite was to inspire Bill Clinton to say, I want to announce a program to send humans to Mars in 10 years. Okay, that, that's what it was. And that was the fact that Mars suddenly became more interesting made it much more worth exploring. So I, I believe nothing could do more to accelerate uh, interest in Mars. And in fact, the reason why there is more interest in Mars than Venus, for example, um, is because it has the possibility that there's life there. Amy, do you want to comment? Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm back from the, my devil's advocate, back to me. Uh, my comment on this is that uh, I agree with Robert on most of the points, uh, plus the panspermia argument that we are getting 
rocks from Mars all the time. We are sending rocks to Mars maybe one per hundred hundred million years. And uh, another thing, if we get to Mars, we are not going to kill Martians uh, because uh, the population time on the Mars surface is going to be close to like thousands of years per duplication. If we make just a linear approximation from uh, how fast bacterial lifts replicate uh, in a Ar Ar Arctic environment, if we ev even lower the temperatures even more, the life is very slow. So if we start flying now to Mars before we before Martians notice that there's something changed, it will be thousands of years. So uh, unless we decide that we will never ever go to Mars and make sure that all asteroids not hit Earth, so because that adjusts the bacteria to Mars. Uh, where I was going with this? Well, and anyway, anyway, yes, it's it's okay. I'm confused, <laughs> confusing myself by being um, on both sides of the argument. Question. Um, so, the the question would be: so the the orbital dynamics are such that it, you know, everything is moving. We'll move in towards the sun if you if you launch it, right? Um, so I'm I'm curious: are there are there studies models for like the size of impactor required to eject something at such an angle and velocity that it does hit Mars? Given our, I mean, you don't always have to be at Mars' closest approach or anything like that, right? Like uh, what Alan Hills floated around for thirteen thousand years in space before it landed on Earth after being ejected from Mars, and so I'm curious about that. Yeah. So actually, when you are when you are a microbe who wants to go to Mars, you can do Venus flyby orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's you, that's you one way. Have to. That, no, it's just not true. I I know orbital. That, that's that's one way. Another way is more direct. Uh, uh, that, that more direct approach. And if you have those massive impactors like the six mile asteroid that uh, 66 million years hit close to. Uh, well, in Mexico, basically, uh, then you have enough material going throughout straight to Mars within within basically one orbit. Well, the, you can go, uh, uh, rocks can be sent from Earth to Mars, okay? They have to be ejected from Earth with a hyperbolic velocity of three kilometers a second. Uh, anything coming into Earth uh, is, is going to have very large hyperbolic velocity. And the only difficulty in ejecting from Earth compared to ejection from Mars is atmospheric drag on the way out. Uh, and no, it's just not true. Uh, the, 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 the orbital, I, I know how to calculate orbits. And the, uh, if you have a hyperbolic velocity of three kilometers a second leaving Earth and anything coming impacting Earth is, is likely to have a much larger hyperbolic yeah. velocity than I, that, I want to... you can eject material to go to Mars. I want to strengthen your point. Actually, if you have very large impactor, like the one I, I was talking about, uh, you make a hole in atmosphere. Uh, the asteroid, uh, as it going down, <laughs> as the asteroid goes down, it leaves a vacuum behind it and uh, the ejecta can escape before the vacuum closes. So you don't even lose much of the velocity to the drag. So it's even better than you said. I hate to see this agreement. You're asking a very good question, and I actually cannot find a good answer to it. Now, I, there's a lot of micro dust that comes in can, coming from, but you know, when we tried to find for our paper, Robert, this statement 500 kilograms per year, yeah. we yeah. went back and looked at the reference, we then looked in the reference, and it looked in the reference, and we looked in the reference, and we finally got back to it. It was your statement. No, so no, I never no, there was stuff that I got that from. Yeah. Look, I mean, a Martian rock killed a dog in Egypt in 1911. Okay, the, 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 they, they are coming in. And the, the I stand corrected. Jan has just told me he found the original reference. Okay, so. all right. So there, he is corrected. Um, so anyway, uh, I think the discovery of, of life on Mars would make Mars more interesting and would, in fact, accelerate human exploration. Uh, the, the, because, once again, the reason why there is more interest in Mars than Venus or other planets is because of the possibility we might discover life there. That, that, that's what it's all about. So I, I'm not afraid that the human program will be shut down because we find life on Mars. Uh, if that were to happen, that would... Uh, 
be the result of societal intellectual uh, uh, pathologies that have very little to do with the discovery of life on Mars. It has to, it would have to do with the certain kinds of uh, anti-humanism and belief that we do not have the right to live where we are currently not, or this or that or the other thing. Um, and, and that would represent a larger problem, uh, irrespective of how it would impact Mars exploration as such. So, yeah, let's take questions. This fellow over here. So, not sure. Um, rewinding a little bit, um, you were saying that the only Mars mission that was really testing for the presence of life on Mars was Viking. Yes. Uh, what about the Phoenix Mars lander? It had a, a TIGA experiment, right? With little ovens and it was looking for biologic, it was looking for signs of life. Am, am I wrong? Uh, so, um, yeah, so, so Viking was the only one that said we are looking for signs of biologic life. So TIGA is a, a, a variation on a couple of, uh, an instrument that's flown on, on multiple missions now. Um, with the ability to look for, um, cause was Tiga doing straight up organics? I'm trying to remember. Cause it wasn't a full GCMS setup, but it's, it's evolved gas analysis. So you can see when there's a carbon, um, uh, carbon bearing gas, CO2, CO, um, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, how they saw. Imaging. So that's how they saw the crystals of ice and so on. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So not so not scanning electron microscope scale, but definitely high resolution microscopic. Yeah. Imaging. I. I. You're asking an interesting question, but it's there's a fine line here, right? You're asking whether this was an explicit life funding mission, and it was specifically not that. Yeah. It was a follow the water mission, and the perchlorate discovery was. I my understanding was quite accidental yeah. and unexpected. Um, my my question is, I hope hopefully a fun one. What if there was an eccentric billionaire that went to the five of you and said, could you guys go out to dinner tonight, have some cocktails and sketch on a napkin, a high level architecture to actually take life on earth, put it on Mars and have it thrive? What would it look like? Would it be a drilling mission and take some core samples, some microbes or subterranean earth and put it on Mars? What would you select that you think would be most likely to survive? And if you get it right, He's promising billions and billions of dollars of funding for other stuff you'd like to get done. So, sure, sure, I can I can go first. Um, well, we 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 now know about uh, bacteria living in minus twelve degrees Celsius brines between crystals in a permafrost. Uh, they are eating perchlorates and. Uh, using uh, using uh, trace gases for metabolism. Uh, so these would be good candidates to uh, live on Mars if you planted them in a in some shallow underground ice, which is in the region which 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 gets above 12 degrees Celsius. Uh, um, sorry, minus 12 degrees Celsius. It's a it's a deep frozen but so and limits for replication it's uh, somewhere between minus 20 degrees celsius can you translate it to fahrenheit <laughs> I, th I think it's uh, like minus four degrees fahrenheit or something like that no, nobody knows uh what i would do is i would tell him to launch a tesla into a trans mars trajectory and let it float around in space for a while until it crashed into the planet <laughs> so having something where you can have a, a an energy source. I mean, I feel like every time we do a, 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 an experiment where we try to get a, a terrestrial extremophile and get it to survive in Mars environments, you know, they a lot of them go into to stasis, right? They go dormant because they're not evolved for that situation. You know, there are organisms that live in nuclear reactors, Deanococcus radiodurans, right? Which is one of the organisms that's been identified as something that like survives these high radiation environments, could survive in the near surface where you're still receiving a lot of that radiative flux. Um, so, I mean, I, I still think anything that you would want to seed, if that was the, the concept here, you, you would need to give it some time to adjust and bacteria. I mean, like you said, the replication rates, I mean, it'll be reduced by being in those high stress environments, but if you can give it a shield and let it, you know, and that would be environmental, um, you know, 
radiation environment shield, like the whole nine yards, right? Give it some time to adjust. You probably could. Yeah, but the test whole systems to protect the passengers with an event of a crash. You have to keep in mind too that you're not sending one organism. You have to send that organism along with its food source. So. Well, I didn't know that was a prescription. <laughs> okay. Um, Steve or Jan or M M L E or is it? <laughs> Amy. That's right. I get I get I the get mission and my name mixed up. But you can call me Emily or Amy. <laughs> so there's a in the um, Mars has the thermosphere, right? In the atmosphere, in the ionosphere, where you have electro, uh, where you have uh, uh, incoming uh, solar protons and so forth that heat up and cause ionic reaction. And I'm persisting in asking this question again. Steve and I discussed earlier about looking for life forms, floaters in the ionosphere or the mesos mesosphere of Mars where conditions are not that bad. And if you get a, you know, a floating life form, how would you go about detecting it there though? Does, would Maven find that or would you yeah. need to put a balloon up? Since a uh, second mission I'm working on is uh, the private mission to Venus where we yeah, have, uh, discuss life in the atmosphere. The problem with atmosphere is that things fall down. Um, so, sustained presence of uh, aerosols, uh, even bacteria, which we have in Earth atmosphere sus is sustained there for at most a week. Then you need uh, more source of bacteria to bring it back up. And even if you put uh, small aerosols with uh, like volcanic explosion, it all clears out uh, in matter years if you are skeptical. Uh, <laughs> so it's a just falls down. So I don't think that there's uh, any solid life particles in, in the well, air. They have been found in the stratosphere, haven't they? High stratosphere, in other words, early balloon flights and other sorts. But they are they are replenished from the, uh, a very active biosphere on the surface. I want to take have the young man get the last question right, right here. Um, my thoughts were, if you were to find a Martian virus, would you consider that life or, because that's, that's kind of controversial if viruses are alive or not. And if you would consider that life. I think that is the, like the greatest question I've heard from this entire conference so far. That's amazing. So I love the perspective you just put out, which is something that I, I had not thought about it in this way. So you're absolutely right. There's this huge discussion debate about whether viruses are alive or not because of the requirements that we have hold for canonical organisms. So the three major domains of life, eukarya, bacteria, and archaea fulfill certain requirements that we have defined and viruses don't quite meet that, but they are reproducing in their own way, right? And they are surviving and they are undergoing evolving. So in, in my mind, I'm always, you know, they're always on that threshold. But if I found a virus that was a Martian virus, then I think that I would feel confident to say that that is life. So that is a really <laughs> compelling way to think about it. Yeah. Stephen, do you want to talk before I destroy everything? <laughs> okay I, okay i'll do that <laughs> yeah I'll, then i'll duck yeah i'm a hardliner on this okay so if you are an autotroph who can live on sunlight carbon dioxide water and emit rocks you're alive and we basically call that as a, a self-sustaining chemical system that's capable of supporting darwinian evolution now you are not that organism you have to eat something else that's below you in the food chain closer to a primary producer but you're still alive because you can have kids the kids can be variants of you and they can uh, the variation is themselves reproducible and so natural selection can ask as you improve species viruses are simply people who have to eat other people's ribosomes right <laughs> so they're actually a more aggressive consumer of goods from more primary producers if you found a virus on mars that presumes that the virus has proteins and therefore it must eat the machinery of something else that can make proteins for it 
And so the existence of a virus on Mars is the same as the existence of a heterotroph on Mars. It implies that there's a primary producer underneath it that you haven't found. So if you find a virus on Mars, you have to assume that there is some cell that it infects, which you haven't found. And so that's a hierarchy. Is that clear? The answer is yes. That's what I... <laughs> All right. That's We've what got I to wind say. it up. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So our next is going to be uh, Larry Kuznets, who is going to do a demonstration of a prototype Mars spacesuit. Uh, so uh, La there's Larry. Uh, and, all right. Clear the stage. Oh, we want to have a, a picture taken. Just hold on for just a minute. Can't have you in the picture. <laughs> Right. While we're getting those slides up, do a quick intro. Uh, Dr. Larry Kuznets has advanced degrees from Columbia University, the University of California, Berkeley, and holds eight U.S. patents. He was on console uh, at Mission Control for Apollos 11 through 17, helped build the space shuttles, and managed the human research program for the International Space Station. He has a novel, uh, a nonfiction and children's book about his experiences, conducting experiments, proving that water can remain liquid on the surface of Mars. And you're going to hear me say and a few times, uh, extreme files could survive in it. He is a leader in STEM education and is currently lecturing in the astronomy and mechanical engineering departments at UC Berkeley. He is also CTO of planetary protection, designing and building a radically different spacesuit for Mars and a pandemic fighting PPE suit based on it. Here we go. Thank you. Everybody hear me? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Last time I heard 30 seconds was when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were in a cockpit and they were told they had 30 seconds of fuel. And you probably have seen all of this multiple times, 30 seconds, 20 seconds. We've got a bunch of guys ready to turn blue here. So 30 seconds kind of has a resonate, resonates with me. Are you ready? It's loading up. Well, before we begin, I just want to thank everybody for staying this late. And uh, this, uh, so many folks in here I go go way back. I mean, uh, and it, it started at. Um, now that I have a couple of minutes to talk to Bob and and. Carol is not here, and Chris McKay is not here, and and Kurt and a whole bunch of others. Back in the day, uh, it was called the Mars Underground, those of you who may not know it. And it was called the Mars Underground for a good reason, because publicly saying we we're going to go to Mars was like uh, that kind of labeled you as a wacko, right? So this was all done at uh, University of Colorado, and, and Bob picked up the gauntlet and tried to make this mainstream, which was quite a battle because um, well, but maybe we were all proud then of being wackos. What do you think? That was a good thing, right? That was a good thing. So um, some of the, many of these people have helped in one way or another, maybe they don't even realize it, uh, in what you're about to see here. And, and, um, and I just want to thank you for your contributions. If we're ready yet, I hope. <clears throat> Okay, so so the question is, these has these have embedded movies, and 
uh, maybe you can advance them and, and embed the movies for me while I talk and I'll just tell you to go to the next one. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so we have this, um, we have this credo. I, I spent 50 years with the space agency, either as a contractor or as a civil servant. We have this credo that was right there at the beginning, let your reach exceed your grasp. So in other words, go for more than you think you could know, you could possibly imagine, right? And, uh, and, and all of that starts with a dream or a passion. That's where it all begins. And uh, that passion leads to a journey. And there's a word that ties all of that together. Uh, next slide. And that word is perseverance. Perseverance is not just a rover. Perseverance is a journey. You have to remember that uh, because you're going to persevere through all kinds of stuff. And what you're about to see was a 30-year journey culminating in, in what's going to happen tonight, what you're going to see tonight. So um, this started with the very first serious attempt at studying how would you build a spacesuit for Mars. And I won't get to the, to the, the prequel of that, which was regular spacesuits. I spent time on Apollo working with designing spacesuits and liquid cooling garments where I did my thesis. And all that eventually kind of migrated to a, a National Research Council senior fellowship. I needed a topic and uh, the topic came at NASA Ames of spacesuits for Mars. So this is kind of where this started. And the year was roughly, give you some context, uh, 1991 when I first thought about that. And by then I had already met Bob and Chris McKay and Carol Stoker and Larry Lemke and the whole sort of cast of characters out at NASA Ames who studied this stuff, right? So what you're looking at was the very first serious study, spacesuits and life support systems for the exploration of Mars. Nobody had done that. And so that, that was page one. So I'll take you through the sequence, next one. Sequence uh, two. Play it. I hope. <clears throat> no, nope. it just played on Molly's laptop and we plugged it in there. <clears throat> We don't have to play the video of. No, 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 no. It's it's uh, it's uh, you got to get out of this altogether. You got to go back one direction. It's uh, very short that one there. Oh well, that's what we have. I meant is the video separate. Oh, no, the video was already linked to it. It played on Molly, so I don't know why it wouldn't play here. It was already linked. Sorry. Uh, okay. That's what happens when you go from Mac to PC and PC to thumb drive. And so we'll have to do without some of these videos. But this is a video of a class uh, I was teaching at UC Berkeley where there were like 60 students and CNN did a special on it. And they were asked, um, you want to go to Mars, really? And every one of them, I want to go to Mars. I want to go to this. Really, like a lot of enthusiasm to go to Mars. So CNN showed this. And that was like the second iteration of, of, uh, of, of looking at spacesuits for Mars. And then the third one, we can go to the next slide, we may as well. These are third, fourth, and fifth iterations. So these are iterations on the same kind of thing, classes and, and uh, conferences where the students, as you see, are working on a concept of a spacesuit for Mars. Concept is the, the key word here. Uh, next. So there was a methodology with all of this. There was a method to make this happen. Just to give you, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but this method is called the hypernet paradigm. And the idea is you take a project, in this case, a spacesuit from Mars, and you break it up into pieces. And so you hear all the pieces that you might imagine. And then after you do that, you then simplify by the combining into pieces. Next. And then you get a manageable more number of pieces. And we use the term work packages because that was popular in the day. And then we recruited 
audiences or talent pools from wherever people wanted to come. It could be the public, it could be high schools, it could be university teams. And you see in that column to the right, all these different contributors that started saying, hey, uh, we'd like to work on this. And the final thing that kind of shows how it worked is the next slide. So those pieces are in dark red. And there was a team from that talent pool assigned to each one of these. <clears throat> and each one of these then worked on that particular project. And at the end of a semester or a year, however long they came up with a report, 